Section 14 of Incidents of Travel in Central America, Chiapas, and Yucatan, Volume 2, by John Lloyd Steffens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sue Anderson. Chapter 12. Quetzaltenango. Account of it. Conversion of the inhabitants to Christianity. Appearance of the city. The convent. Insurrection. Carrera's march upon Quetzaltenango. His treatment of the inhabitants. Preparations for Holy Week. The church. A procession. Good Friday. Celebration of the resurrection. Opening ceremony. The crucifixion. A sermon. Descent from the cross. Grand procession. Church of El Calvario. The case of the cura. Warm springs of Almolonga we were again on classic soil the reader perhaps requires to be reminded that the city stands on the site of the ancient shelahu next to utatlan the largest city in quiche the word shelahu meaning under the government of ten that is it was governed by ten principal captains each captain presiding over eight thousand dwellings in all eighty thousand and containing according to fuentes more than three hundred thousand inhabitants that on the defeat of tecum uman by alvarado the inhabitants abandoned the city and fled to their ancient fortresses eshcancel the volcano and sekshak another mountain adjoining that the spaniards entered the deserted city and according to a manuscript found in the village of san andres Checul, their vedettes captured the four celebrated caciques whose names the reader doubtless remembers were kalel kalek apogeham kalelahan and kalelaboy the spanish records say that they fell on their knees before pedro alvarado while a priest explained to them the nature of the christian faith and they declared themselves ready to embrace it two of them were retained as hostages and the others sent back to the fortresses who returned with such multitudes of indians ready to be baptized that the priests from sheer fatigue could no longer lift their arms to perform the ceremony as we approached seven towering churches showed that the religion so hastily adopted had not died away in a few minutes we entered the city the streets were handsomely paved and the houses picturesque in architecture the cabildo had two stories and a corridor the cathedral with its facade richly decorated was grand and imposing the plaza was paved with stone having a fine fountain in the centre and commanding a magnificent view of the volcano and mountains around it was the day before good friday the streets and plaza were crowded with people in their best attire the indians wearing large black cloaks with broad-brimmed felt sombreros and the women a white frock covering the head except an oblong opening for the face some wore a sort of turban of red cord plaited with the hair the bells were hushed and wooden clappers sounded in their stead as we rode through armed to the teeth the crowd made way in silence we passed the door of the church and entered the great gate of the convent the cura was absent at the moment but a respectable-looking servant woman received us in a manner that assured us of a welcome from her master there was however an air of excitement and trepidation in the whole household and it was not long before the good woman unburdened herself of matters fearfully impressed upon her mind after chocolate we went to the corregidor to whom we presented our letters from the government and carrera's passport he was one of morazan's expulsados a fine military-looking man but as he told us not a soldier by profession he was in office by accident and exceedingly anxious to lay down his command indeed his brief service had been no sinecure he introduced us to don juan lavanigna an italian from genoa 
banished on account of a revolution headed by the present king then heir apparent and intended to put him on the throne but out of which he basely drew himself leaving his followers to their fate how the senor found his way to this place i did not learn but he had not found peace and if i am not deceived he was as anxious to get out of it as ever he was to leave genoa on our return to the convent we found the cura who gave us personally the welcome assured us by his housekeeper with him was a respectable-looking indian bearing the imposing title of gobernador being the indian alcalde and it was rather singular that in an hour after our arrival at quetzaltenango we had become acquainted with the four surviving victims of carrera's wrath all of whom had narrowly escaped death at the time of the outrage the rumor of which reached us at guatemala the place was still quivering under the shock of that event we had heard many of the particulars on the road and in quetzaltenango except the parties concerned no one could speak of anything else on the first entry of morazan's soldiers into the plaza at guatemala in an unfortunate moment a courier was sent to quetzaltenango to announce the capture of the city the effect there was immediate and decided the people rose upon the garrison left by carrera and required them to lay down their arms the corregidor not wishing to fire upon the townsmen and finding it would be impossible with his small force to repress the insurrection by the advice of the cura and don juan lavanigna to prevent bloodshed and a general massacre induced the soldiers to lay down their arms and leave the town the same night the municipality without his knowledge nominated don juan lavanigna as commandant he refused to serve but the town was in a violent state of excitement and they urged him to accept for that night only representing that if he did not the fury of the populace would be directed against him the same night they made a pronunciamiento in favor of morazan and addressed a letter of congratulation to him which they dispatched immediately by an indian courier it will be remembered however that in the meantime morazan had been driven out of guatemala and that carrera had pursued him in his flight at the antigua the latter met a disarmed sergeant who informed him of the proceedings at quetzaltenango whereupon abandoning his pursuit of morazan he marched directly thither early intelligence was received of his approach and the corregidor the cura and don juan lavanigna were sent as deputation to receive him they met him at totonicapan carrera had heard on the road of their agency in inducing the soldiers to surrender their arms and his first greeting was a furious declaration that their heads should lie at that place laying aside his fanaticism and respect for the priests he broke out against the cura in particular who he said was a relative of morazan the cura said he was not a relative but only a countryman which in that region means a townsman and could not help the place of his birth but carrera forthwith ordered four soldiers to remove him a few paces and shoot him on the spot the gobernador the old indian referred to threw himself on his knees and begged the cura's life but carrera drew his sword and struck the indian twice across the shoulder and the wounds were still unhealed when we saw him but he desisted from his immediate purpose of shooting the cura and delivered him over to the soldiers don juan lavanigna was saved by carrera's secretary who exhibited in el tiempo the government paper of guatemala an extract from a letter written by don juan to a friend in guatemala 
praising Carrera's deportment on his previous entry into Quetzaltenango and the discipline and good behavior of his troops. Early the next morning, Carrera marched into Quetzaltenango with the cura and Don Juan as prisoners. The municipality waited upon him in the plaza, but unhappily the Indian entrusted with the letter to Morazan had loitered in the town and at this unfortunate moment presented it to carrera before his secretary had finished reading it carrera in a transport of fury drew his sword to kill them on the spot with his own hand wounded molina the alcalde mayor and two other members of the municipality but checked himself and ordered the soldiers to seize them he then rode to the corregidor where he again broke out into fury and drew his sword upon him a woman in the room threw herself before the corregidor and carrera struck around her several times but finally checked himself again and ordered the corregidor to be shot unless he raised five thousand dollars by contributions upon the town don juan and the cura he had locked up in a room with the threat to shoot them at five o'clock that afternoon unless they paid him one thousand dollars each and the former two hundred and the latter one hundred to his secretary don juan was the principal merchant in the town but even for him it was difficult to raise that sum the poor cura told carrera that he was not worth a cent in the world except his furniture and books no one was allowed to visit him except the old housekeeper who first told us the story many of his friends had fled or hidden themselves away and the old housekeeper ran from place to place with notes written by him begging five dollars ten dollars anything she could get one old lady sent him a hundred dollars at four o'clock with all his efforts he had raised but seven hundred dollars but after undergoing all the mental agonies of death when the cura had given up all hope don juan who had been two hours at liberty made up the deficiency and he was released the next morning carrera sent to don juan to borrow his shaving apparatus and don juan took them over himself he had always been on good terms with carrera and the latter asked him if he had got over his fright talking with him as familiarly as if nothing had happened shortly afterward he was seen at the window playing on a guitar and in an hour thereafter eighteen members of the municipality without the slightest form of trial not even a drumhead court-martial were taken out into the plaza and shot they were all the very first men in quetzaltenango and molina the alcalde mayor in family position and character was second to no other in the republic his wife was clinging to carrera's knees and begging for his life when he passed with a file of soldiers she screamed robertito he looked at her but did not speak she shrieked and fainted and before she recovered her husband was dead he was taken around the corner of the house seated on a stone and dispatched at once the others were seated in the same place one at a time the stone and the wall of the house were still red with their blood i was told that carrera shed tears for the death of the first two but for the rest he said he did not care heretofore in all their revolutions there had been some show of regard for the tribunals of justice and the horror of the citizens at this lawless murder of their best men cannot be conceived the facts were notorious to everybody in quetzaltenango we heard them with but little variation of detail from more than a dozen different persons having consummated this enormity carrera returned to guatemala and the place had not yet recovered from its consternation 
it was considered a blow at the whites and all feared the horrors of a war of castes i have avoided speaking harshly of carrera when i could i consider myself under personal obligations to him and without his protection i never could have travelled through the country but it is difficult to suppress the feelings of indignation excited against the government which conscious of the enormity of his conduct and of his utter contempt for them never dared call him to account and now cajoles and courts him sustaining itself in power by his favor alone to return to the cura he was about forty-five tall stout and remarkably fine-looking he had several curacies under his charge and next to a canonigo's his position was the highest in the country but it had its labors he was at that time engrossed with the ceremonies of the holy week and in the evening we accompanied him to the church at the door the coup d'oeil of the interior was most striking the church was two hundred and fifty feet in length spacious and lofty richly decorated with pictures and sculptured ornaments blazing with lights and crowded with indians on each side of the door was a grating behind which stood an indian to receive offerings the floor was strewed with pine leaves on the left was the figure of a dead christ on a bier upon which every woman who entered threw a handful of roses and near it stood an indian to receive money opposite behind an iron grating was the figure of christ bearing the cross the eyes bandaged and large silver chains attached to the arms and other parts of the body and fastened to the iron bars here too stood an indian to receive contributions the altar was beautiful in design and decorations consisting of two rows of ionic columns one above another gilded surmounted by a golden glory and lighted by candles ten feet high under the pulpit was a piano after a stroll around the church the cura led us to seats under the pulpit he asked us to give them some of the airs of our country and then himself sat down at the piano on mr c s suggesting that the tune was from one of rossini's operas he said that this was hardly proper for the occasion and changed it about ten o'clock the crowd in the church formed into a procession and mr c and i went out and took a position at the corner of a street to see it pass it was headed by indians two abreast each carrying in his hand a long lighted wax candle and then borne aloft on the shoulders of four men came the figure of judith with a bloody sword in one hand and in the other the gory head of holofernes next also on the shoulders of four men the archangel gabriel dressed in red silk with large wings puffed out the next were men in grotesque armor made of black and silver paper to resemble moors with shield and spear like ancient cavaliers and then four little girls dressed in white silk and gauze and looking like little spiritualities with men on each side bearing lighted candles then came a large figure of christ bearing the cross supported by four indians on each side were young indian lads carrying long poles horizontally to keep the crowd from pressing upon it and followed by a procession of townsmen in turning the corner of the street at which we stood a dark mestizo with a scowl of fanaticism on his face said to mr catherwood take off your spectacles and follow the cross next followed a procession of women with children in their arms half of them asleep fancifully dressed with silver caps and headdresses and finally a large statue of the virgin in a sitting posture magnificently attired with indian lads on each side as before supporting poles with candles 
the whole was accompanied with the music of drums and violins and as the long train of light passed down the street we returned to the convent the night was very cold and the next morning was like one in december at home it was the morning of good friday and throughout guatemala in every village preparations were making to celebrate with the most solemn ceremonies of the church the resurrection of the saviour in quetzaltenango at that early hour the plaza was thronged with indians from the country around but the whites terrified and grieving at the murder of their best men avoided to a great extent taking part in the celebration at nine o'clock the corregidor called for us and we accompanied him to the opening ceremony on one side of the nave of the church near the grand altar and opposite the pulpit were high cushioned chairs for the corregidor and members of the municipality and we had seats with them the church was thronged with indians estimated at more than three thousand formerly at this ceremony no women or children were admitted but now the floor of the church was filled with indian women on their knees with red cords plaited in their hair and perhaps one-third of them had children on their backs their heads and arms only visible except ourselves and the padre there were no white people in the church and with all eyes turned upon us and a lively recollection of the fate of those who but a few days before had occupied our seats we felt that the post of honor was a private station at the steps of the grand altar stood a large cross apparently of solid silver richly carved and ornamented and over it a high arbor of pine and cypress branches at the foot of the cross stood a figure of mary magdalene weeping with her hair in a profusion of ringlets her frock low in the neck and altogether rather immodest on the right was the figure of the virgin gorgeously dressed and in the nave of the church stood john the baptist placed there as it seemed only because they had the figure on hand very soon strains of wild indian music rose from the other end of the church and a procession advanced headed by indians with broad brimmed felt hats dark cloaks and lighted wax candles preceding the body of the saviour on a bier borne by the cura and attendant padres and followed by indians with long wax candles the bier advanced to the foot of the cross ladders were placed behind against it the gobernador with his long black cloak and broad-brimmed felt hat mounted on the right and leaned over holding in his hands a silver hammer and a long silver spike another indian dignitary mounted on the other side while the priests raised the figure up in front the face was ghastly blood trickled down the cheeks the arms and legs were movable and in the side was a gaping wound with a stream of blood oozing from it the back was affixed to the cross the arms extended spikes driven through the hands and feet the ladders taken away and thus the figure of christ was nailed to the cross this over we left the church and passed two or three hours in visiting the white population was small but equal in character to any in the republic and there was hardly a respectable family that was not afflicted by the outrage of carrera we knew nothing of the effect of this enormity until we entered domestic circles the distress of women whose nearest connections had been murdered or obliged to fly for their lives and then wandering they knew not where those only can realize who can appreciate woman's affection i was urged to visit the widow of molina her husband was but thirty-five and his death under any circumstances would have been lamented even by political enemies 
i felt a painful interest in one who had lived through such a scene but at the door of her house i stopped i felt that a visit from a stranger must be an intrusion upon her sorrows in the afternoon we were again seated with the municipality in the church to behold the descent from the cross the spacious building was thronged to suffocation and the floor was covered by a dense mass of kneeling women with turbaned headdresses and crying children on their backs their imaginations excited by gazing at the bleeding figure on the cross but among them all i did not see a single interesting face a priest ascended the pulpit thin and ghastly pale who in a voice that rang through every part of the building preached emphatically a passion sermon few of the indians understood even the language and at times the cries of children made his words inaudible but the thrilling tones of his voice played upon every chord in their hearts and mothers regardless of their infants cries sat motionless their countenances fixed in high and stern enthusiasm it was the same church and we could imagine them to be the same women who in a frenzy and fury of fanaticism had dragged the unhappy vice-president by the hair and murdered him with their hands every moment the excitement grew stronger the priest tore off his black cap and leaning over the pulpit stretched forward both his arms and poured out a frantic apostrophe to the bleeding figure on the cross a dreadful groan almost curdling the blood ran through the church at this moment at the signal from the cura the indians sprang upon the arbor of pine branches tore it asunder and with a noise like the crackling of a great conflagration struggling and scuffling around the altar broke into bits the consecrated branches to save as holy relics two indians in broad-brimmed hats mounted the ladders on each side of the cross and with embroidered cloth over their hands and large silver pincers drew out the spikes from the hands the feelings of the women burst forth in tears sobs groans and shrieks of lamentation so loud and deep that coming upon us unexpectedly our feelings were disturbed and even with sane men the empire of reason tottered such screams of anguish i never heard called out by mortal suffering and as the body smeared with blood was held aloft under the pulpit while the priest leaned down and apostrophized it in frantic fervor and the mass of women wild with excitement heaved to and fro like the surges of a troubled sea the whole scene was so thrilling so dreadfully mournful that without knowing why tears started from our eyes four years before at jerusalem on mount calvary itself and in the presence of the scoffing mussulman i had beheld the same representation of the descent from the cross but the enthusiasm of greek pilgrims in the church of the holy sepulchre was nothing compared with this whirlwind of fanaticism and frenzy by degrees the excitement died away the cracking of the pine branches ceased and the whole arbor was broken up and distributed and very soon commenced preparations for the grand procession we went out with the corregidor and officers of the municipality and took our place in the balcony of the cabildo the procession opened upon us in a manner so extraordinary that screening myself from observation below i endeavored to make a note of it on the spot the leader was a man on horseback called the centurion wearing a helmet and cuirass of pasteboard covered with silver leaf a black crape mask black velvet shorts and white stockings a red sash and blue and white ribbons on his arms a silver hilted sword and a lance 
with which from time to time turning around he beckoned and waved the procession on then came a led horse having on its back an old mexican saddle richly plated with silver then two men wearing long blue gowns with round hoods covering their heads and having only holes for the eyes leading two mules abreast covered with black cloth dresses enveloping their whole bodies to their feet the long trains of which were supported by men attired like the other two then followed the large silver cross of the crucifixion with a richly ornamented silver pedestal and ornaments dangling from each arm of the cross that looked like lanterns supported by four men in long black dresses next came a procession of indians two abreast wearing long black cloaks with black felt hats the brims six or eight inches wide all with lighted candles in their hands and then four indians in the same costume but with crowns of thorns on their heads dragging a long low carriage or bier filled with pine leaves and having a naked skull laid on the top at one end next and in striking contrast with this emblem of mortality advanced an angel in the attitude of an opera dancer borne on the shoulders of six men dressed in flounced purple satin with lace at the bottom gauze wings and a cloud of gauze over her head holding in her right hand a pair of silver pincers and in her left a small wooden cross and having a train of white muslin ten yards long supported by a pretty little girl fancifully dressed then another procession of indians with lighted candles then a group of devils in horrible masquerade then another angel still more like an opera dancer dressed in azure blue satin with rich lace wings and clouds and fluttering ribbons holding in her right hand a ladder and in her left a silver hammer her train supported as before and we could not help seeing that she wore black velvet small clothes then another angel dressed in yellow holding in her right hand a small wooden cross and in the other i could not tell what the next in order was a beautiful little girl about ten years old armed cap a pie with breastplate and helmet of silver also called the centurion who moved along in a slow and graceful dance keeping time to the music turning round stopping resting on her sword and waving on a party worthy of such a chief being twelve beautiful children fancifully dressed intending to represent the twelve apostles one of them carrying in his arms a silver cock to signify that he was the representative of st peter the next was the great object of veneration the figure of the christ crucified on a bier in a full-length case of plate glass strewed with roses inside and out and protected by a mourning canopy of black cloth supported by men in long black gowns with hoods covering all but the eyes this was followed by the cura and priests in their richest robes and bareheaded the muffled drum and soldiers with arms reversed the virgin mary in a long black mourning dress closed the procession it passed on to make the tour of the city twice we intercepted it and then went to the church of el calvario it stands on an elevation at the extreme end of a long street and the steps were already crowded with women dressed in white from the head to the feet with barely an oval opening for the face it was dark when the procession made its appearance at the foot of the street but by the blaze of innumerable lighted candles every object was exhibited with more striking wildness and fanaticism seemed written in letters of fire on the faces of the indians the centurion cleared away up the steps the procession with a loud chant entered the church and we went away
End of section 14. Incidents of Travel in Central America, Chiapas, and Yucatan, Volume 2, by John Lloyd Steffens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sue Anderson. In the evening we made several visits, and late at night we were called to a conference by some friends of the cura, and on his behalf. His troubles were not yet over on the day of our arrival he had received a peremptory order from the provesor to repair to guatemala with notice that some proper person would be appointed in his place we knew that the terms of the order afflicted the cura for they implied that he was not a proper person all quetzaltenango he said could answer for his acts and he could answer to god that his motives were only to prevent the effusion of blood his house was all in confusion he was packing up his books and furniture and preparing to obey the provisor's order but his friends considered it was dangerous for him to go to guatemala at that place they said he would be under the eyes of carrera who meeting him in an angry moment might cut him down in the street if he did not go the provisor would send soldiers after him such was the rigor of church discipline they wished him to fly the country to go with us into mexico but he could not leave without a passport from guatemala and this would be refused the reason of their unburdening themselves to us showed the helplessness of his condition they supposed that i might have influence with the provisor and begged me to write to guatemala and state the facts as they were known to all quetzaltenango i had determined to take no part in the public or personal affairs of this unhappy revolution but here i would not have hesitated to incur any trouble or risk to serve the cura could it have done him any good but i knew the sensitiveness of the men in power and believed that the provisor and the government would resent my interference i proposed however to write to a friend who i knew stood well with the provisor and request him to call upon that dignitary and state the facts as from me and i suggested that he should send some friend to guatemala expressly to see the provisor in person returned to a land of government and laws i can hardly realize that so short a time since i was called in to counsel for the safety of a man of the cura's character and station relatively the most respectable clergyman in our country does not stand higher than he did the next morning we were invited to breakfast with another friend and counsellor and about as strange a one as myself being the old lady who had sent the cura one hundred dollars before mentioned the plan was discussed and settled and in the course of the day two friends undertook to visit guatemala on the cura's behalf we intended that day to ascend the volcano of quetzaltenango but were disappointed in our guide in the morning we made purchases and provisions for continuing our journey and as one of our mules backs was badly galled we requested the gobernador to procure us indian carriers in the afternoon in company with the corregidor we rode to the warm springs of almolonga the road crosses a spur of the volcano and descends precipitously into a deep valley in which about a league distant stand the village and hot springs there is a good bathing house at which we were not allowed to pay being considered the guests of the city outside in a beautiful natural reservoir indian men women and children were bathing together we returned by another road passing up a valley of extraordinary beauty and the theme of conversation was the happiness the country might enjoy but for wars and revolutions beautiful as it was all wished 
to leave it and seek a land where life was safe mexico or el norte toward evening descending the spur of the volcano we met several hundred indians returning from the ceremonies of the holy week and exceeding in drunkenness all the specimens we had yet encountered in one place a man and woman the latter with a child on her back were staggering so near the brink of a precipice that the corregidor dismounted and took the child from them and made them go before us into the town there was no place we had visited except ruined cities so unique and interesting and which deserved to be so thoroughly explored as quetzaltenango a month at least might be satisfactorily and profitably employed in examining the many curious objects in the country around for botanical researches it is the richest region in central america but we had no time even for rest i passed the evening in writing packing things to be sent to guatemala among others my quetzal which however never arrived and in writing letters one of which was on account of the cura and in which intending even if it fell into wrong hands to be out of the country myself i spoke in no measured terms of the atrocity committed by carrera chapter thirteen journey continued a mountain plain lost guides a trying moment aguas calientes a magnificent view gold ore san sebastiano quequetenango sierra madre a huge skeleton the ruins pyramidal structures a vault mounds a welcome addition interior of a mound vases ascent of the sierra madre buena vista the descent todos santos san martin san andres petapan a forest on fire suffering of the mules from swarms of flies san antonio de guista early in the morning our mules were saddled for the journey the gobernador and another friend of the cura came to receive parting instructions and set off for guatemala the indians engaged for us did not make their appearance and desirous to save the day we loaded the mules and sent juan and bobon forward with the luggage in a little while two women came and told us that our indians were in prison i accompanied them to two or three officials and with much difficulty and loss of time found the man having charge of them who said that finding we had paid them part of their hire in advance and afraid they would buy agua ardiente and be missing he had shut them up the night before to have them ready and had left word to that effect with one of the servants of the cura i went with him to the prison paid a shilling apiece for their lodging and took them over to the convent the poor fellows had not eaten since they were shut up and as usual wanted to go home for tortillas for the journey we refused to let them go but gave them money to buy some in the plaza and kept the woman and their chamars as hostages for their return but we became tired of waiting mr catherwood picked up their chamars and threw them across his saddle as a guarantee for their following and we set off we had added to our equipments aguas de arma being undressed goatskins embroidered with red leather which hung down from the saddle-bow to protect the legs against rain and were now fully accoutred in central american style it was cold and wintry we ascended and crossed a high plain and at the distance of a league descended to a village where we learned that juan and bobon had passed on some time before beyond this we ascended a high and rugged mountain and on the top reached a magnificent plain we rode at a brisk pace and it was one o'clock before our jailbirds overtook us by this time we were surprised at not overtaking our men with the luggage we could not have passed them for there was but one road 
since leaving the village we had not seen a single person and at two o'clock we met a man with a loaded mule coming from aguas calientes the end of our day's journey who had not met them mr catherwood became alarmed fearing that they had robbed us and run away i was always careless with luggage but never lost any and was slow in coming to this belief in half an hour we met another man who told us that he had not seen them and that there was no other road than the one by which he came since our apprehensions began we had not been able to discover any tracks but went on to within two leagues of our halting place when we stopped and held one of the most anxious consultations that occurred in our whole journey we knew but little of the men juan cheated us every day in the little purchases for the road and we had detected him in the atrocity of keeping back part of the money we gave him to buy corn and sacate and starving the mules after a most unhappy deliberation we concluded that they had broken open the trunks taken out the money thrown the rest of the contents down some ravine mounted the mules and made off besides money beds and bedding these trunks contained all mr catherwood's drawings and the precious notebooks to which the reader is indebted for these pages the fruits of all our labor were gone in all our difficulties and perplexities we never had a more trying moment we were two leagues from aguas calientes to go on rouse the village get fresh horses and return in pursuit was our first idea but this would widen the distance between us and probably we should not be able to get horses with hearts so heavy that nothing but the feeble hope of catching them while dividing the money kept us from sinking we turned back it was four o'clock in the afternoon neither our mules nor we had eaten anything since early in the morning night would be upon us and it was doubtful whether our mules would hold out our prisoners told us we had been very imprudent to let the men set out alone and took it for granted that they had not let slip the opportunity of robbing us as we rode back both mr c and i brooded over an apprehension which for some time neither mentioned to the other it was the letter i had written on behalf of the cura we should again be within reach of carrera if the letter by accident fell into his hands he would be indignant at what he considered my ingratitude and he could very easily take his revenge our plans however were made up at once we determined at all events not to go back to guatemala nor broken as we were in fortune and spirit to give up palenque but if possible to borrow money for the road even if we set out on foot but oh gloria eternal as the official bulletin said of carrera's victory on reaching the top of a mountain we saw the men climbing up a deep ravine on the other side we did not tell them our agony but had not gone far before the indians told all and they were not surprised or hurt how we passed them neither of us knew but another such a spasm would have put a period to our journey of life and from that time however tedious or whatever might be the inducements we resolved to keep by our luggage at dusk we reached the top of a high mountain and by one of those long steep and difficult descents of which it is impossible to give the reader any idea entered the village of aguas calientes it was occupied entirely by indians who gathered round us in the plaza and by the light of pine sticks looked at carrera's passport not one of them could read it but it was enough to pronounce the name and the whole village was put in requisition to provide us with something to eat the alcalde distributed the money we gave him 
and one brought sixpence worth of eggs another of beans another of tortillas another of lard another of candles and a dozen or more received sixpence apiece for sacate not one of them would bring anything until he had the money in hand a fire was kindled in the square and in process of time we had supper our usual supper of fried eggs beans tortillas and chocolate any one of them enough to disturb digestion in a state of repose with the excitement and vexation of our supposed loss made me ill the cabildo was a wretched shed full of fleas with a coat of dust an inch thick to soften the hard earthen floor it was too cold to sleep out of doors and there were no pins to hang hammocks on for in this region hammocks were not used at all we made inquiries with the view of hiring for the night the bedsteads of the principal inhabitants but there was not one in the village all slept on the bosom of mother earth and we had part of the family bed fortunately however and most important for us our mules fared well early in the morning we resumed our journey there are warm springs in this neighborhood but we did not go out of our way to visit them a short distance from the village we crossed a river and commenced ascending a mountain on the top we came upon a narrow table of land with a magnificent forest on both sides far below us the wind swept over the lofty height so that with our ponchos which were necessary on account of the cold it was difficult to keep the saddle the road was broken and stony and the track scarcely perceptible at about ten o'clock the whole surface of the mountain was a bare ridge of limestone from which the sun was reflected with scorching heat and the whiteness was dazzling and painful to the eyes below us on each side continued an immense forest of gigantic pines the road was perfectly desolate we met no travellers in four hours we saw on our left at a great distance below a single hacienda with a clearing around it seemingly selected for a magnificent seclusion from the convulsions of a distracted country the ridge was broken by gullies and deep ravines and we came to one across which by way of bridge lay the trunks of two gigantic pines my macho always pulled back when i attempted to lead him and i remained on his back and was carried steadily over but at the other end we started at a noise behind us our best cargo mule had fallen rolled over and hung on the brink of the precipice with her feet kicking in the air kept from falling to the bottom only by being entangled among bushes in a moment we scrambled down to her got her head turned up the bank and by means of strong halters heaved her out but she was bruised and crippled and barely able to stagger under her load continuing along the ridge swept by fierce blasts of wind we descended again to a river rode some distance along its bank and passed a track up the side of a mountain on the right so steep that i had no idea it could be our road and passed it but was called back it was the steepest ascent we had yet made in the country it was cruel to push my brave macho but i had been tormented all day with a violent headache and could not walk so i beat up making the best tacks i could and stopping every time i put about on the top broke upon us one of those grand and magnificent views which when we had wiped off perspiration and recovered breath always indemnified us for our toil it was the highest ground on which we had yet stood around us was a sea of mountains and peeping above them but so little as to give full effect to our own great height were the conical tops of two new volcanoes the surface was of limestone rock in immense strata with quartz in one piece of which we discovered a speck of gold here again in this vast wilderness of mountains 
deep in the bowels of the earth are those repositories of the precious ores for which millions upon millions all over the world are toiling bargaining craving and cheating every day continuing on this ridge we came out upon a spur commanding a view far below us of a cultivated valley and the village of san sebastiano we descended to the valley left the village on our right crossed the spur and saw the end of our day's journey the town of Gegetenango, situated on an extensive plain with a mild climate luxuriant with tropical productions surrounded by immense mountains and before us the great sierra madre the natural bulwark of central america the grandeur and magnificence of the view disturbed only by the distressing reflection that we had to cross it my macho brought up on the plains of costa rica had long seemed puzzled to know what mountains were made for and if he could have spoken he would have cried out in anguish hills peep over hills and alps on alps arise our day's journey was but twenty-seven miles but it was harder for man and beast than any sixty since we left guatemala we rode into the town the chief place of the last district of central america and of the ancient kingdom of quiche it was well built with a large church or plaza and again a crowd of mestizos were engaged in the favorite occupation of fighting cocks as we rode through the plaza the bell sounded for the oration or vesper prayers the people fell on their knees and we took off our hats we stopped at the house of don joaquim monte an old spaniard of high consideration by whom we were hospitably received and who though a centralist on account of some affair of his son's had had his house at chiantla plundered by carrera's soldiers his daughters were compelled to take refuge in the church and forty or fifty mules were driven from his hacienda in a short time we had a visit from the corregidor who had seen our proposed journey announced in the government paper and treated us with the consideration due to persons specially recommended by the government we reached Gegetenango in a shattered condition our cargo mules had their backs so galled that it was distressing to use them and the saddle horse was no better off bobon in walking barefooted over the stony road had bruised the ball of one of his feet so that he was disabled and that night juan's enormous supper gave him an indigestion he was a tremendous feeder on the road nothing eatable was safe we owed him a spite for pilfering our bread and bringing us down to tortillas and were not sorry to see him on his back but he rolled over the floor of the corridor crying out uproariously so as to disturb the whole household voy morir voy morir i am going to die i am going to die he was a hard subject to work upon but we took him in hand strongly and unloaded him besides our immediate difficulties we heard of others in prospect in consequence of the throng of emigrants from guatemala towards mexico no one was admitted into that territory without a passport from ciudad real the capital of chiapas four or five days journey from the frontier the frontier was a long line of river in the midst of a wilderness and there were two roads a lower one but little travelled on account of the difficulty of crossing the rivers but at that time passable as we intended however at all events to stop at this place for the purpose of visiting the ruins we postponed our decision till the next day the next morning don joaquim told us of the skeleton of a colossal animal supposed to be a mastodon which had been found in the neighbourhood some of the bones had been collected and were then in the town and having seen them we took a guide and walked to the place where they had been discovered on the borders of the rio chinaca 
about half a mile distant at this time the river was low but the year before swelled by the immense floods of the rainy season it had burst its bounds carried away its left bank and laid bare one side of the skeleton the bank was perpendicular about thirty feet high and the animal had been buried in the upright position besides the bones in the town some had been carried away by the flood others remained embedded in the earth but the impression of the whole animal from twenty-five to thirty feet long was distinctly visible we were told that about eight leagues above on the bank of the same river the skeleton of a much larger animal had been discovered in the afternoon we rode to the ruins which in the town were called las cuevas the caves they lie about half a league distant on a magnificent plain bounded in the distance by lofty mountains among which is the great sierra madre the site of the ancient city as at patinamit and santa cruz del quiche was chosen for its security against enemies it was surrounded by a ravine and the general character of the ruins is the same as at quiche but the hand of destruction has fallen upon it more heavily the whole is a confused heap of grass-grown fragments the principal remains are two pyramidal structures one of them measures at the base one hundred and two feet the steps are four feet high and seven feet deep making the whole height twenty-eight feet they are not of cut stone as at copan but of rough pieces cemented with lime and the whole exterior was formerly coated with stucco and painted on the top is a small square platform and at the base lies a long slab of rough stone apparently hurled down from the top perhaps the altar on which human victims were extended for sacrifice the owner of the ground a mestizo whose house was near by and who accompanied us to the ruins told us that he had bought the land from indians and that for some time after his purchase he was annoyed by their periodical visits to celebrate some of their ancient rites on the top of this structure this annoyance continued until he whipped two or three of the principal men and drove them away at the foot of the structure was a vault faced with cut stone in which were found a collection of bones and a terracotta vase then in his possession the vault was not long enough for the body of a man extended and the bones must have been separated before they were placed there the owner believed that these structures contained interior apartments with hidden treasures and there were several mounds supposed to be sepulchres of the ancient inhabitants which also he had no doubt contained treasure the situation of the place was magnificent we had never before enjoyed so good an opportunity of working and agreed with him to come the next day and make excavations promising to give him all the treasure and taking for my share only the skulls vases and other curiosities the next morning before we were up the door was thrown open and to our surprise we received a salutation in english the costume of the stranger was of the country his beard was long and he looked as if already he had made a hard morning's ride to my great surprise and pleasure i recognized pauling whom the reader will perhaps remember i had seen as superintendent of a cochineal hacienda at amatitan he had heard of our setting out for mexico and disgusted with his occupation and the country had mounted his horse and with all he was worth tied on behind his saddle pushed on to overtake us on the way he had bought a fine mule and by hard riding and changing from one animal to the other had reached us in four days he was in difficulty about a passport and was anxious to have the benefit of mine in order to get out of the country offering to attach himself to me in any capacity necessary for that purpose fortunately my passport was broad enough to cover him 
and i immediately constituted him the general manager of the expedition the material of which was now reduced to juan sick and but one cargo mule sound at nine o'clock attended by three men and a boy with machetes being all we could procure at so short a notice we were again among the ruins we were not strong enough to pull down a pyramid and lost the morning in endeavouring to make a breach in one of the sides but did not accomplish anything in the afternoon we opened one of the mounds the interior was a rough coat of stones and lime and after an hour's digging we came to fragments of bones and the two lower vases in the plate opposite the first of the two was entire when we discovered it but unfortunately was broken in getting it out though we obtained all the pieces it is graceful in design the surface is polished and the workmanship very good the last was already broken and though more complicated the surface is not polished the tripod at the top of the engraving is a copy of the vase before referred to found in the tomb which i procured from the owner of the land it is twelve inches in diameter and the surface is polished we discovered no treasure but our day's work was most interesting and we only regretted that we had not time to explore more thoroughly in the meantime don joaquim had made arrangements for us and the next morning we resumed our journey we left behind a mule a horse and bobon and were reinforced by pauling well mounted and armed with a pair of pistols and a short double-barreled gun slung to his saddle-bow and santiago a mexican fugitive soldier juan was an interesting invalid mounted on a mule and the whole was under escort of a respectable old muleteer who was setting out with empty mules to bring back a load of sugar at a short distance from the village we commenced ascending the sierra madre the first range was stony and on top of it we came upon a cultivated plain beyond which rose a second range covered with a thick forest of oak on the top of this range stood a cross the spot was called buena vista or fine view and commanded a magnificent expanse of mountains and plains five lakes and two volcanoes one of which called tajamulco our guide said was a water volcano beyond this rose a third range at some distance up was an indian rancho at which a fine little boy thrust his face through a bush fence and said adios to every one that passed beyond was another boy to whom we all in succession said adios but the surly little fellow would not answer one of us on the summit of this range we were almost on a level with the tops of the volcanoes as we ascended the temperature grew colder and we were compelled to put on our ponchos at half past two we reached the top of the sierra madre the dividing line of the waters being twelve miles from Gueguetenango, and in our devious course making the second time that we had crossed the sierra the ridge of the mountain was a long level table about half a mile wide with rugged sides rising on the right to a terrific peak riding about half an hour on this table by the side of a stream of clear and cold water which passed on carrying its tribute to the pacific ocean we reached a miserable rancho in front of which the arriero proposed to encamp as he said it would be impossible to reach the next village at a distance it was a glorious idea that of sleeping on the top of the sierra madre and the scene was wild enough for the most romantic imagination but being poorly provided against cold we would have gladly exchanged it for an indian village End of section fifteen. Incidents of Travel in Central America, Chiapas, and Yucatan, Volume Two, by John Lloyd Steffens. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sue Anderson. The occupants of the hut were a man and woman who lived there rent free. Like the eagle, they had fixed their habitation where they were not likely to be disturbed. While the men were unloading, Juan, as an invalid, asked permission to stretch his huge body before the fire but the woman told him there was more room out of doors i succeeded however in securing him a place inside we had an hour to wander over the top of the sierra it belonged to our friend don joaquin monte and was what would be called at home a pretty substantial piece of fast property at every step there was some new opening which presented a new view of the grand and magnificent in nature in many places between cliffs and under certain exposures were fine pieces of ground and about a half a mile distant a potrero or pasture ground for brood mares which we visited to buy some corn for our mules a vicious jack reigned lord of the sierra adjoining the occupied hut was another about ten feet square made of small upright poles thatched with branches of cypress and open on all sides to the wind we collected a quantity of wood made a fire in the centre had supper and passed a social evening the muleteers had a large fire outside and with their pack saddles and cargoes built a breastwork to shelter themselves against the wind fancy called up a picture of far distant scenes a small circle of friends perhaps at that moment thinking of us perhaps to tell the truth we wished to be with them and above all as we looked to our sleeping places thought of the comforts of home nevertheless we soon fell asleep toward morning however we were reminded of our elevated region the ground was covered with a hoar-frost and water was frozen a quarter of an inch thick our guide said that this happened regularly every night in the year when the atmosphere was clear it was the first ice we had seen in the country the men were shivering around a large fire and as soon as they could see went out to look for the mules one of them had strayed and while the men were looking for her we had breakfast and did not get off till a quarter before eight our road traversed the ridge of the sierra which for two leagues was a level table a great part composed of immense beds of red slate and blue limestone or chalk rock lying in vertical strata at ten o'clock we began to descend the cold being still severe the descent surpassed in grandeur and magnificence all that we had yet encountered it was by a broad passage with perpendicular mountain walls rising in rugged and terrific peaks higher and higher as we descended out of which gigantic cypress trees were growing their trunks and all their branches dead before us between these immense walls was a vista reaching beyond the village of san andres twenty-four miles distant a stream of water was dashing down over rocks and stones hurrying on to the atlantic we crossed it perhaps fifty times on bridges wild and rude as the stream itself and the mountains between which it rolled as we descended the temperature became milder at twelve o'clock the immense ravine opened into a rich valley a mile in width and in half an hour we reached the village of todos santos on the right far below us was a magnificent table cultivated with corn and bounded by the side of the great sierra and in the suburbs of the village were apple and peach trees covered with blossoms and young fruit we had again reached the tierras templadas and in europe or north america the beauty of this miserable unknown village would be a theme for poetry as we rode through it at the head of the street we were stopped by a drunken indian supported by two men hardly able to stand themselves 
who we thought were taking him to prison but staggering before us they blocked up the passage and shouted pasaporte pauling in anticipation and to assume his new character had tied his jacket around his waist by the sleeves and was dragging one of the mules by its halter not one of the three could read the passport and they sent for the secretary a bareheaded indian habited in nothing but a ragged cotton shirt who examined it very carefully and read aloud the name of rafael carrera which i think was all that he attempted to make out we were neither sentimental nor philosophical nor moralizing travellers but it gave us pangs to think that such a magnificent country was in the possession of such men passing the church and convent we ascended a ridge then descended an immense ravine crossed another magnificent valley and at length reached the indian village of san martin which with loveliness and grandeur all around us might have been selected for its surpassing beauty of position we rode to the cabildo and then to the hut of the alcalde the people were all indians the secretary was a bare-legged boy who spelled out every word in the passport except our names but his reading sufficed to procure supper for us and provender for the mules and early in the morning we pushed on again for some distance we rode on a lofty ridge with a precipitous ravine on each side in one place so narrow that our arriero told us when the wind is high there is danger of being blown off we continued descending and at a quarter past twelve reached san andres petapan fifteen miles distant blooming with oranges sapotes and other fruit trees passing through the village at a short distance beyond we were stopped by a fire in the woods we turned back and attempted to pass by another road but were unable before we returned the fire had reached the place we left and increased so fast that we had apprehensions for the luggage mules and hurried them back with the men toward the village the flames were creeping and crackling toward us shooting up and whirled by currents of wind and occasionally when fed with dry and combustible materials flashing and darting along like a train of gunpowder we fell back keeping as near as we could to the line of fire the road lying along the side of a mountain while the fire came from the ravine below crossing the road and moving upward the clouds of smoke and ashes the rushing of currents of wind and flames the crackling of burning branches and trees wrapped in flames and the rapid progress of the destroying element made such a wild and fearful scene that we could not tear ourselves away at length we saw the flames rush up the side of the ravine intercepting the path before us we spurred our horses shot by and in a moment the whole was a sheet of flame the fire was now spreading so rapidly that we became alarmed and hurried back to the church which on an elevation strongly defined against the immense mountain in the background stood before us as a place of refuge by this time the villagers had become alarmed and men and women were hurrying to the height to watch the progress of the flames the village was in danger of conflagration it would be impossible to urge the loaded mules up the hill we had descended and we resolved to deposit the luggage in the church and save the mules by driving them up unburdened it was another of those wild scenes to which no effect can be given in words we stopped on the brow of the hill before the square of the church and while we were watching the fire the black clouds and sheets of flame rolled up the side of the mountain and spared the village relieved from apprehension we sat down under a tree in front of the church to the calm enjoyment of the terrific spectacle and a cold fowl the cinders and ashes fell around and the destructive element rushed on 
sparing the village before us perhaps to lay some other in ruins we were obliged to wait two hours from the foot of the hill on which the village stood the ground was hot and covered with a light coat of ashes the brush and underwood were burned away in some places were lying trees reduced to masses of live coal and others were standing with their trunks and branches all on fire in one place we passed a square of white ashes the remains of some miserable indian hut our faces and hands were scorched and our whole bodies heated when we emerged from the fiery forest for a few moments the open air was delightful but we were hardly out of one trouble before we had another swarms of enormous flies perhaps driven out by the fire and hovering on the borders of the burned district fell upon the mules every bite drew blood and the tormentors clung to the suffering animals until brushed off by a stick for an hour we labored hard but could not keep their heads and necks free the poor beasts were almost frantic and in spite of all we could do their necks the inside of their legs mouths ears nostrils and every tender part of their skin were trickling with blood hurrying on in three hours we saw the church of san antonio de guista and in a few minutes entered the village beautifully situated on a tableland projecting from the slope of a mountain looking upon an immense opening and commanding on all sides a magnificent view at this time we were beyond the reach of war and free from all apprehensions with the addition of Pauling's pistols and double-barreled gun, a faithful muleteer, Santiago, and Juan on his legs again, we could have stormed an Indian village and locked up a refractory alcalde in his own cabildo. We took possession of San Antonio de Guista, dividing ourselves between the cabildo and the convent, sent for the alcalde, even on the borders of central america the name of carrera was omnipotent and told him to stay there and wait upon us or send an alguacil the convent stood adjoining the church on an open table of land commanding a view of a magnificent valley surrounded by immense mountains and on the left was a vista between two mountain ranges wild rugged and lofty losing their tops in clouds before the door of the convent was a large cross on a high pedestal of stone with the coating decayed and covered with wild flowers the convent was enclosed by a brush fence without any opening until we made one the padre was not at home which was very fortunate for him as there would not have been room enough for us all in fact everything seemed exactly intended for our party there were three beds just as many as we could conveniently occupy and the style of them was new they were made of long sticks about an inch thick tied with bark strings at top and bottom and resting on crotches about two feet high driven into the dirt floor the alcalde and his major had roused the village in a few moments instead of the mortifying answer no i there is none the provision made for us was almost equal to the offers of the turkish paradise twenty or thirty women were in the convent at one time with baskets of corn tortillas dulces plantains jocotes sapotes and a variety of other fruits each one's stock in trade being of the value of three cents and among them was a species of tortillas thin and baked hard about twelve inches in diameter one hundred and twenty for six cents of which as they were not expensive we laid in a large supply at this place our muleteer was to leave us we had but one cargo mule fit for service and applied to the alcalde for two carriers to go with us across the frontier to comitan 
he went out as he said to consult with the mozos and told us that they asked six dollars apiece we spoke to him of our friend carrera and on a second consultation the demand was reduced by two-thirds we were obliged to make provision for three days and even to carry corn for the mules and juan and santiago had a busy night boiling fowls and eggs chapter fourteen comfortable lodgings journey continued stony road beautiful river suspension bridge the dolores rio laguetero enthusiasm brought down another bridge entry into mexico a bath a solitary church a scene of barrenness zapolutla comitan another countryman more perplexities official courtesy trade of comitan smuggling scarcity of soap the next morning we found the convent was so comfortable we were so abundantly served the alcalde or his major staff in hand being in constant attendance and the situation so beautiful that we were in no hurry to go but the alcalde told us that all was ready we did not see our carriers and found that he and his major were the mozos whom he had consulted they would not let slip two dollars apiece and laying down their staves and dignity bared their backs placed the straps across their foreheads took up the loads and trotted off we started at five minutes before eight the weather was fine but hazy from the village we descended a hill to an extensive stony plain and at about a league's distance reached the brink of a precipice from which we looked down into a rich oblong valley two or three thousand feet deep shut in all around by a mountain wall and seeming an immense excavation toward the other end of the valley was a village with a ruined church and the road led up a precipitous ascent to a plain on the same level with that on which we stood undulating and boundless as the sea below us it seemed as if we could drop a stone to the bottom we descended by one of the steepest and most stony paths we had yet encountered in the country crossing and recrossing in a zigzag course along the side of the height perhaps making the descent a mile and a half long very soon we reached the bank of a beautiful river running lengthwise through the valley bordered on each side by immense trees throwing their branches clear across and their roots washed by the stream and while the plain beyond was dry and parched they were green and luxuriant riding along it we reached a suspension bridge of most primitive appearance and construction called by the natives la amaca which had existed there from time immemorial it was made of osiers twisted into cords about three feet apart and stretched across the river with a hanging network of vines the ends fastened to the trunks of two opposite trees it hung about twenty-five feet above the river which was here some eighty feet wide and was supported in different places by vines tied to the branches the access was by a rude ladder to a platform in the crotch of a tree in the bottom of the amaca were two or three poles to walk on it waved in the wind and was an unsteady and rather insecure means of transportation from the centre the vista of the river both ways under the arches of the trees was beautiful and in every direction the amaca was a most picturesque looking object we continued on to the village and after a short halt and a smoke with the alcalde rode on to the extreme end of the valley and by a steep and stony ascent at twenty minutes past twelve reached the level ground above here we dismounted slipped the bridles of our mules and seated ourselves to wait for our indians looking down into the deep embosomed valley 
and back at the great range of cordilleras crowned by the sierra madre seeming a barrier fit to separate worlds free from all apprehensions we were now in the full enjoyment of the wild country and wild mode of travelling but our poor indians perhaps did not enjoy it so much the usual load was from three to four arrobas seventy-five to one hundred pounds ours were not more than fifty but the sweat rolled in streams down their naked bodies and every limb trembled after a short rest they started again the day was hot and sultry the ground dry parched and stony we had two sharp descents and reached the river dolores on both sides were large trees furnishing a beautiful shade which after our scorching ride we found delightful the river was about three hundred feet broad in the rainy season it is impassable but in the dry season not more than three or four feet deep very clear and the color a grayish green probably from the reflection of the trees we had had no water since we left the suspension bridge and both our mules and we were intemperate we remained here half an hour and now apprehensions which had been operating more or less all the time made us feel very uncomfortable we were approaching and very near the frontier of mexico this road was so little travelled that as we were advised there was no regular guard but piquets of soldiers were scouring the whole line of frontier to prevent smuggling who might consider us contraband our passports were good for going out of central america but to go into mexico the passport of the mexican authorities at ciudad real four days journey was necessary turning back was not in our vocabulary perhaps we should be obliged to wait in the wilderness till we could send for one in half an hour we reached the rio laguitero the boundary line between guatemala and mexico a scene of wild and surpassing beauty with banks shaded by some of the noblest trees of the tropical forests water as clear as crystal and fish a foot long playing in it as gently as if there were no fish hooks no soldiers were visible all was as desolate as if no human being had ever crossed the boundary before we had a moment's consultation on which side to encamp and determined to make a lodgment in mexico i was riding pauline's horse and spurred him into the water to be the first to touch the soil with one plunge his forefeet were off the bottom and my legs under water for an instant i hesitated but as the water rose to my holsters my enthusiasm gave way and i wheeled back into central america as we afterward found the water was ten or twelve feet deep we waited for the indians in some doubt whether it would be possible to cross at all with the luggage at a short distance above was a ledge of rocks forming rapids over which there had been a bridge with a wooden arch and stone abutments the latter of which were still standing the bridge having been carried away by the rising of the waters seven years before it was the last of the dry season the rocks were in some places dry the body of the river running in channels on each side and a log was laid to them from the abutments of the bridge we took off the saddles and bridles of the mules and cautiously with water breaking rapidly up to the knees carried everything across by hand an operation in which an hour was consumed one night's rain on the mountains would have made it impassable the mules were then swum across and we were all landed safely in mexico on the bank opposite the place where i attempted to cross was a semi-circular clearing from which the only opening was the path leading into the mexican provinces 
we closed this up and turned the mules loose hung our traps on the trees and bivouacked in the centre the men built a fire and while they were preparing supper we went down to the river to bathe the rapids were breaking above us the wildness of the scene its seclusion and remoteness the clearness of the water the sense of having accomplished an important part of our journey all revived our physical and moral being clean apparel consummated the glory of the bath for several days our digestive organs had been out of order but when we sat down to supper they could have undertaken the bridles of the mules and my brave macho it was a pleasure to hear him crunch his corn we were out of central america safe from the dangers of revolution and stood on the wild borders of mexico in good health with good appetites and something to eat we had still a tremendous journey before us but it seemed nothing we strode the little clearing as proudly as the conquerors of mexico and in our extravagance resolved to have fish for breakfast we had no hooks and there was not even a pin in our travelling equipage but we had needles and thread pauling with the experience of seven years roughing had expedients and put a needle in the fire which softened its temper so that he bent it into a hook a pole was on every tree and we could see the fish in the water all that we wanted was for them to open their mouths and hook themselves to the needle but this they would not do and for this reason alone we did not catch any we returned our men cut some poles and resting them in the crotch of a tree covered them with branches we spread our mats under and our roof and beds were ready the men piled logs of wood on the fire and our sleep was sound and glorious at daylight the next morning we were again in the water our bath was even better than that of the night before and when i mounted i felt able to ride through mexico and texas to my own door at home returned once more to steamboats and railroads how flat tame and insipid all their comfort seem we started at half past seven at a very short distance three wild boars crossed our path all within gunshot but our men carried the guns and in an instant it was too late very soon we emerged from the woods that bordered the river and came out into an open plain at half past eight we crossed a low stony hill and came to the dry bed of a river the bottom was flat and baked hard and the sides smooth and regular as those of a canal at the distance of half a league water appeared and at half past nine it became a considerable stream we again entered a forest and riding by a narrow path saw directly before us closing the passage the side of a large church we came out and saw the whole gigantic building without a single habitation or the vestige of one in sight the path led across the broken wall of the courtyard we dismounted in the deep shade of the front the facade was rich and perfect it was sixty feet front and two hundred and fifty feet deep but roofless with trees growing out of the area above the walls nothing could exceed the quiet and desolation of the scene but there was something strangely interesting in these roofless churches standing in places entirely unknown santiago told us that this was called conata and the tradition is that it was once so rich that the inhabitants carried their water jars by silken cords giving our mules to santiago we entered the open door of the church the altar was thrown down the roof lay in broken masses on the ground and the whole area was a forest of trees at the foot of the church and connected with it was a convent 
there was no roof but the apartments were entire as when a good padre stood to welcome a traveller in front of the church on each side was a staircase leading up to a belfry in the centre of the facade we ascended to the top the bells which had called to matin and vesper prayers were gone the cross piece was broken from the cross the stone of the belfry was solid masses of petrified shells worms leaves and insects on one side we looked down into the roofless area and on the other over a region of waste one man had written his name there joaquim ruderigos conata may first eighteen thirty six we wrote our names under his and descended mounted rode over a stony and desolate country crossed a river and saw before us a range of hills and beyond a range of mountains then we came upon a bleak stony table and after riding four hours and a half saw the road leading across a barren mountain on our right and afraid we had missed our way halted under a low spreading tree to wait for our men we turned the mules loose and after waiting some time sent santiago back to look for them the wind was sweeping over the plain and while mr catherwood was cutting wood pauling and i descended to a ravine to look for water the bed was entirely dry and one took his course up and the other down pauling found a muddy hole in a rock which even to thirsty men was not tempting we returned and found mr catherwood warming himself by the blaze of three or four young trees which he had piled one upon another the wind was at this time sweeping furiously over the plain night was approaching we had not eaten anything since morning our small stock of provisions was in unsafe hands and we began to fear that none would be forthcoming our mules were as badly off the pasture was so poor that they required a wide range and we let all go loose except my poor macho which from certain roving propensities acquired before he came into my possession we were obliged to fasten to a tree it was some time after dark when santiago appeared with the alforgas of provisions on his back he had gone back six miles when he found the track of juan's foot one of the squarest ever planted and followed it to a wretched hut in the woods at which we had expected to stop we had lost nothing by not stopping all they could get to bring away was four eggs we supped piled up our trunks to windward spread our mats lay down gazed for a few moments at the stars and fell asleep during the night the wind changed and we were almost blown away end of section sixteen Section 17 of Incidents of Travel in Central America, Chiapas and Yucatan, Volume 2, by John Lloyd Steffens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sue Anderson. The next morning, preparatory to entering once more upon habitable regions, we made our toilet, that is, we hung a looking-glass on the branch of a tree, and shaved the upper lip and a small part of the chin at a quarter past seven we started having eaten up our last fragment since we left gista we had not seen a human being the country was still desolate and dreary there was not a breath of air hills mountains and plains were all barren and stony but as the sun peeped above the horizon its beams gladdened the scene of barrenness for two hours we ascended a barren stony mountain even before this the desolate frontier had seemed almost an impregnable barrier but alvarado had crossed it to penetrate an unknown country teeming with enemies and twice a mexican army has invaded central america 
at half past ten we reached the top of the mountain and on a line before us saw the church of zapolutla the first village in mexico here our apprehensions revived from want of a passport our great object was to reach comitan and there bide the brunt approaching the village we avoided the road that led through the plaza and leaving the luggage to get along as it could hurried through the suburbs startled some women and children and before our entry was known at the cabildo we were beyond the village we rode briskly for about a mile and then stopped to breathe an immense weight was removed from our minds and we welcomed each other to mexico coming in from the desolate frontier it opened upon us like an old long-settled civilized quiet and well-governed country four hours ride over an arid and sandy plain brought us to comitan santiago being a deserter from the mexican army afraid of being caught left us in the suburbs to return alone across the desert we had passed and we rode into the plaza in one of the largest houses fronting it lived an american part of the front was occupied as a shop and behind the counter was a man whose face called up the memory of home i asked him in english if his name was mckinney and he answered si sí, senor i put several other questions in english which he answered in spanish the sounds were familiar to him yet it was some time before he could fully comprehend that he was listening to his native tongue but when he did and understood that i was a countryman it awakened feelings to which he had long been a stranger and he received us as one in whom absence had only strengthened the links that bound him to his country dr james mckinney whose unpretending name is in comitan transformed to the imposing one of don santiago mckinney was a native of westmoreland county virginia and went out to tobasco to pass a winter for the benefit of his health and the practice of his profession circumstances induced him to make a journey into the interior and he established himself at ciudad real at the time of the cholera in central america he went to quetzaltenango where he was employed by the government and lived two years on intimate terms with the unfortunate general guzman whom he described as one of the most gentlemanly amiable intelligent and best men in the country he afterward returned to comitan and married a lady of a once rich and powerful family but stripped of a portion of its wealth by a revolution only two years before in the division of what was left the house on the plaza fell to his share and disliking the practice of his profession he abandoned it and took to selling goods like every other stranger in the country by reason of constant wars and revolutions he had become nervous he had none of this feeling when he first arrived and at the time of the first revolution in ciudad de real he stood in the plaza looking on when two men were shot down by his side fortunately he took them into a house to dress their wounds and during this time the attacking party forced their way into the plaza and cut down every man in it up to this place we had travelled on the road to mexico here pauling was to leave us and go to the capital palenque lay on our right toward the coast of the atlantic the road dr mckinney described as more frightful than any we had yet travelled and there were other difficulties war was again in our way and while all the rest of mexico was quiet tabasco and yucatan the two points in our journey were in a state of revolution this might have disturbed us greatly but for another difficulty it was necessary to present ourselves at ciudad real 
three days journey directly out of our road to procure a passport without which we could not travel in any part of the mexican republic and serious as these things were they merged in a third that is the government of mexico had issued a peremptory order to prevent all strangers visiting the ruins of palenque dr mckinney told us of his own knowledge that three belgians sent out on a scientific expedition by the belgian government had gone to ciudad real expressly to ask permission to visit them and had been refused these communications damped somewhat the satisfaction of our arrival in comitan by dr mckinney's advice we presented ourselves immediately to the commandant who had a small garrison of about thirty men well uniformed and equipped and compared with the soldiers of central america giving me a high opinion of the mexican army i showed him my passport and a copy of the government paper of guatemala which fortunately stated that i intended going to campeche to embark for the united states with great courtesy he immediately undertook to relieve us from the necessity of presenting ourselves in person at ciudad real and offered to send a courier to the governor for a passport this was a great point but still there would be detention and by his advice we called upon the prefeto who received us with the same courtesy regretted the necessity of embarrassing my movements showed us a copy of the order of the government which was imperative and made no exceptions in favor of special confidential agents he was really anxious however to serve us said he was willing to incur some responsibility and would consult with the commandant we left him with a warm appreciation of the civility and good feeling of the mexican officials and satisfied that whatever might be the result they were disposed to pay great respect to their neighbors of the north the next morning the prefeto sent back the passport with a courteous message that considered me in the same light as if i had come accredited to their own government would be happy to render me every facility in their power and that mexico was open to me to travel which way i pleased thus one great difficulty was removed i recommend all who wish to travel to get an appointment from washington as to the revolutions after having gone through the crash of a central american we were not to be put back by a mexican but the preventative order against visiting the ruins of palenque was not so easily disposed of if we made an application for permission we felt sure of the good disposition of the local authorities but if they had no discretion were bound by imperative orders and obliged to refuse it would be uncourteous and improper to make the attempt at the same time it was discouraging in the teeth of dr mckinney's information to undertake the journey without to be obliged to retrace our steps and make the long journey to the capital to ask permission would be terrible but we learned that the ruins were removed some distance from any habitation we did not believe that in the midst of a formidable revolution the government had any spare soldiers to station there as a guard from what we knew of other ruins we had reason to believe that the place was entirely desolate we might be on the ground before any one knew we were in the neighborhood and then make terms either to remain or evacuate as the case might require and it was worth the risk if we got one day's quiet possession with this uncertain prospect we immediately commenced repairing and making preparations for our journey the comfort of finding ourselves at this distant place in the house of a countryman can hardly be appreciated in dress manner appearance habits and feelings the doctor was as natural as if we had met him at home the only difference was his language 
which he could not speak connectedly but interlarded it with spanish expressions he moved among the people but he was not of them and the only tie that bound him was a dark-eyed spanish beauty one of the few that i saw in that country for whom a man might forget kindred and home he was anxious to leave the country but was trammelled by a promise made his mother-in-law not to do so during her life he lived however in such constant anxiety that he hoped she would release him comitan the frontier town of chiapas contains a population of about ten thousand it has a superb church and well-filled convent of dominican friars the better classes as in central america have dwelling houses in the town and derive their subsistence from the products of their haciendas which they visit from time to time it is a place of considerable trade and has become so by the effect of bad laws for in consequence of the heavy duties on regular importations at the mexican ports of entry most of the european goods consumed in this region are smuggled in from belize and guatemala the proceeds of confiscations and the perquisites of officers are such an important item of revenue that the officers are vigilant and the day before we arrived twenty or thirty mule loads that had been seized were brought into comitan but the profits are so large that smuggling is a regular business and the risk of seizure being considered one of the expenses of carrying it on the whole community not excepting the revenue officers are interested in it and its effect upon public morals is deplorable the markets however are but poorly supplied as we found we sent for a washerwoman but there was no soap in the town we wanted our mules shod but there was only iron enough to shoe one buttons for pantaloons in size made up for other deficiencies the want of soap was a deplorable circumstance for several days we had indulged in the pleasing expectation of having our sheets washed the reader may perhaps consider us particular as it was only three weeks since we left guatemala but we had slept in wretched cabildos and on the ground and they had become of a very doubtful color in time of trouble however commend me to the sympathy of a countryman don santiago alias dr mckinney stood by us in our hour of need provided us with soap and our sheets were purified i have omitted a circumstance which from the time of our arrival in the country we had noticed as extraordinary the horses and mules are never shod except perhaps a few pleasure horses used for riding about the streets of guatemala on the road however we were advised after we had set out that it was proper to have ours shod but there was no good blacksmith except at quetzaltenango and as we were at that place during a fiesta he would not work in crossing long ranges of stony mountains not one of them suffered except mr catherwood's riding mule and her hoofs were worn down even with the flesh pauling's difficulties were now over i procured for him a separate passport and he had before him a clear road to mexico but his interest had been awakened he was loath to leave us and after a long consultation and deliberation resolved that he would go with us to palenque chapter fifteen parting sotona a millionaire ocosingo ruins beginning of the rainy season a female guide arrival at the ruins stone figures pyramidal structures an arch a stucco ornament a wooden lintel a curious cave buildings etc a causeway more ruins journey to palenque rio grande cascades succession of villages a maniac 
the yajalon tumbala a wild place a scene of grandeur and sublimity indian carriers a steep mountain san pedro on the first of may with a bustle and confusion like those of may day at home we moved out of don santiago's house mounted and bade him farewell doubtless his daily routines have not since been broken by the visit of a countryman and communication is so difficult that he never hears from home he charged us with messages to his friend dr coleman united states consul at tabasco who was then dead and the reader will perhaps feel for him when i mention that probably a copy of this work which i intend to send him will never reach his hands i must pass over the next stage of our journey which was through a region less mountainous but not less solitary than that we had already traversed the first afternoon we stopped at the hacienda of sotona belonging to a brother-in-law of don santiago in a soft and lovely valley with a chapel attached and bell that at evening called the indian workmen women and children to vesper prayers the next day at the abode of padre solis a rich old cura short and broad living on a fine hacienda we dined off solid silver dishes drank out of silver cups and washed in a silver basin he had lived at palenque talked of candones or unbaptized indians and wanted to buy my macho promising to keep him till he died and the only thing that relieves me from self-reproach in not securing him such pasture grounds is the recollection of the padre's weight at four o'clock on the third day we reached ocosingo likewise in a beautiful situation surrounded by mountains with a large church and in the wall of the yard we noticed two sculptured figures from the ruins we proposed to visit somewhat in the same style as those at copan in the centre of the square was a magnificent ceiba tree we rode up to the house of don manuel pasada the prefect which with an old woman servant we had entirely to ourselves the family being at his hacienda the house was a long enclosure with a shed in front and furnished with bedsteads made of reeds split in two and supported on sticks resting in the ground the alcalde was a mestizo very civil and glad to see us and spoke of the neighboring ruins in the most extravagant terms but said they were so completely buried in el monte that it would require a party of men for two or three days to cut away to them and he laid great stress upon a cave the mouth of which was completely choked up with stones and which communicated by a subterraneous passage with the old city of palenque about one hundred and fifty miles distant he added that if we would wait a few days to make preparations he and all the village would go with us and make a thorough exploration we told him that first we wished to make preliminary observations and he promised us a guide for the next morning that night broke upon us the opening storm of the rainy season peals of crashing thunder reverberated from the mountains lightning illuminated with fearful flashes the darkness of night rain poured like a deluge upon our thatched roof and the worst mountains in the whole road were yet to be crossed all our efforts to anticipate the rainy season had been fruitless in the morning dark clouds still obscured the sky but they fell back and hid themselves before the beams of the rising sun the grass and trees parched by six months drought started into a deeper green and the hills and mountains seemed glad the alcalde i believe vexed at our not being willing to make an immediate affair of exploring the ruins had gone away for the day without sending us any guide and leaving word that all the men were engaged in repairing the church 
we endeavored to entice one of them away but unsuccessfully returning we found that our piazza was the schoolhouse of the village half a dozen children were sitting on a bench and the schoolmaster half tipsy was educating them that is teaching them to repeat by rote the formal parts of the church service we asked him to help us but he advised us to wait a day or two in that country nothing could be done violente we were excessively vexed at the prospect of losing the day and at the moment when we thought we had nothing left but to submit a little girl came to tell us that a woman on whose hacienda the ruins were was then about going to visit it and offered to escort us her horse was already standing before the door and before our mules were ready she rode over for us we paid our respects gave her a good cigar and lighting all around set out she was a pleasant mestizo and had a son with her a fine lad about fifteen we started at half past nine and after a hot and sultry ride at twenty minutes past eleven reached her rancho it was a mere hut made of poles and plastered with mud but the situation was one of those that warmed us to country life our kind guide sent with us her son and an indian with his machete and in half an hour we were at the ruins soon after leaving the rancho and at nearly a mile distant we saw on a high elevation through openings in the trees growing around it one of the buildings of tonila the indian name in this region for stone houses approaching it we passed on the plain in front two stone figures lying on the ground with the faces upward they were well carved but the characters were somewhat faded by long exposure to the elements although still distinct leaving them we rode on to the foot of a high structure probably a fortress rising in a pyramidal form with five spacious terraces these terraces had all been faced with stone and stuccoed but in many places they were broken and overgrown with grass and shrubs taking advantage of one of the broken parts we rode up the first pitch and following the platform of the terrace ascended by another breach to the second and in the same way to the third there we tied our horses and climbed up on foot on the top was a pyramidal structure overgrown with trees supporting the building which we had seen from the plain below among the trees were several wild lemons loaded with fruit and of a very fine flavor which if not brought there by the spaniards must be indigenous the building is fifty feet front and thirty-five feet deep it is constructed of stone and lime and the whole front was once covered with stucco of which part of the cornice and mouldings still remain the entrance is by a doorway ten feet wide which leads into a sort of antechamber on each side of which is a small doorway leading into an apartment ten feet square the walls of these apartments were once covered with stucco which had fallen down part of the roof had given way and the floor was covered with ruins in one of them was the same pitchy substance we had noticed in the sepulchre at copan the roof was formed of stones lapping over in the usual style and forming as near an approach to the arch as was made by the architects of the old world in the back wall of the center chamber was a doorway of the same size with that in front which led to an apartment without any partitions but in the center was an oblong enclosure eighteen feet by eleven which was manifestly intended as the most important part of the edifice the door was choked up with ruins to within a few feet of the top but over it and extending along the whole front of the structure was a large stucco ornament which at first impressed us most forcibly by its striking resemblance 
to the winged globe over the doors of egyptian temples part of this ornament had fallen down and striking the heap of rubbish underneath had rolled beyond the door of entrance we endeavored to roll it back and restore it to its place but it proved too heavy for the strength of four men and a boy the part which remains is represented in the engraving and differs in detail from the winged globe the wings are reversed there is a fragment of a circular ornament which may have been intended for a globe but there are no remains of serpents entwining it there was another surprising feature in this door the lintel was a beam of wood of what species we did not know but our guide said it was of the sapote tree it was so hard that on being struck it rang like metal and perfectly sound without a wormhole or other symptom of decay the surface was smooth and even and from a very close examination we were of the opinion that it must have been trimmed with an instrument of metal the opening under this doorway was what the alcalde had intended as the mouth of the cave that led to palenque and which by the way he had told us was so completely buried in el monte that it would require two days digging and clearing to reach it our guide laughed at the ignorance prevailing in the village in regard to the difficulty of reaching it but stoutly maintained the story that it led to palenque we could not prevail on him to enter it a short cut to palenque was exactly what we wanted i took off my coat and lying down on my breast began to crawl under when i had advanced about half the length of my body i heard a hideous hissing noise and starting back saw a pair of small eyes which in the darkness shone like balls of fire the precise portion of time that i employed in backing out is not worth mentioning my companions had heard the noise and the guide said it was un tigre i thought it was a wild cat but whatever it was we determined to have a shot at it we took it for granted that the animal would dash past us and in a few moments our guns and pistols swords and machetes were ready taking our positions pauling standing close against the wall thrust under a long pole and with a horrible noise out fluttered a huge turkey buzzard which flapped itself through the building and took refuge in another chamber this peril over i renewed the attempt and holding a candle before me quickly discovered the whole extent of the cave that led to palenque it was a chamber corresponding with the dimensions given of the outer walls the floor was encumbered with rubbish two or three feet deep the walls were covered with stuccoed figures among which that of a monkey was conspicuous and against the back wall among curious and interesting ornaments were two figures of men in profile with their faces toward each other well drawn and as large as life but the feet concealed by the rubbish on the floor mr catherwood crawled in to make a drawing of them but on account of the smoke from the candles the closeness and excessive heat it was impossible to remain long enough in general appearance and character they were the same as we afterwards saw carved on stone at palenque by means of a tree growing close against the wall of this building i climbed to the top and saw another edifice very near and on top of a still higher structure we climbed up to this and found it of the same general plan but more dilapidated descending we passed between two other buildings on pyramidal elevations and came out upon an open table which had probably once been the site of the city it was protected on all sides by the same high terraces overlooking for a great distance the whole country round and rendering it impossible for an enemy to approach from any quarter without being discovered across the table was a high and narrow causeway 
which seemed partly natural and partly artificial and at some distance on which was a mound with the foundations of a building that had probably been a tower beyond this the causeway extended till it joined a range of mountains from the few spanish books within my reach i have not been able to learn anything whatever of the history of this place whether it existed at the time of the conquest or not i am inclined to think however that it did and that mention is made of it in some spanish authors at all events there was no place we had seen which gave us such an idea of the vastness of the works erected by the aboriginal inhabitants pressed as we were we determined to remain and make a thorough exploration it was nearly dark when we returned to the village immediately we called upon the alcalde but found on the very threshold detention and delay he repeated the schoolmaster's warning that nothing could be done violente it would take two days to get together men and implements and these last of the kind necessary could not be had at all there was not a crowbar in the place but the alcalde said one could be made and in the same breath that there was no iron there was half a blacksmith but no iron nearer than tobasco about eight or ten days journey while we were with him another terrible storm came on we hurried back in the midst of it and determined forthwith to push on to palenque i am strongly of opinion that there is at this place much to reward the future traveller we were told that there were other ruins about ten leagues distant along the same range of mountains and it has additional interest in our eyes from the circumstance that this would be the best point from which to attempt the discovery of the mysterious city seen from the top of the cordilleras end of section seventeen section eighteen of incidents of travel in central america chiapas and yucatan volume two by john lloyd steffens this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by sue anderson at ocosingo we were in the line of travel of captain dupay whose great work on mexican antiquities published in paris in eighteen thirty four thirty five awakened the attention of the learned in europe his expedition to palenque was made in eighteen o seven he reached this place from the city of mexico under a commission from the government attended by a draughtsman and secretary and part of a regiment of dragoons palenque he says is eight days march from ocosingo the journey is very fatiguing the roads if they can be so called are only narrow and difficult paths which wind across mountains and precipices in which it is necessary to follow sometimes on mules sometimes on foot sometimes on the shoulders of indians and sometimes in hammocks in some places it is necessary to pass on bridges or rather trunks of trees badly secured and over lands covered with wood desert and dispeopled and to sleep in the open air excepting a very few villages and huts Quote, we had with us thirty or forty vigorous indians to carry our luggage and hammocks after having experienced in this long and painful journey every kind of fatigue and discomfort we arrived thank god at the village of palenque End quote this was now the journey before us and according to the stages we had arranged to avoid sleeping out at night it was to be made in five instead of eight days the terrible rains of the two preceding nights had infected us with a sort of terror and pauling was completely shaken in his purpose of continuing with us the people of the village told him that after the rains had fairly set in it would be impossible to return 
and in the morning though reluctantly he determined abruptly to leave us and go back we were very unwilling to part with him but under the circumstances could not urge him to continue our luggage and little traps which we had used in common were separated mr catherwood bade him good-bye and rode on but while mounted and in the act of shaking hands to pursue our opposite roads i made him a proposition which induced him again to change his determination at the risk of remaining on the other side of the mountains until the rainy season was over in a few minutes we overtook mr catherwood the fact is we had some apprehensions from the badness of the roads our route lay through an indian country in parts of which the indians bore a notoriously bad character we had no dragoons our party of attendants was very small and in reality we had not a single man upon whom we could rely under which state of things pawling's pistols and double-barreled gun were a matter of some consequence we left ocosingo at a quarter past eight so little impression did any of our attendants make upon me that i have entirely forgotten every one of them indeed this was the case throughout the journey in other countries a greek muleteer an arab boatman or a bedouin guide was a companion here the people had no character and nothing in which we took any interest except their backs each indian carried beside his burden a net bag containing his provisions for the road that is a few tortillas and large balls of mashed indian corn wrapped in leaves a drinking cup being half a calabash he carried sometimes on the crown of his head at every stream he filled his cup with water into which he stirred some of his corn making a sort of cold porridge and this throughout the country is the staff of life for the indian on a journey in half an hour we passed at some distance on our right large mounds formerly structures which form part of the old city at nine o'clock we crossed the rio grande or huacachahul following some distance on the bank and passed three cascades spreading over the rocky bed of the river unique and peculiar in beauty and probably many more of the same character were breaking unnoticed and unknown in the wilderness through which it rolled but turning up a rugged mountain we lost sight of it the road was broken and mountainous we did not meet a single person and at three o'clock moving in a north northwest direction we entered the village of huacachahul standing in an open situation surrounded by mountains and peopled entirely by indians wilder and more savage than any we had yet seen the men were without hats but wore their long black hair reaching to their shoulders and the old men and women with harsh and haggard features and dark rolling eyes had a most unbaptized appearance they gave us no greetings and their wild but steady glare made us feel a little nervous a collection of naked boys and girls called mr catherwood tata mistaking him for a padre we had some misgivings when we put the village behind us and felt ourselves enclosed in the country of wild indians we stopped an hour near a stream and at half past six arrived at chillon where to our surprise and pleasure we found a sub-prefect a white man and intelligent who had travelled to san salvador and knew general morazan he was very anxious to know whether there was any revolution in ciudad real as with a pliancy becoming an office-holder he wished to give in his adhesion to the new government the next morning at a quarter before seven we started with a new set of indians the road was good to yahalon which we reached at ten o'clock before entering it we met a young indian girl with her father of extraordinary beauty of face in the costume of the country 
but with a modest expression of countenance which we all particularly remarked as evidence of her innocence and unconsciousness of anything wrong in her appearance every village we passed was most picturesque in position and here the church was very effective as in the preceding villages it was undergoing repairs here we were obliged to take another set of indians and perhaps we should have lost the day but for the padre who called off some men working at the church at a quarter past eleven we set off again at a quarter before one we stopped at the side of a stream to lunch at this place a young indian overtook us with a very intelligent face who seated himself beside me and said in remarkably good spanish that we must beware of the indians i gave him some tortillas he broke off a small piece and holding it in his fingers looked at me and with great emphasis said he had eaten enough it was of no use to eat he ate all he could get and did not grow fat and thrusting his livid face into mine told me to see how thin he was his face was calm but one accidental expression betrayed him as a maniac and i now noticed in his face and all over his body white spots of leprosy and started away from him i endeavored to persuade him to go back to the village but he said it made no difference whether he went to the village or not he wanted a remedio for his thinness soon after we came upon the banks of the river of yahalon it was excessively hot the river as pure as water could be and we stopped and had a delightful bath after this we commenced ascending a steep mountain and when high up saw the poor crazed young indian standing in the same place on the bank of the river at half past five after a toilsome ascent we reached the top of the mountain and rode along the borders of a table of land several thousand feet high looking down into an immense valley and turning to the left around the corner of the forest entered the outskirts of tumbala the huts were distributed among high rugged and picturesque rocks which had the appearance of having once formed the crater of a volcano drunken indians were lying in the path so that we had to turn out to avoid treading on them riding through a narrow passage between these high rocks we came out upon a corner of the lofty perpendicular table several thousand feet high on which stood the village of tumbala in front were the church and convent the square was filled with wild-looking indians preparing for a fiesta and on the very corner of the immense table was a high conical peak crowned with the ruins of a church altogether it was the wildest and most extraordinary place we had yet seen and though not consecrated by associations for unknown ages it had been the site of an indian village it was one of the circumstances of our journey in this country that every hour and day produced something new we never had any idea of the character of the place we were approaching until we entered it and one surprise followed close upon another on one corner of the table of land stood the cabildo the justicia was the brother of our silver dish friend padre solis as poor and energetic as the padre was rich and inert at the last village we had been told that it would be impossible to procure indians for the next day on account of the fiesta and had made up our minds to remain but my letters from the mexican authorities were so effective that immediately the justicia held a parley with forty or fifty indians and breaking off occasionally to cuff one of them our journey was arranged through to palenque in three days and the money paid and distributed although the wildness of the indians made us feel a little uncomfortable we almost regretted this unexpected promptness 
but the justicia told us that we had come at a fortunate moment for many of the indians of san pedro who were notoriously a bad set were then in the village but he could select those he knew and would send an alguacil of his own with us all the way as he did not give us any encouragement to remain and seemed anxious to hurry us on we made no objections and in our anxiety to reach the end of our journey had a superstitious apprehension of the effect of any voluntary delay with the little of daylight that remained he conducted us along the same path trodden by the indians centuries before to the top of the cone rising at the corner of the table of land from which we looked down on one side into an immense ravine several thousand feet in depth and on the other over the top of a great mountain range we saw the village of san pedro the end of our next day's journey and beyond over the range of the mountains of palenque the lake of terminos and the gulf of mexico it was one of the grandest wildest and most sublime scenes i ever beheld on the top were ruins of a church and tower probably once used as a lookout and near it were thirteen crosses erected over the bodies of indians who a century before tied the hands and feet of the curate and threw him down the precipice and were killed and buried on the spot every year new crosses are set up over their bodies to keep alive in the minds of the indians the fate of murderers all around on almost inaccessible mountain heights and in the deepest ravines the indians have their milpas or corn patches living almost as when the spaniards broke in upon them and the justicia pointed with his finger to a region still occupied by the unbaptized the same strange people whose mysterious origin no man knows and whose destiny no man can foretell among all the wild scenes of our hurried tour none is more strongly impressed upon my mind than this but with the untamed indians around mr catherwood was too much excited and too nervous to attempt to make a sketch of it at dark we returned to the cabildo which was decorated with evergreens for the fiesta and at one end was a table with a figure of the virgin fantastically dressed sitting under an arbor of pine leaves in the evening we visited the padre the delegate of padre solis a gentlemanly young man from ciudad real who was growing as round and bade fair to grow as rich out of this village as padre solis himself he and the justicia were the only white men in the place we returned to the cabildo the indians came in to bid the justicia buenos noches kissed the back of his hand and we were left to ourselves before daylight we were roused by an eruption of indian carriers with lighted torches who while we were still in bed began tying on the covers of our trunks to carry them off at this place the mechanic arts are lower than in any other we had visited there was not a rope of any kind in the village the fastenings of the trunks and the straps to go round the forehead were all of bark strings and here it was customary for those who intended to cross the mountains to take amacas or sillas the former being a cushioned chair with a long pole at each end to be borne by four indians before and behind the traveller sitting with his face to the side and as the justicia told us only used by very heavy men and padres and the latter an armchair to be carried on the back of an indian we had a repugnance to this mode of conveyance considering though unwilling to run any risk that where an indian could climb with one of us on his back we could climb alone and set out without either silla or amaca 
immediately from the village road which was a mere opening through the trees commenced descending and very soon we came to a road of palos or sticks like a staircase so steep that it was dangerous to ride down them but for these sticks in the rainy season the road would be utterly impassable descending constantly at a little after twelve we reached a small stream where the indians washed their sweating bodies from the banks of this river we commenced ascending the steepest mountain i ever knew riding was out of the question and encumbered with sword and spurs and leading our mules which sometimes held back and sometimes sprang upon us the toil was excessive every few minutes we were obliged to stop and lean against a tree or sit down the indians did not speak a word of any language but their own we could hold no communication whatever with them and could not understand how far it was to the top at length we saw up a steep pitch before us a rude cross which we hailed as being the top of the mountain we climbed up to it and after resting a moment mounted our mules but before riding a hundred yards the descent began and immediately we were obliged to dismount the descent was steeper than the ascent in a certain college in our country a chair was transmitted as an heirloom to the laziest man in the senior class one held it by unanimous consent but he was seen running downhill was tried and found guilty but avoided sentence by the frank avowal that a man pushed him and he was too lazy to stop himself so it was with us it was harder work to resist than to give way our mules came tumbling after us and after a most rapid hot and fatiguing descent we reached a stream covered with leaves and insects here two of our indians left us to return that night to tumbala our labor was excessive what must it have been to them though probably accustomed to carry loads from their boyhood they suffered less than we and the freedom of their naked limbs relieved them from the heat and confinement which we suffered from clothes wet with perspiration it was the hottest day we had experienced in the country we had a further violent descent through woods of almost impenetrable thickness and at a quarter before four reached san pedro looking back over the range we had just crossed we saw tumbala and the towering point on which we stood the evening before on a right line only a few miles distant but by the road twenty seven if a bad name could kill a place san pedro was damned from the hacienda of padre solis to tumbala every one we met cautioned us against the indians of san pedro fortunately however nearly the whole village had gone to the feet at tumbala there was no alcalde no alguaciles a few indians were lying about in a state of utter nudity and when we looked into the huts the women ran away probably alarmed at seeing men with pantaloons the cabildo was occupied by a travelling party with cargoes of sugar for tabasco the leaders of the party and owners of the cargoes were two mestizos having servants well armed with whom we formed an acquaintance and tacit alliance one of the best houses was empty the proprietor with his family and household furniture except reed bedsteads fixed in the ground had gone to the fiesta we took possession and piled our luggage inside without giving us any notice our men deserted us to return to tumbala and we were left alone we could not speak the language and could get nothing for the mules or for ourselves to eat 
but through the leader of the sugar party we learned that a new set of men would be forthcoming in the morning to take us on with the heat and fatigue i had a violent headache the mountain for the next day was worse and afraid of the effort and of the danger of breaking down on the road mr c and pauling endeavoured to procure a hamaca or silla which was promised for the morning chapter sixteen a wild country ascent of a mountain ride in a silla a precarious situation the descent rancho of nopa attacks of mosquitoes approach to palenque pasture grounds village of palenque a crusty official a courteous reception scarcity of provisions sunday cholera another countryman the conversion apostasy and recovery of the indians river chacanal the caribs ruins of palenque early the next morning the sugar party started and at five minutes before seven we followed with silla and men altogether our party swelled to twenty indians the country through which we were now travelling was as wild as before the spanish conquest and without a habitation until we reached palenque the road was through a forest so overgrown with brush and underwood as to be impenetrable and the branches were trimmed barely high enough to admit a man's travelling under them on foot so that on the backs of our mules we were constantly obliged to bend our bodies and even to dismount in some places for a great distance around the woods seemed killed by the heat the foliage withered the leaves dry and crisp as if burned by the sun and a tornado had swept the country of which no mention was made in the san pedro papers we met three indians carrying clubs in their hands naked except a small piece of cotton cloth around the loins and passing between their legs one of them young tall and of admirable symmetry of form looking the free-born gentleman of the woods shortly afterward we passed a stream where naked indians were setting rude nets for fish wild and primitive as in the first ages of savage life at twenty minutes past ten we commenced ascending a mountain it was very hot and i can give no idea of the toil of ascending these mountains our mules could barely clamber up with their saddles only we disencumbered ourselves of sword spurs and all useless trappings in fact came down to shirt and pantaloons and as near the condition of the indians as we could our procession would have been a spectacle in broadway first were four indians each with a rough ox-hide box secured by an iron chain and large padlock on his back then juan with only a hat and pair of thin cotton drawers driving two spare mules and carrying a double-barreled gun over his naked shoulders then ourselves each one driving before him or leading his own mule then an indian carrying the silla with relief carriers and several boys bearing small bags of provisions the indians of the silla being much surprised at our not using them according to contract and the price paid though toiling excessively we felt a sense of degradation at being carried on a man's shoulders at that time i was in the worst condition of the three and the night before had gone to bed at san pedro without supper which for any of us was sure evidence of being in a bad way we had brought the sea with us merely as a measure of precaution with much expectation of being obliged to use it but at a steep pitch which made my head almost burst to think of climbing i resorted to it for the first time it was a large clumsy armchair put together with wooden pins and bark strings the indian who was to carry me like the others was small not more than five feet seven 
very thin but symmetrically formed a bark strap was tied to the arms of the chair and sitting down he placed his back against the back of the chair adjusted the length of the strings and smoothed the bark across his forehead with a little cushion to relieve the pressure an indian on each side lifted it up and the carrier rose on his feet stood still a moment threw me up once or twice to adjust me on his shoulders and set off with one man on each side it was a great relief but i could feel every movement even to the heaving of his chest the ascent was one of the steepest on the whole road in a few minutes he stopped and sent forth a sound usual with indian carriers between a whistle and a blow always painful to my ears but which i never felt so disagreeably before my face was turned backward i could not see where he was going but observed that the indian on the left fell back not to increase the labor of carrying me i sat as still as possible but in a few minutes looking over my shoulder saw that we were approaching the edge of a precipice more than a thousand feet deep here i became very anxious to dismount but i could not speak intelligibly and the indians could or would not understand my signs my carrier moved along carefully with his left foot first feeling that the stone on which he put it down was steady and secure before he brought up the other and by degrees after a particularly careful movement brought both his feet up within half a step of the edge of the precipice stopped and gave a fearful whistle and blow i rose and fell with every breath felt his body trembling under me and his knees seemed giving way the precipice was awful and the slightest irregular movement on my part might bring us both down together i would have given him a release in full for the rest of the journey to be off his back but he started again and with the same care ascended several steps so close to the edge that even on the back of a mule it would have been very uncomfortable my fear lest he should break down or stumble was excessive to my extreme relief the path turned away but i had hardly congratulated myself upon my escape before he descended a few steps this was much worse than ascending if he fell nothing could keep me from going over his head but i remained till he put me down of his own accord the poor fellow was wet with perspiration and trembled in every limb another stood ready to take me up but i had had enough pauling tried it but only for a short time it was bad enough to see an indian toiling with a dead weight on his back but to feel him trembling under one's own body hear his hard breathing see the sweat rolling down him and feel the insecurity of the position made this a mode of travelling which nothing but constitutional laziness and insensibility could endure walking or rather climbing stopping very often to rest and riding when it was at all practicable we reached a thatched shed where we wished to stop for the night but there was no water we could not understand how far it was to nopa our intended stopping place which we supposed to be on the top of the mountain to every question the indians answered una legua thinking it could not be much higher we continued for an hour more we had a very steep ascent and then commenced a terrible descent at this time the sun had disappeared dark clouds overhung the woods and thunder rolled heavily on the top of the mountain as we descended a heavy wind swept through the forest the air was filled with dry leaves branches were snapped and broken trees bent and there was every appearance of a violent tornado 
to hurry down on foot was out of the question we were so tired that it was impossible and afraid of being caught on the mountain by a hurricane and deluge of rain we spurred down as fast as we could go it was a continued descent without any relief stony and very steep very often the mules stopped afraid to go on and in one place the two empty mules bolted into the thick woods rather than proceed fortunately for the reader this is our last mountain and i can end honestly with a climax it was the worst mountain i ever encountered in that or any other country and under our apprehension of the storm i will venture to say that no travellers ever descended in less time at a quarter before five we reached the plain the mountain was hidden by clouds and the storm was now raging above us we crossed a river and continuing along it through a thick forest reached the rancho of nopa End of section eighteen Section 19 of Incidents of Travel in Central America, Chiapas and Yucatan, Volume 2, by John Lloyd Steffens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sue Anderson. It was situated in a circular clearing about 100 feet in diameter, near the river, with the forest around so thick with brush and underwood that the mules could not penetrate it and with no opening but for the passage of the road through it the rancho was merely a pitched roof covered with palm leaves and supported by four trunks of trees all around were heaps of snail shells and the ground of the rancho was several inches deep with ashes the remains of fires for cooking them we had hardly congratulated ourselves upon our arrival at such a beautiful spot before we suffered such an onslaught of mosquitoes as we had not before experienced in the country we made a fire and with appetites sharpened by a hard day's work sat down on the grass to dispose of a san pedro fowl but we were obliged to get up and while one hand was occupied with eatables use the other to brush off the venomous insects we soon saw that we had bad prospects for the night lighted fires all around the rancho and smoked inordinately we were in no hurry to lie down and sat till a late hour consoling ourselves with the reflection that but for the mosquitoes our satisfaction would be beyond all bounds the dark border of the clearing was lighted up by fireflies of extraordinary size and brilliancy darting among the trees not flashing and disappearing but carrying a steady light and except that their course was serpentine seeming like shooting stars in different places there were two that remained stationary emitting a pale but beautiful light and seemed like rival bells holding levees the fiery orbs darted from one to the other and when one more daring than the rest approached too near the coquette withdrew her light and the flutterer went off one however carried all before her and at one time we counted seven hovering around her at length we prepared for sleep hammocks would leave us exposed on every side to the merciless attacks of the mosquitoes and we spread our mats on the ground we did not undress pauling with a great deal of trouble rigged his sheets into a mosquito net but it was so hot that he could not breathe under them and he roamed about or was in the river nearly all night the indians had occupied themselves in catching snails and cooking them for supper and then lay down to sleep on the banks of the river but at midnight with sharp thunder and lightning the rain broke in a deluge and they all came under the shed 
and there they lay perfectly naked mechanically and without seeming to disturb themselves slapping their bodies with their hands the incessant hum and bite of the insects kept us in a constant state of wakefulness and irritation our bodies we could protect but with a covering over the face the heat was insufferable before daylight i walked to the river which was broad and shallow and stretched myself out on the gravelly bottom where the water was barely deep enough to run over my body it was the first comfortable moment i had had my heated body became cooled and i lay till daylight when i rose to dress they came upon me with appetites whetted by a spirit of vengeance our day's work had been tremendously hard but the night's was worse the morning air however was refreshing and as day dawned our tormentors disappeared mr catherwood had suffered least but in his restlessness he had lost from his finger a precious emerald ring which he had worn for many years and prized for associations we remained some time looking for it and at length mounted and made our last start for palenque the road was level but the woods were still as thick as on the mountain at a quarter before eleven we reached a path which led to the ruins or somewhere else we had abandoned the intention of going directly to the ruins for besides that we were in a shattered condition we could not communicate at all with our indians and probably they did not know where the ruins were at length we came out upon an open plain and looked back at the range we had crossed running off to peten and the country of unbaptized indians as we advanced we came into a region of fine pasture grounds and saw herds of cattle the grass showed the effects of early rains and the picturesque appearance of the country reminded me of many a scene at home but there was a tree of singular beauty that was a stranger having a high naked trunk and spreading top with leaves of vivid green covered with yellow flowers continuing carelessly and stopping from time to time to enjoy the smiling view around and realize our escape from the dark mountains behind we rose upon a slight table of land and saw the village before us consisting of one grass-grown street unbroken even by a mule path with a few straggling white houses on each side on a slight elevation at the further end a thatched church with a rude cross and belfry before it a boy could roll on the grass from the church door out of the village in fact it was the most dead and alive place i ever saw but coming from villages thronged with wild indians its air of repose was most grateful to us in the suburbs were scattered indian huts and as we rode into the street eight or ten white people men and women came out more than we had seen since we left comitan and the houses had a comfortable and respectable appearance in one of them lived the alcalde a white man about sixty dressed in white cotton drawers and shirt outside respectable in his appearance with a stoop in his shoulders but the expression of his face was very doubtful with what i intended as a most captivating manner i offered him my passport but we had disturbed him at his siesta he had risen wrong side first and looking me steadily in the face he asked me what he had to do with my passport this i could not answer and he went on to say that he had nothing to do with it and did not want to have we must go to the prefeto then he turned round two or three times in a circle to show he did not care what we thought of him and as if conscious of what was passing in our minds volunteered to add that complaints had been made against him before but it was of no use 
they couldn't remove him and if they did he did not care this greeting at the end of our severe journey was rather discouraging but it was important for us not to have any difficulty with this crusty official and endeavoring to hit a vulnerable point told him that we wished to stop a few days to rest and should be obliged to purchase many things we asked him if there was any bread in the village he answered no i there is none corn no i coffee no i chocolate no i his satisfaction seemed to increase as he was still able to answer no i but our unfortunate inquiries for bread roused his ire innocently and without intending any offence we betrayed our disappointment and juan looking out for himself said that we could not eat tortillas this he recurred to repeated several times to himself and to every newcomer said with peculiar emphasis they can't eat tortillas following it up he said there was an oven in the place but no flour and the baker went away seven years before the people there could do without bread to change the subject and determined not to complain i threw out the conciliatory remark that in all events we were glad to escape from the rain on the mountains which he answered by asking if we expected anything better in palenque and he repeated with great satisfaction an expression common in the mouths of palenquians tres meses de agua tres meses aguacero y tres meses del norte three months rains three months heavy showers and six months north wind which in that country brings cold and rain finding it impossible to hit a weak point while the men were piling up the luggage i rode to the prefeto whose reception at that critical moment was most cheering and reviving with habitual courtesy he offered me a chair and a cigar and as soon as he saw my passport said he had been expecting me for some time this surprised me and he added that don patricio had told him i was coming which surprised me still more as i did not remember any friend of that name but soon learned that this imposing cognomen meant my friend mr patrick walker of belize this was the first notice of mr walker and captain caddy i had received since lieutenant nichols brought to guatemala the report that they had been speared by the indians they had reached palenque by the balize river and lake of peten without any other difficulties than from the badness of the roads had remained two weeks at the ruins and left for the laguna and yucatan this was most gratifying intelligence first as it assured me of their safety and second as i gathered from it that there would be no impediment to our visiting the ruins the apprehension of being met at the end of our toilsome journey with a peremptory exclusion had constantly disturbed us more or less and sometimes weighed upon us like lead we had determined to make no reference to the ruins until we had an opportunity of ascertaining our ground and up to that moment i did not know but that all our labor was bootless to heighten my satisfaction the prefeto said that the place was perfectly quiet it was in a retired nook which revolutions and political convulsions never reached he had held his office twenty years acknowledging as many different governments i returned to make my report and in regard to the old alcalde in the language of a ward meeting manifesto determined to ask for nothing but what was right and to submit to nothing that was wrong in this spirit we made a bold stand for some corn the alcalde's no eye was but too true the corn crop had failed and there was an actual famine in the place the indians with accustomed improvidence had planted barely enough for the season and this turning out bad 
they were reduced to fruits plantains and roots instead of tortillas each white family had about enough for its own use but none to spare the shortness of the corn crop made everything else scarce as they were obliged to kill their fowls and pigs from want of anything to feed them with the alcalde who with his other offences added that of being rich was the only man in the place who had any to spare and he was holding on for greater pressure at tumbala we had bought good corn at thirty ears for sixpence here with great difficulty we prevailed upon the alcalde to spare us a little at eight ears for a shilling and these were so musty and worm-eaten that the mules would hardly touch them at first it surprised us that some enterprising capitalist did not import several dollars worth from tumbala but on going deeper into the matter we found that the cost of transportation would not leave much profit and besides the course of exchange was against palenque a few backloads would overstock the market for as every white family was provided until the next crop came in the indians were the only persons who wished to purchase and they had no money to buy with the brunt of the famine fell upon us and particularly upon our poor mules fortunately however there was good pasture and not far off we slipped the bridles at the door and turned them loose in the streets but after making the circuit they came back in a body and poked their heads in at the door with an imploring look for corn our prospects were not very brilliant nevertheless we had reached palenque and toward evening storms came on with terrific thunder and lightning which made us feel but too happy that our journey was over the house assigned to us by the alcalde was next his own and belonged to himself it had a cucinera adjoining and two indian women who did not dare look at us without permission from the alcalde it had an earthen floor three beds made of reeds and a thatched roof very good except that over two of the beds it leaked under the peaked roof and across the top of the mud walls there was a floor made of poles serving as a granary for the alcalde's mouldy corn inhabited by industrious mice which scratched nibbled squeaked and sprinkled dust upon us all night nevertheless we had reached palenque and slept well the next day was sunday and we hailed it as a day of rest heretofore in all my travels i had endeavored to keep it as such but in this country i had found it impossible the place was so tranquil and seemed in such a state of repose that as the old alcalde passed the door we ventured to wish him a good morning but again he had got up wrong and without answering our greeting stopped to tell us that our mules were missing and as this did not disturb us sufficiently he added that they were probably stolen but when he had got us fairly roused and on the point of setting off to look for them he said there was no danger they had only gone for water and would return of themselves the village of palenque as we learned from the prefeto was once a place of considerable importance all the goods imported for guatemala passed through it but belize had diverted that trade and destroyed its commerce and but a few years before more than half the population had been swept off by the cholera whole families had perished and their houses were desolate and falling to ruins the church stood at the head of the street in the centre of a grassy square on each side of the square were houses with the forest directly upon them and being a little elevated in the plaza we were on a line with the tops of the trees the largest house on the square was deserted and in ruins there were a dozen other houses occupied by white families with whom in the course of an hour's stroll i became acquainted 
it was but to stop before the door and i received an invitation pase adelante walk in captain for which title i was indebted to the eagle on my hat each family had its hacienda in the neighborhood and in the course of an hour i knew all that was going on in palenque that is i knew that nothing was going on at the upper end of the square commanding this scene of quiet was the house of an american named william brown it was a strange place for the abode of an american and mr brown was a regular go-ahead american in the great lottery he had drawn a palenquian wife which in that quiet place probably saved him from dying of ennui what first took him to the country i do not know but he had an exclusive privilege to navigate the tabasco river by steam and would have made a fortune but his steamboat foundered on the second trip he then took to cutting logwood on a new plan and came very near making another fortune but something went wrong at the time of our visit he was engaged in canaling a short cut to the sea to connect two rivers near his hacienda to the astonishment of the palenquians he was always busy when he might live quietly on his hacienda in the summer and pass his winters in the village very much to our regret he was not then in the village it would have been interesting to meet a countryman of his stamp in that quiet corner of the world the prefeto was well versed in the history of palenque it is in the province of sendales and for a century after the conquest of chiapas it remained in possession of the indians two centuries ago lorenzo mugil an emissary direct from rome set up among them the standard of the cross the indians still preserve his dress as a sacred relic but they are jealous of showing it to strangers and i could not obtain a sight of it the bell of the church too was sent from the holy city the indians submitted to the dominion of the spaniards until the year seventeen hundred when the whole province revolted and in chion tumbala and palenque they apostatized from christianity murdered the priests profaned the churches paid impious adoration to an indian female massacred the white men and took the women for their wives but as soon as the intelligence reached guatemala a strong force was sent against them the revolted towns were reduced and recovered to the catholic faith and tranquillity was restored the right of the indians however to the ownership of the soil was still recognized and down to the time of the mexican independence they received rent for land in the villages and the milpas in the neighborhood a short distance from palenque the river chacamal separates it from the country of the unbaptized indians who are here called caribs fifty years ago the padre calderon an uncle of the prefeto's wife attended by his sacristan an indian was bathing in the river when the latter cried out in alarm that some caribs were looking at them and attempted to fly but the padre took his cane and went toward them the caribs fell down before him conducted him to their huts and gave him an invitation to return and make them a visit on a certain day on the day appointed the padre went with his sacristan and found a gathering of caribs and a great feast prepared for him he remained with them some time and invited them in return to the village of palenque on the day of the feat of san domingo a large party of these wild indians attended bringing with them tiger's meat monkey's meat and cocoa as presents they listened to mass and beheld all the ceremonies of the church whereupon they invited the padre to come among them and teach them and they erected a hut at the place where they had first met him which he consecrated as a church and he taught his sacristan to say mass to them every sunday as the prefeto said if he had lived many of them would probably have been christianized 
but unfortunately he died the caribs retired into the wilderness and not one had appeared in the village since the ruins lie about eight miles from the village perfectly desolate the road was so bad that in order to accomplish anything it was necessary to remain there and we had to make provision for that purpose there were three small shops in the village the stock of all together not worth seventy five dollars but in one of them we found a pound and a half of coffee which we immediately secured juan communicated the gratifying intelligence that a hog was to be killed the next morning and that he had engaged a portion of the lard also that there was a cow with a calf running loose and an arrangement might be made for keeping her up and milking her this was promptly attended to and all necessary arrangements were made for visiting the ruins the next day the indians generally knew the road but there was only one man in the place who was able to serve as a guide on the ground and he had on hand the business of killing and distributing the hog by reason whereof he could not set out with us but promised to follow toward evening the quiet of the village was disturbed by a crash and on going out we found that a house had fallen down a cloud of dust rose from it and the ruins probably lie as they fell the cholera had stripped it of tenants and for several years it had been deserted chapter seventeen preparations for visiting the ruins a turnout departure the road rivers mccol and otula arrival at the ruins the palace the faux de joie quarters in the palace inscriptions by former visitors the fate of benham discovery of the ruins of palenque visit of del rio expedition of dupe drawings of the present work first dinner at the ruins mammoth fireflies sleeping apartments extent of the ruins obstacles to exploration suffering from mosquitoes early the next morning we prepared for our move to the ruins we had to make provision for housekeeping on a large scale our culinary utensils were of rude pottery and our cups the hard shells of some round vegetables the whole cost perhaps amounting to one dollar we could not procure a water jar in the place but the alcalde lent us one free of charge unless it should be broken and as it was cracked at the time he probably considered it sold by the way we forced ourselves upon the alcalde's affections by leaving our money with him for safe keeping we did this with great publicity in order that it might be known in the village that there was no plata at the ruins but the alcalde regarded it as a mark of special confidence indeed we could not have shown him a greater he was a suspicious old miser kept his own money in a trunk in an inner room and never left the house without locking the street door and carrying the key with him he made us pay beforehand for everything we wanted and would not have trusted us half a dollar on any account it was necessary to take with us from the village all that could contribute to our comfort and we tried hard to get a woman but no one would trust herself alone with us this was a great privation a woman was desirable not as the reader may suppose for embellishment but to make tortillas these to be tolerable must be eaten the moment they are baked but we were obliged to make an arrangement with the alcalde to send them out daily with the product of our cow our turnout was equal to anything we had had on the road one indian set off with a cowhide trunk on his back supported by a bark string as the groundwork of his load while on each side hung by a bark string a fowl wrapped in plantain leaves the head and tail only being visible another had on the top of his trunk a live turkey 
with its legs tied and wings expanded like a spread eagle another had on each side of his load strings of eggs each egg being wrapped carefully in a husk of corn and all fastened like onions on a bark string cooking utensils and water jar were mounted on the backs of other indians and contained rice beans sugar chocolate etc strings of pork and bunches of plantains were pendant and juan carried in his arms our travelling tin coffee canister filled with lard which in that country was always in a liquid state at half past seven we left the village for a short distance the road was open but very soon we entered a forest which continued unbroken to the ruins and probably many miles beyond the road was a mere indian footpath the branches of the trees beaten down and heavy with the rain hanging so low that we were obliged to stoop constantly and very soon our hats and coats were perfectly wet from the thickness of the foliage the morning sun could not dry up the deluge of the night before the ground was very muddy broken by streams swollen by the early rains with gullies in which the mules floundered and stuck fast in some places very difficult to cross amid all the wreck of empires nothing ever spoke so forcibly the world's mutations as this immense forest shrouding what was once a great city once it had been a great highway thronged with people who were stimulated by the same passions that give impulse to human action now and they are all gone their habitations buried and no traces of them left in two hours we reached the river mccole and in half an hour more that of otula darkened by the shade of the woods and breaking beautifully over a stony bed fording this very soon we saw masses of stones and then a round sculptured stone we spurred up a sharp ascent of fragments so steep that the mules could barely climb it to a terrace so covered like the whole road with trees that it was impossible to make out the form continuing on this terrace we stopped at the foot of a second when our indians cried out el palacio the palace and through openings in the trees we saw the front of a large building richly ornamented with stuccoed figures on the pilasters curious and elegant trees growing close against it and their branches entering the doors in style and effect unique extraordinary and mournfully beautiful we tied our mules to the trees ascended a flight of stone steps forced apart and thrown down by trees and entered the palace ranged for a few moments along the corridor and into the courtyard and after the first gaze of eager curiosity was over went back to the entrance and standing in the doorway fired a feu de joie of four rounds each being the last charge of our firearms but for this way of giving vent to our satisfaction we should have made the roof of the old palace ring with a hurrah it was intended too for effect upon the indians who had probably never heard such a cannonade before and almost like their ancestors in the time of cortez regarded our weapons as instruments which spit lightning and who we knew would make such a report in the village as would keep any of their respectable friends from paying us a visit at night end of section nineteen Section 20 of Incidents of Travel in Central America, Chiapas and Yucatan, Volume 2, by John Lloyd Steffens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sue Anderson. We had reached the end of our long and toilsome journey, and the first glance indemnified us for our toil. For the first time, 
we were in a building erected by the aboriginal inhabitants standing before the europeans knew of the existence of this continent and we prepared to take up our abode under its roof we selected the front corridor as our dwelling turned turkey and fowls loose in the courtyard which was so overgrown with trees that we could barely see across it and as there was no pasture for the mules except the leaves of the trees and we could not turn them loose into the woods we brought them up the steps through the palace and turned them into the courtyard also at one end of the corridor juan built a kitchen which operation consisted in laying three stones angle-wise so as to have room for a fire between them our luggage was stowed away or hung on poles reaching across the corridor pauline mounted a stone about four feet long on stone legs for a table and with the indians cut a number of poles which they fastened together with bark strings and laid them on stones at the head and foot for beds we cut down the branches that entered the palace and some of the trees on the terrace and from the floor of the palace overlooked the top of an immense forest stretching off to the gulf of mexico the indians had superstitious fears about remaining at night among the ruins and left us alone the sole tenants of the palace of unknown kings little did they who built it think that in a few years their royal line would perish and their race be extinct their city a ruin and mr catherwood pauline and i and juan its sole tenants other strangers had been there wandering like ourselves their names were written on the walls with comments and figures and even here were marks of those low grovelling spirits which delight in profaning holy places among the names but not of the latter class were those of acquaintances captain caddy and mr walker and one was that of a countryman noah o platt new york he had gone out to tobasco as supercargo of a vessel ascended one of the rivers for logwood and while his vessel was loading visited the ruins his account of them had given me a strong desire to visit them long before the opportunity of doing so presented itself high up on one side of the corridor was the name of william beenham and under it was a stanza written in lead pencil by means of a tree with notches cut in it i climbed up and read the lines the rhyme was faulty and the spelling bad but they breathed a deep sense of the moral sublimity pervading these unknown ruins the author seemed too an acquaintance i had heard his story in the village he was a young irishman sent by a merchant of tobasco into the interior for purposes of small traffic had passed some time at palenque and in the neighborhood and with his thoughts and feelings turned strongly toward the indians after dwelling upon the subject for some time resolved to penetrate into the country of the caribs his friends endeavored to dissuade him and the prefect told him you have red hair a florid complexion and white skin and they will either make a god of you and keep you among them or else kill and eat you but he set off alone and on foot crossed the river chacamal and after an absence of nearly a year returned safe but naked and emaciated with his hair and nails long having been eight days with a single carob on the banks of a wild river searching for a crossing place and living upon roots and herbs he built a hut on the borders of the chacamal river and lived there with a carob servant preparing for another and more protracted journey among them until at length some boatmen who came to trade with him found him lying in his hammock dead with his skull split open he had escaped the dangers of a journey which no man in that country dared encounter to die by the hands of an assassin in a moment of fancied security his arm was hanging outside 
and a book lying on the ground probably he was struck while reading the murderers one of whom was his servant were caught and were then in prison in tobasco unfortunately the people of palenque had taken but little interest in anything except the extraordinary fact of his visit among the caribs and his return safe all his papers and collection of curiosities were scattered and destroyed and with him died all the fruits of his labors but were he still living he would be the man of all others to accomplish the discovery of that mysterious city which had so affected our imaginations as the ruins of palenque are the first which awakened attention to the existence of ancient and unknown cities in america and as on that account they are perhaps more interesting to the public it may not be amiss to state the circumstances of their first discovery the account is that in the year seventeen fifty a party of spaniards travelling in the interior of mexico penetrated to the lands north of the district of carmen in the province of chiapas when all at once they found in the midst of a vast solitude ancient stone buildings the remains of a city still embracing from eighteen to twenty-four miles in extent known to the indians by the name of casas de piedras from my knowledge of the country i am at a loss to conjecture why a party of spaniards were travelling in that forest or how they could have done so i am inclined to believe rather that the existence of the ruins was discovered by the indians who had clearings in different parts of the forest for their cornfields or perhaps was known to them from time immemorial and on their report the inhabitants were induced to visit them the existence of such a city was entirely unknown there is no mention of it in any book and no tradition that it had ever been to this day it is not known by what name it was called and the only appellation given to it is that of palenque after the village near which the ruins stand the news of the discovery passed from mouth to mouth was repeated in some cities of the province and reached the seat of government but little attention was paid to it and the members of the government through ignorance apathy or the actual impossibility of occupying themselves with anything except public affairs took no measure to explore the ruins and it was not till seventeen eighty six thirty years subsequent to the discovery that the king of spain ordered an exploration on the third of may seventeen eighty seven captain antonio del rio arrived in the village under a commission from the government of guatemala and on the fifth he proceeded to the site of the ruined city in his official report he says on making his first essay owing to the thickness of the woods and a fog so dense that it was impossible for the men to distinguish each other at five paces distance the principal building was completely concealed from their view he returned to the village and after concerting measures with the deputy of the district an order was issued to the inhabitants of tumbala requiring two hundred indians with axes and bill-hooks on the seventeenth seventy-nine arrived furnished with twenty-eight axes after which twenty more were obtained in the village and with these he again moved forward and immediately commenced felling trees which was followed by a general conflagration the report of captain del rio with the commentary of dr powell felix cabrera of new guatemala deducing an egyptian origin for the people through either the supineness or the jealousy of the spanish government was locked up in the archives of guatemala until the time of the revolution when by the operation of liberal principles the original manuscripts came into the hands of an english gentleman long resident in that country and an english translation was published at london in eighteen twenty two 
this was the first notice in europe of the discovery of these ruins and instead of electrifying the public mind either from want of interest in the subject distrust or some other cause so little notice was taken of it that in eighteen thirty one the literary gazette a paper of great circulation in london announced it as a new discovery made by colonel galindo whose unfortunate fate has been before referred to if a like discovery had been made in italy greece egypt or asia within the reach of european travel it would have created an interest not inferior to the discovery of herculaneum or pompeii or the ruins of paestum while the report and drawings of del rio slept in the archives of guatemala charles the fourth of spain ordered another expedition at the head of which was placed captain dupay with a secretary and draughtsman and a detachment of dragoons his expeditions were made in eighteen o five eighteen o six and eighteen o seven the last of which was to palenque the manuscripts of dupay and the designs of his draughtsman castaneda were about to be sent to madrid which was then occupied by the french army when the revolution broke out in mexico they then became an object of secondary importance and remained during the wars of independence under the control of castaneda who deposited them in the cabinet of natural history in mexico in eighteen twenty eight monsieur varader disentombed them from the cartons of the museum where but for this accident they might still have remained and the knowledge of the existence of this city again been lost the mexican congress had passed a law forbidding any stranger not formally authorized to make researches or to remove objects of art from the country but in spite of this interdict m baradere obtained authority to make researches in the interior of the republic with the agreement that after sending to mexico all that he collected half should be delivered to him with permission to transport them to europe afterward he obtained by exchange the original designs of castaneda and an authentic copy of the itinerary and descriptions of captain dupay was promised in three months from diverse circumstances that copy did not reach m baradere till long after his return to europe and the work of dupay was not published until eighteen thirty four thirty five twenty-eight years after his expedition when it was brought out in paris in four volumes folio at the price of eight hundred francs with notes and commentaries by m alexander lenore m warden m charles farcy m baradere and m st priest lord kingsborough's ponderous tomes so far as regards palenque are a mere reprint of dupay and the cost of his work is four hundred dollars per copy colonel galindo's communications to the geographical society of paris are published in the work of dupay and since him mr waldeck with funds provided by an association in mexico had passed two years among the ruins his drawings as he states in a work on another place were taken away by the mexican government but he had retained copies and before we set out his work on palenque was announced in paris it however has never appeared and in the meantime dupay's is the textbook i have two objections to make to this work not affecting captain dupay who as his expedition took place thirty-four years since is not likely to be affected if he is even living but his paris editors the first is the very deprecating tone in which mention is made of the work of his predecessor del rio and secondly this paragraph in the introduction quote, it must be considered that a government only can execute such undertakings 
a traveller relying upon his own resources cannot hope whatever may be his intrepidity to penetrate and above all to live in those dangerous solitudes and supposing that he succeeds it is beyond the power of the most learned and skilful man to explore alone the ruins of a vast city of which he must not only measure and draw the edifices still existing but also determine the circumference and examine the remains dig the soil and explore the subterraneous constructions m baradere arrived within fifty leagues of palenque burning with the desire of going there but what could a single man do with domestics or other auxiliaries without moral force or intelligence against a people still half savage against serpents and other hurtful animals which according to dupe infest these ruins and also against the vegetative force of a nature fertile and powerful which in a few years recovers all the monuments and obstructs all the avenues the effect of this is to crush all individual enterprise and moreover it is untrue all the accounts founded upon this represent a visit to these ruins as attended with immense difficulty and danger to such an extent that we feared to encounter them but there is no difficulty whatever in going from europe or the united states to palenque our greatest hardships even in our long journey through the interior were from the revolutionary state of the countries and want of time and as to a residence there with time to construct a hut or to fit up an apartment in the palace and to procure stores from the seaboard those quotes, dangerous solitudes might be anything rather than unpleasant and to show what individuals can accomplish i state that mr catherwood's drawings include all the objects represented in the work of dupe and others besides which do not appear in that work at all and have never before been presented to the public among which are the frontispiece of this volume and the large tablets of hieroglyphics the most curious and interesting pieces of sculpture at palenque i add with the full knowledge that i will be contradicted by future travellers if i am wrong that the whole of mr c s are more correct in proportions outline and filling up than his and furnish more true material for speculation and study i would not have said thus much but from a wish to give confidence to the reader who may be disposed to investigate and study these interesting remains as to most of the places visited by us he will find no materials whatever except those furnished in these pages in regard to palenque he will find a splendid work the materials of which were procured under the sanction of a commission from government and brought out with explanations and commentaries by the learned men of paris by the side of which my two octavos shrink into insignificance but i uphold the drawings against these costly folios and against every other book that has ever been published on the subject of these ruins my object has been not to produce an illustrated work but to present the drawings in such an inexpensive form as to place them within reach of the great mass of our reading community but to return to ourselves in the palace while we were making our observations juan was engaged in a business that his soul loved as with all the mozos of that country it was his pride and ambition to servir a mano he scorned the manly occupation of muleteer and aspired to that of a menial servant he was anxious to be left at the village and did not like the idea of stopping at the ruins but was reconciled to it by being allowed to devote himself exclusively to cookery 
at four o'clock we sat down to our first dinner the tablecloth was two broad leaves each about two feet long plucked from a tree on the terrace before the door our salt cellar stood like a pyramid being a case made of husks of corn put together lengthwise and holding four or five pounds in lumps from the size of a pea to that of a hen's egg juan was as happy as if he had prepared the dinner exclusively for his own eating and all went merry as a marriage bell when the sky became overcast and a sharp thunderclap heralded the afternoon storm from the elevation of the terrace the floor of the palace commanded a view of the top of the forest and we could see the trees bent down by the force of the wind very soon a fierce blast swept through the open doors which was followed instantaneously by heavy rain the table was cleared by the wind and before we could make our escape was drenched by the rain we snatched away our plates and finished our meal as we could the rain continued with heavy thunder and lightning all the afternoon in the absolute necessity of taking up our abode among the ruins we had hardly thought of our exposure to the elements until it was forced upon us at night we could not light a candle but the darkness of the palace was lighted up by fireflies of extraordinary size and brilliancy shooting through the corridors and stationary on the walls forming a beautiful and striking spectacle they were of the description with those we saw at nopa known by the name of shining beetles and are mentioned by the early spaniards among the wonders of a world where all was new as quotes, showing the way to those who travel at night the historian describes them as quotes, somewhat smaller than sparrows having two stars close by their eyes and two more under their wings which gave so great a light that by it they could spin weave write and paint and the spaniards went by night to hunt the utios or little rabbits of that country and of fishing carrying these animals tied to their great toes or thumbs and they called them locuyos being also of use to save them from the gnats which are there very troublesome they took them in the night with firebrands because they made to the light and came when called by their name and they are so unwieldy that when they fall they cannot rise again and the men stroking their faces and hands with a sort of moisture that is in those stars seem to be a fire as long as it lasted End quote. it always gave us high pleasure to realize the romantic and seemingly half fabulous accounts of the chroniclers of the conquest very often we found their quaint descriptions so vivid and faithful as to infuse the spirit that breathed through their pages we caught several of these beetles not however by calling them by their names but with a hat as schoolboys used to catch fireflies or less poetically lightning bugs at home they are more than half an inch long and have a sharp movable horn on the head when laid on the back they cannot turn over except by pressing this horn against a membrane upon the front behind the eyes are two round transparent substances full of luminous matter about as large as the head of a pin and underneath is a larger membrane containing the same luminous substance four of them together threw a brilliant light for several yards around and by the light of a single one we read distinctly the finely printed pages of an american newspaper it was one of a packet full of debates in congress which i had yet barely glanced over and it seemed stranger than any incident of my journey to be reading by the light of beetles in the ruined palace of palenque the sayings and doings of great men at home in the midst of it mr catherwood in emptying the capacious pocket of a shooting jacket handed me a broadway omnibus ticket good to the bearer for a ride 
a brower these things brought up vivid recollections of home and among the familiar images present were the good beds into which our friends were about that time turning ours were set up in the back corridor fronting the courtyard this corridor consisted of open doors and pilasters alternately the wind and rain were sweeping through and unfortunately our beds were not out of reach of the spray they had been set up with some labor on four piles of stones each and we could not then change their position we had no spare articles to put up as screens but happily two umbrellas tied up with measuring rods and wrapped in a piece of matting had survived the wreck of the mountain roads these mr c and i secured at the head of our beds pauling swung a hammock across the corridor so high that the sweep of the rain only touched the foot and so passed our first night at palenque in the morning umbrellas bedclothes wearing apparel and hammocks were wet through and there was not a dry place to stand on already we considered ourselves booked for a rheumatism we had looked to our residence at palenque as the end of troubles and for comfort and pleasure but all we could do was to change the location of our beds to places which promised a better shelter for the next night a good breakfast would have done much to restore our equanimity but unhappily we found that the tortillas which we had brought out the day before probably made of half mouldy corn by the excessive dampness were matted together sour and spoiled we went through our beans eggs and chocolate without any substitute for bread and as often before in time of trouble composed ourselves with a cigar blessed be the man who invented smoking the soother and composer of a troubled spirit a layer of angry passions a comfort under the loss of breakfast and to the roamer in desolate places the solitary wayfarer through life serving for wife children and friends at about ten o'clock the indians arrived with fresh tortillas and milk our guide too having finished cutting up and distributing the hog was among them he was the same who had been employed by mr waldeck and also by mr walker and captain caddy and was recommended by the prefect as the only man acquainted with the ruins under his escort we set out for a preliminary survey of ourselves leaving the palace in any direction we should not have known which way to direct our steps in regard to the extent of these ruins even in this practical age the imagination of man delights in wonders the indians and the people of palenque say that they cover a space of sixty miles in a series of well-written articles in our own country they have been set down as ten times larger than new york and lately i have seen an article in some of the newspapers referring to our expedition which represents this city quotes discovered by us as having been three times as large as london it is not in my nature to discredit any marvellous story i am slow to disbelieve and would rather sustain all such inventions but it has been my unhappy lot to find marvels fade away as i approach them even the dead sea lost its mysterious charm and besides as a traveller and writer of a book i know that if i go wrong those who come after me will not fail to set me right under these considerations not from any wish of my own and with many thanks to my friends of the press i am obliged to say that the indians and people of palenque really know nothing of the ruins personally and the other accounts do not rest upon any sufficient foundation the whole country for miles around is covered by a dense forest of gigantic trees 
with a growth of brush and underwood unknown in the wooded deserts of our own country and impenetrable in any direction except by cutting away with a machete what lies buried in that forest it is impossible to say of my own knowledge without a guide we might have gone within a hundred feet of all the buildings without discovering one of them captain del rio the first explorer with men and means at command states in his report that in the execution of his commission he cut down and burned all the woods he does not say how far but judging from the breaches and excavations made in the interior of the buildings probably for miles around captain dupay acting under a royal commission and with all the resources such a commission would give did not discover any more buildings than those mentioned by del rio and we saw only the same but having the benefit of them as guides at least of del rio for at that time we had not seen dupay's work we of course saw things which escaped their observation just as those who come after us will see what escaped ours this place however was the principal object of our expedition and it was our wish and intention to make a thorough exploration respect for my official character the special tenor of my passport and letters from mexican authorities gave me every facility the prefect assumed that i was sent by my government expressly to explore the ruins and every person in palenque except our friend the alcalde and even he as much as the perversity of his disposition would permit was disposed to assist us but there were accidental difficulties which were insuperable first it was the rainy season this under any circumstances would have made it difficult but as the rains did not commence till three or four o'clock and the weather was clear always in the morning it alone would not have been sufficient to prevent our attempting it but there were other difficulties which embarrassed us from the beginning and continued during our whole residence among the ruins there was not an axe or spade in the place and as usual the only instrument was the machete which here was like a short and wide-bladed sword and the difficulty of procuring indians to work was greater than at any other place we had visited it was the season of planting corn and the indians under the immediate pressure of famine were all busy with their milpas the price of an indian's labor was eighteen cents per day but the alcalde who had the direction of this branch of the business would not let me advance to more than twenty-five cents and the most he would engage to send me was from four to six a day they would not sleep at the ruins came late and went away early sometimes only two or three appeared and the same men rarely came twice so that during our stay we had all the indians of the village in rotation this increased very much our labor as it made it necessary to stand over them constantly to direct their work and just as one set began to understand precisely what we wanted we were obliged to teach the same to others and i may remark that their labor though nominally cheap was dear in reference to the work done at that time i expected to return to palenque whether i shall do so now or not is uncertain but i am anxious that it should be understood that the accounts which have been published of the immense labor and expense of exploring these ruins which as i before remarked made it almost seem presumptuous for me to undertake it with my own resources are exaggerated and untrue being on the ground at the commencement of the dry season with eight or ten young pioneers having a spirit of enterprise equal to their bone and muscle in less than six months the whole of these ruins could be laid bare any man who has ever cleared a hundred acres of land 
is competent to undertake it and the time and money spent by one of our young men in a winter in paris would determine beyond all peradventure whether the city ever did cover the immense extent which some have supposed but to return under the escort of our guide we had a fatiguing but most interesting day what we saw does not need any exaggeration it awakened admiration and astonishment in the afternoon came on the regular storm we had distributed our beds however along the corridors under cover of the outer wall and were better protected but suffered terribly from mosquitoes the noise and stings of which drove away sleep in the middle of the night i took up my mat to escape from these murderers of rest the rain had ceased and the moon breaking through the heavy clouds with a misty face lighted up the ruined corridor i climbed over a mound of stones at one end where the wall had fallen and stumbled along outside the palace entered a lateral building near the foot of the tower groped in the dark along a long low passage and spread my mat before a low doorway at the extreme end bats were flying and whizzing through the passage noisy and sinister but the ugly creatures drove away mosquitoes the dampness of the passage was cooling and refreshing and with some twinging apprehensions of the snakes and reptiles lizards and scorpions which infest the ruins i fell asleep end of section twenty Section 21 of Incidents of Travel in Central America, Chiapas and Yucatan, Volume 2, by John Lloyd Steffens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sue Anderson. Chapter 18. Precautions Against the Attacks of Mosquitoes. Mode of Life at Palenque. Description of the Palace. Piers. Hieroglyphics figures doorways corridors courtyards a wooden relic stone steps towers tablets stucco ornaments etc etc the royal chapel explorations an aqueduct an alarm insects effect of insect stings return to the village of palenque at daylight i returned and found mr c and pauling sitting on the stones half dressed in rueful conclave they had passed the night worse than i and our condition and prospects were dismal rains hard work bad fare seemed nothing but we could no more exist without sleep than the foolish fellow of aesop who at the moment when he had learned to live without eating died in all his travels through the country pauling had never encountered such hard work as since he met us the next night the mosquitoes were beyond all endurance the slightest part of the body the tip end of a finger exposed was bitten with the heads covered the heat was suffocating and in the morning our faces were all blotches without some remedy we were undone it is on occasions like this that the creative power of genius displays itself our beds it will be remembered were made of sticks lying side by side and set on four piles of stones for legs over these we laid our pillions and armas de agua or leathern armor against rain and over these our straw matting this prevented our enemies invading us from between the sticks our sheets were already sewed up into sacks we ripped one side cut sticks and bent them in three bows about two feet high over the frame of the beds over these the sheets were stretched and sewed down all around with a small space open at the head had much the appearance of beers at night after a hard day's work 
we crawled in hosts were waiting for us inside we secured the open places when each with the stump of a lighted candle hunted and slew and with a lordly feeling of defiance we lay down to sleep we had but one pair of sheets apiece and this was a new way of sleeping under them but besides the victory it afforded us over the mosquitoes it had another advantage the heat was so great that we could not sleep with our clothes on it was impossible to place the beds entirely out of reach of the spray and the covering held up a foot or two above us and kept damp cooled the heated atmosphere within in this way we lived the indians came out in the morning with provisions and as the tortillas were made in the alcalde's own kitchen not to disturb his household arrangements they seldom arrived till after breakfast in the meantime work went on as at copan it was my business to prepare the different objects for mr catherwood to draw many of the stones had to be scrubbed and cleaned and as it was our object to have the utmost possible accuracy in the drawings in many places scaffolds were to be erected on which to set up the camera lucida pauling relieved me from a great part of this labor that the reader may know the character of the objects we had to interest us i proceed to give a description of the building in which we lived called the palace a front view of this building is given in the engraving it does not however purport to be given with the same accuracy as the other drawings the front being in a more ruined condition it stands on an artificial elevation of an oblong form forty feet high three hundred and ten feet in front and rear and two hundred and sixty feet on each side the elevation was formerly faced with stone which has been thrown down by the growth of trees and its form is hardly distinguishable the building stands with its face to the east and measures two hundred and twenty eight feet front by one hundred and eighty feet deep its height is not more than twenty five feet and all around it had a broad projecting cornice of stone the front contained fourteen doorways about nine feet wide each and the intervening piers are between six and seven feet wide on the left in approaching the palace eight of the piers have fallen down as has also the corner on the right and the terrace underneath is cumbered with the ruins but six piers remain entire and the rest of the front is open the engraving opposite represents the ground plan of the whole the black lines represent walls still standing the faint lines indicate remains only but in general so clearly marked that there was no difficulty in connecting them together the building was constructed of stone with a mortar of lime and sand and the whole front was covered with stucco and painted the piers were ornamented with spirited figures in bas-relief one of which is represented in the engraving opposite on the top are three hieroglyphics sunk into the stucco it is enclosed by a richly ornamented border about ten feet high and six wide of which only a part now remains the principal personage stands in an upright position and in profile exhibiting an extraordinary facial angle of about forty five degrees the upper part of the head seems to have been compressed and lengthened perhaps by the same process employed upon the heads of the choctaw and flathead indians of our own country the head represents a different species from any now existing in that region of the country and supposing the statues to be images of living personages or the creations of artists according to their ideas of perfect figures they indicate a race of people now lost and unknown the headdress is evidently a plume of feathers over the shoulders is a short covering decorated with studs and a breastplate part of the ornament of the girdle is broken the tunic is probably a leopard skin and the whole dress no doubt exhibits the costume of this unknown people 
he holds in his hand a staff or sceptre and opposite his hands are the marks of three hieroglyphics which have decayed or been broken off at his feet are two naked figures seated cross-legged and apparently suppliants a fertile imagination might find many explanations for these strange figures but no satisfactory interpretation presents itself to my mind the hieroglyphics doubtless tell its history the stucco is of admirable consistency and hard as stone it was painted and in different places about it we discovered the remains of red blue yellow black and white the piers which are still standing contained other figures of the same general character but which unfortunately are more mutilated and from the declivity of the terrace it was difficult to set up the camera lucida in such a position as to draw them the piers which are fallen were no doubt enriched with the same ornaments each one had some specific meaning and the whole probably presented some allegory or history and when entire and painted the effect in ascending the terrace must have been imposing and beautiful the principal doorway is not distinguished by its size or by any superior ornament but is only indicated by a range of broad stone steps leading up to it on the terrace the doorways have no doors nor are there the remains of any within on each side are three niches in the wall about eight or ten inches square with a cylindrical stone about two inches in diameter fixed upright by which perhaps a door was secured along the cornice outside projecting about a foot from the front holes were drilled at intervals through the stone and our impression was that an immense cotton cloth running the whole length of the building perhaps painted in a style corresponding with the ornaments was attached to this cornice and raised and lowered like a curtain according to the exigencies of sun and rain such a curtain is used now in front of the piazzas of some haciendas in yucatan the tops of the doorways were all broken they had evidently been square and over every one were large niches in the wall on each side in which the lintels had been laid these lintels had all fallen and the stones above formed broken natural arches underneath were heaps of rubbish but there were no remains of lintels if they had been single slabs of stone some of them must have been visible and prominent and we made up our minds that these lintels were of wood we had no authority for this it is not suggested either by del rio or captain dupay and perhaps we should not have ventured the conclusion but for the wooden lintel which we had seen over the doorway at ocosingo and by what we saw afterward in yucatan we were confirmed beyond all doubt in our opinion i do not conceive however that this gives any conclusive data in regard to the age of the buildings the wood if such as we saw in the other places would be very lasting its decay must have been extremely slow and centuries may have elapsed since it perished altogether the building has two parallel corridors running lengthwise on all four of its sides in front these corridors are about nine feet wide and extend the whole length of the building upward of two hundred feet in the long wall that divides them there is but one door which is opposite the principal door of entrance and has a corresponding one on the other side leading to a courtyard in the rear the floors are of cement as hard as the best seen in the remains of roman baths and cisterns the walls are about ten feet high plastered and on each side of the principal entrance ornamented with medallions of which the borders only remain these perhaps contained the busts of the royal family the separating wall had apertures of about a foot probably intended for purposes of ventilation some were of this form a cross and some of this a t 
which have been called the greek cross and the egyptian tau and made the subject of much learned speculation the ceiling of each corridor was in this form a trapezium the builders were evidently ignorant of the principles of the arch and the support was made of stones lapping over as they rose as at ocasingo and among the cyclopean remains in greece and italy along the top was a layer of flat stone and the sides being plastered presented a flat surface the long unbroken corridors in front of the palace were probably intended for lords and gentlemen in waiting or perhaps in that beautiful position which before the forest grew up must have commanded an extended view of a cultivated and inhabited plain the king himself sat in it to receive the reports of his officers and to administer justice under our dominion juan occupied the front corridor as a kitchen and the other was our sleeping apartment from the centre door of this corridor a range of stone steps thirty feet long leads to a rectangular courtyard eighty feet long by seventy broad on each side of the steps are grim and gigantic figures carved on stone in basso relievo nine or ten feet high and in a position slightly inclined backward from the end of the steps to the floor of the corridor the engraving opposite represents this side of the courtyard and the one next following shows the figures alone on a larger scale they are adorned with rich headdresses and necklaces but their attitude is that of pain and trouble the design and anatomical proportions of the figures are faulty but there is a force of expression about them which shows the skill and conceptive power of the artist when we first took possession of the palace this courtyard was encumbered with trees so that we could hardly see across it and it was so filled up with rubbish that we were obliged to make excavations of several feet before these figures could be drawn on each side of the courtyard the palace was divided into apartments probably for sleeping on the right the piers have all fallen down on the left they are still standing and ornamented with stucco figures in the center apartment in one of the holes before referred to of the arch are the remains of a wooden pole about a foot long which once stretched across but the rest had decayed it was the only piece of wood we found at palenque and we did not discover this until some time after we had made up our minds in regard to the wooden lintels over the doors it was much worm-eaten and probably in a few years not a vestige of it will be left at the further end of the courtyard was another flight of stone steps corresponding with those in front on each side of which are carved figures and on the flat surface between are single cartouches of hieroglyphics the plate opposite represents this side the whole courtyard was overgrown with trees and it was encumbered with ruins several feet high so that the exact architectural arrangements could not be seen having our beds in the corridor adjoining when we woke in the morning and when we had finished the work of the day we had it under our eyes every time we descended the steps the grim and mysterious figures stared us in the face and it became to us one of the most interesting parts of the ruins we were exceedingly anxious to make excavations clear out the mass of rubbish and lay the whole platform bare but this was impossible it is probably paved with stone or cement and from the profusion of ornament in other parts there is reason to believe that many curious and interesting specimens may be brought to light this agreeable work is left for the future traveller who may go there better provided with men and materials and with more knowledge of what he has to encounter and in my opinion if he finds nothing new the mere spectacle of the courtyard entire will repay him for the labor and expense of clearing it the part of the building which forms the rear of the courtyard 
communicating with it by the steps consists of two corridors the same as the front paved plastered and ornamented with stucco the floor of the corridor fronting the courtyard sounded hollow and a breach had been made in it which seemed to lead into a subterraneous chamber but in descending by means of a tree with notches cut in it and with a candle we found merely a hollow in the earth not bounded by any wall in the further corridor the wall was in some places broken and had several separate coats of plaster and paint in one place we counted six layers each of which had the remains of colors in another place there seemed a line of written characters in black ink we made an effort to get at them but in endeavoring to remove a thin upper stratum they came off with it and we desisted the corridor opened upon a second courtyard eighty feet long and but thirty across the floor of the corridor was ten feet above that of the courtyard and on the wall underneath were square stones with hieroglyphics sculptured upon them on the piers were stuccoed figures but in a ruined condition on the other side of the courtyard were two ranges of corridors which terminated the building in this direction the first of them is divided into three apartments with doors opening from the extremities upon the western corridor all the piers are standing except that on the northwest corner all are covered with stucco ornaments and one with hieroglyphics the rest contain figures in bas-relief three of which being those least ruined are represented in the opposite plates the first was enclosed by a border very wide at the bottom part of which is destroyed the subject consists of two figures with facial angles similar to that in the plate before given plumes of feathers and other decorations for headdresses necklaces girdles and sandals each has hold of the same curious baton part of which is destroyed and opposite their hands are hieroglyphics which probably give the history of these incomprehensible personages the others are more ruined and no attempt has been made to restore them one is kneeling as if to receive an honor and the other a blow so far the arrangements of the palace are simple and easily understood but on the left are several distinct and independent buildings as will be seen by the plan the particulars of which however i do not consider it necessary to describe the principal of these is the tower on the south side of the second court this tower is conspicuous by its height and proportions but on examination in detail it is found unsatisfactory and uninteresting the base is thirty feet square and it has three stories entering over a heap of rubbish at the base we found within another tower distinct from the outer one and a stone staircase so narrow that a large man could not ascend it the staircase terminates against a dead stone ceiling closing all further passage the last step being only six or eight inches from it for what purpose a staircase was carried up to a bootless termination we could not conjecture the whole tower was a substantial stone structure and in its arrangements and purposes about as incomprehensible as the sculptured tablets east of the tower is another building with two corridors one richly decorated with pictures in stucco and having in the centre the elliptical tablet represented in the engraving opposite it is four feet long and three wide of hard stone set in the wall and the sculpture is in bas-relief around it are the remains of rich stucco border the principal figure sits cross-legged on a couch ornamented with two leopards heads the attitude is easy and the physiognomy the same as that of the other personages and the expression calm and benevolent the figure wears around its neck a necklace of pearls to which is suspended a small medallion containing a face perhaps intended as an image of the sun 
like every other object of sculpture we had seen in the country the personage had earrings bracelets on the wrists and a girdle around the loins the headdress differs from most of the others at palenque in that it wants the plumes of feathers near the head are three hieroglyphics the other figure which seems to be that of a woman is sitting cross-legged on the ground richly dressed and apparently in the act of making an offering in this supposed offering is seen a plume of feathers in which the headdress of the principal person is deficient over the head of the sitting personage are four hieroglyphics this is the only piece of sculptured stone about the palace except those in the courtyard under it formerly stood a table of which the impression against the wall is still visible and which is given in the engraving in faint lines after the model of other tables still existing in other places at the extremity of this corridor there is an aperture in the pavement leading by a flight of steps to a platform from this a door with an ornament in stucco over it opens by another flight of steps upon a narrow dark passage terminating in other corridors which run transversely these are called subterraneous apartments but there are windows opening from them above the ground and in fact they are merely a ground floor below the pavement of the corridors in most parts however they are so dark that it is necessary to visit them with candles there are no bas-reliefs or stucco ornaments and the only objects which our guide pointed out or which attracted our attention were several stone tables one crossing and blocking up the corridor about eight feet long four wide and three high one of these lower corridors had a door opening upon the back part of the terrace and we generally passed through it with a candle to get to the other buildings in two other places there were flights of steps leading to corridors above probably these were sleeping apartments in that part of the plan marked room number one the walls were more richly decorated with stucco ornaments than at any other in the palace but unfortunately they were much mutilated on each side of the doorway was a stucco figure one of which being the most perfect is given in the engraving opposite near it is an apartment in which is marked small altar it was richly ornamented like those which will be hereafter referred to in other buildings and from the appearance of the back wall we supposed there had been stone tablets in our utter ignorance of the habits of the people who had formerly occupied this building it was impossible to form any conjecture for what uses these different apartments were intended but if we are right in calling it a palace the name which the indians give it it seems probable that the part surrounding the courtyards was for public and state occasions and that the rest was occupied as the place of residence of the royal family this room with the small altar we may suppose was what would be called in our own times a royal chapel with these helps and the aid of the plan the reader will be able to find his way through the ruined palace of palenque he will form some idea of the profusion of its ornaments of their unique and striking character and of their mournful effect shrouded by trees and perhaps with him as with us fancy will present it as it was before the hand of ruin had swept over it perfect in its amplitude and rich decorations and occupied by the strange people whose portraits and figures now adorn its walls the reader will not be surprised that with such objects to engage our attention we disregarded some of the discomforts of our princely residence we expected at this place to live upon game but were disappointed a wild turkey we could shoot at any time from the door of the palace but after trying one we did not venture to trifle with our teeth upon another and besides these there was nothing but parrots monkeys and lizards 
all very good eating but which we kept in reserve for a time of pressing necessity the density of the forest and the heavy rains would however have made sporting impracticable once only i attempted an exploration from the door of the palace almost on a line with the front rose a high steep mountain which we thought must command a view of the city in its whole extent and perhaps itself contain ruins i took the bearing and with a compass in my hand and an indian before me with his machete from the rear of the last mentioned building cut a straight line up east northeast to the top the ascent was so steep that i was obliged to haul myself up by the branches on the top was a high mound of stones with a foundation wall still remaining probably a tower or temple had stood there but the woods were as thick as below and no part of the ruined city not even the palace could be seen trees were growing out of the top up one of which i climbed but could not see the palace or any of the buildings back toward the mountain was nothing but forest in front through an opening in the trees we saw a great wooded plain extending to tabasco and the gulf of mexico and the indian at the foot of the tree peering through the branches turned his face up to me with a beaming expression and pointing to a little spot on the plain which was to him the world cried out está el pueblo there is the village this was the only occasion on which i attempted to explore but it was the only time i had any mark to aim at i must accept however the exploration of an aqueduct which pauline and i attempted together it is supplied by a stream which runs at the base of the terrace on which the palace stands at the time of our arrival the whole stream passed through this aqueduct it was now swollen and ran over the top and alongside at the mouth we had great difficulty in stemming the torrent within it was perfectly dark and we could not move without candles the sides were of smooth stones about four feet high and the roof was made by stones lapping over like the corridors of the buildings at a short distance from the entrance the passage turned to the left and at a distance of one hundred and sixty feet it was completely blocked up by the ruins of the roof which had fallen down what was its direction beyond it was impossible to determine but certainly it did not pass under the palace as has been supposed besides the claps of thunder and flashes of lightning we had one alarm at night it was from a noise that sounded like the cracking of a dry branch under a stealthy tread which as we all started up together i thought was that of a wild beast but which mr catherwood whose bed was nearer imagined to be that of a man we climbed up the mound of fallen stones at the end of this corridor but beyond all was thick darkness pauline fired twice as intimation that we were awake and we arranged poles across the corridor as a trap so that even an indian could not enter from that quarter without being thrown down with some considerable noise and detriment to his person end of section twenty one section twenty two of incidents of travel in central america chiapas and yucatan volume two by john lloyd steffens this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by sue anderson besides mosquitoes and garapatas or ticks we suffered from another worse insect called by the natives niguas which we are told pestered the spaniards on their first entry into the country and which says the historian quotes, ate their way into the flesh under the nails of the toes then laid their knits there within and multiplied in such manner that there was no ridding them but by cauteries 
so that some lost their toes and some their feet whereas they should at first have been picked out but being as yet unacquainted with the evil they knew not how to apply the remedy End quote. this description is true even to the last clause we had escaped them until our arrival at palenque and being unacquainted with the evil did not know how to apply the remedy i carried one in my foot for several days conscious that something was wrong but not knowing what until the nits had been laid and multiplied pauling undertook to pick them out with a penknife which left a large hole in the flesh and unluckily from the bites of various insects my foot became so inflamed that i could not get on shoe or stocking i was obliged to lie by and sitting an entire day with my foot in a horizontal position uncovered it was assaulted by small black flies the bites of which i did not feel at the moment of infliction but which left marks like the punctures of a hundred pins the irritation was so great and the swelling increased so much that i became alarmed and determined to return to the village it was no easy matter to get there the foot was too big to put in a stirrup and indeed to keep it but for a few moments in a hanging position made it feel as if the blood would burst through the skin and the idea of striking it against a bush makes me shudder even now it was indispensable however to leave the place i sent into the village for a mule and on the tenth day after my arrival at the ruins hopped down the terrace mounted and laid the unfortunate member on a pillow over the pommel of the saddle this gave me for that muddy road a very uncertain seat i had a man before me to cut the branches yet my hat was knocked off three or four times and twice i was obliged to dismount but in due season to my great relief we cleared the woods after the closeness and confinement of the forest coming once more into an open country quickened my pulse as i ascended to the table on which the village stood i observed an unusual degree of animation and a crowd of people in the grass-grown street probably some fifteen or twenty who seemed roused at the sight of me and presently three or four men on horseback rode toward me i had borne many different characters in that country and this time i was mistaken for three padres who were expected to arrive that morning from tumbala if the mistake had continued i should have had dinner enough for six at least but unluckily it was soon discovered and i rode on to the door of our old house presently the alcalde appeared with his keys in his hands and in full dress that is his shirt was inside of his pantaloons and i was happy to find that he was in a worse humor at the coming of the padres than at our arrival indeed he seemed now rather to have a leaning toward me as one who could sympathize in his vexation at the absurdity of making such a fuss about them when he saw my foot too he really showed some commiseration and endeavored to make me as comfortable as possible the swelling had increased very much i was soon on my back and lying perfectly quiet by the help of a medicine chest starvation and absence of irritating causes in two days and nights i reduced the inflammation very sensibly chapter nineteen a voice from the ruins buying bread arrival of padres cura of palenque card-playing sunday mass a dinner party mementos of home dinner customs return to the ruins a marked change terrific thunder a whirlwind a scene of the sublime and terrible the third day i heard from the ruins a voice of wailing juan had upset the lard and every drop was gone the imploring letter i received 
roused all my sensibilities and forgetting everything in the emergency i hurried to the alcalde's and told him a hog must die the alcalde made difficulties and to this day i cannot account for his concealing from me a fact of which he must have been aware to wit that on the very night a porker had been killed very early the next morning i saw a boy passing with some strings of fresh pork hailed him and he guided me to a hut in the suburbs but yesterday the dwelling of the unfortunate quadruped i procured the portion of some honest palenquian and returned happy in the consciousness of making others so that day was memorable too for another piece of good fortune for a courier arrived from ciudad real with dispatches for tabasco and a backload of bread on private account as soon as the intelligence reached me i dispatched a messenger to negotiate for the whole stock unfortunately it was sweetened made up into diamonds circles and other fanciful forms about two inches long and an inch thick to be eaten with chocolate and that detestable lard was oozing out of the crust nevertheless it was bread and placing it carefully on a table with a fresh cheese the product of our cow i lay down at night full of the joy that morning would diffuse over the ruins of palenque but alas all human calculations are vain in my first sleep i was roused by a severe clap of thunder and detected an enormous cat on the table while my boot was sailing toward her with one bound she reached the wall and disappeared under the eaves of the roof i fell asleep again she returned and the consequences were fatal the padres were slow in movement and after keeping the village in a state of excitement for three days this morning they made a triumphal entry escorted by citizens and with a train of more than a hundred indians carrying hammocks chairs and luggage the villages of tumbala and san pedro had turned out two or three hundred strong and carried them on their backs and shoulders to nopa where they were met by a deputation from palenque and transferred to the village it is a glorious thing in that country to be a padre and next to being a padre oneself is the position of being a padre's friend in the afternoon i visited them but after the fatigues of the journey they were all asleep and the indians around the door were talking in low tones so as not to disturb them inside were enormous piles of luggage which showed the prudent care the good ecclesiastics took of themselves the siesta over very soon they appeared one after the other in dresses or rather undresses difficult to describe but certainly by no means clerical neither of them had coat or jacket two of them were the curas of tumbala and ayalon whom we had seen on our journey the third was a franciscan friar from ciudad real and they had come expressly to visit the ruins all had suffered severely from the journey the cura of ayalon was a deputy to congress and in mexico many inquiries had been made of him about the ruins on the supposition that they were in his neighborhood which erroneous supposition he mentioned with a feeling reference to the intervening mountains the padre of tumbala was a promising young man of twenty-eight and weighed at that time about twelve stone or two hundred and forty pounds a heavy load to carry about with him over such roads as they had traversed but the dominican friar suffered most and he sat sidewise in a hammock with his vest open wiping the perspiration from his breast they were all intelligent men and in fact the circumstance of their making the journey for no other purpose than to visit the ruins was alone an indication of their superior character 
the congressman we had seen on our way through his village and then were struck with his general knowledge and particularly with his force of character he had borne an active part in all the convulsions of the country from the time of the revolution against spain of which he had been an instigator and ever since to the scandal of the church party stood forth as a liberal he had played the soldier as well as priest laying down his blood-stained sword after a battle to confess the wounded and dying twice wounded once chronicled among the killed an exile in guatemala and with the gradual recovery of the liberal party restored to his place and sent as a deputy to congress where very soon he was to take part in new convulsions they were all startled by the stories of mosquitoes insects and reptiles at the ruins and particularly by what they had heard of the condition of my foot while we were taking chocolate the cura of palenque entered at the time of our first arrival he was absent at another village under his charge and i had not seen him before he was more original in his appearance than either of the others being very tall with long black hair an indian face and complexion and certainly four-fifths indian blood indeed if i had seen him in indian costume and what that is the reader by this time understands i should have taken him for a puro or indian of unmixed descent his dress was as unclerical as his appearance consisting of an old straw hat with the rim turned up before behind and at the sides so as to make four regular corners with a broad blue velvet ribbon for a hat-band both soiled by long exposure to wind and rain beneath this were a check shirt an old blue silk neckcloth with yellow stripes a striped roundabout jacket black waistcoat and pantaloons made of bed ticking not meeting the waistcoat by two inches the whole tall figure ending below in yellow buckskin shoes but under this outre appearance existed a charming simplicity and courtesy of manner and when he spoke his face beamed with kindness the reception given him showed the good feeling existing among the padres and after some general conversation the chocolate cups were removed and one of the padres went to his chest whence he produced a pack of cards which he placed upon the table he said that he always carried them with him and it was very pleasant to travel with companions as wherever they stopped they could have a game at night the cards had evidently done much service and there was something orderly and systematic in the preliminary arrangements that showed the effect of regular habits and a well-trained household an old indian servant laid on the table a handful of grains of corn and a new bundle of paper cigars the grains of corn were valued at a medio i declined joining in the game whereupon one of the reverend fathers kept aloof to entertain me and the other three sat down to monte while still taking part in the conversation very soon they became abstracted and i left them playing as earnestly as if the souls of unconverted indians were at stake i had often heard the ill-natured remark of foreigners that two padres cannot meet in that country without playing cards but it was the first time i had seen its verification perhaps i feel guilty in saying so because except on public occasions it was the first time i had ever seen two padres together before i left them the padres invited me to dine with them the next day and on returning to my own quarters i found that don santiago the gentleman who gave them the dinner and next to the prefect the principal inhabitant had called upon me with a like invitation which i need not say i accepted the next day was sunday the storm of the night had rolled away the air was soft and balmy the grass was green and not being obliged to travel i felt what the natives aver 
that the mornings of the rainy season were the finest in the year it was a great day for the little church at palenque the four padres were there all in their gowns and surplices all assisted in the ceremonies and the indians from every hut in the village went to mass this over all retired and in a few minutes the village was as quiet as ever at twelve o'clock i went to the house of don santiago to dine the three stranger padres were there and most of the guests were assembled don santiago the richest man in palenque and the most extensive merchant received us in his tienda or store which was merely a few shelves with a counter before them in one corner and his whole stock of merchandise was worth perhaps twenty or thirty dollars but don santiago was entirely a different style of man from one in such small business in this country or europe courteous in manners and intelligent for that country he was dressed in white pantaloons and red slippers a clean shirt with an embroidered bosom and suspenders which probably cost more than all the rest of his habiliments and were not to be hidden under coat and waistcoat in this place which had before seemed to me so much out of the world i was brought more directly in contact with home than at any other i visited the chair on which i sat came from new york also a small looking-glass two pieces of american cottons and the remnant of a box of vermicelli of the existence of which in the place i was not before advised the most intimate foreign relations of the inhabitants were with new york through the port of tobasco they knew a man related to a family in the village who had actually been at new york and a barrel of new york flour the bare mention of which created a yearning had once reached the place in fact new york was more familiar to them than any other part of the world except the capital don santiago had a copy of zavala's tour in the united states which except a few volumes of the lives of saints was his library and which he knew almost by heart and they had kept up with our political history so well as to know that general washington was not president but general jackson the padre of tumbala he of the two hundred and forty pounds weight was something of an exquisite in dress for that country and had brought with him his violin he was curious to know the state of musical science in my country and whether the government supported good opera companies regretted that i could not play some national airs and entertained himself and the company with several of his own in the meantime the padre of palenque was still missing but after being sent for twice made his appearance the dinner was in fact his but on account of want of conveniences in the convent from his careless housekeeping was given by his friend don santiago on his behalf and the answer of the boy sent to call him was that he had forgotten all about it he was absent and eccentric enough for a genius though he made no pretensions to that character don santiago told us that he once went to the padre's house where he found inside a cow and a calf the cura in great perplexity apologized saying that he could not help himself they would come in and considered it a capital idea when don santiago suggested to him the plan of driving them out as soon as he appeared the other padres railed him upon his forgetfulness which they insisted was all feigned they had won sixteen dollars of him the night before and said that he was afraid to come he answered in the same strain that he was a ruined man they offered him his revenge and forthwith the table was brought out cards and grains of corn were spread upon it as before and while the padre of tumbala played the violin the other three played monte being sunday in some places this would be considered rather irregular at least to do so with open doors would be considered setting a bad example to children and servants and in fact considering myself on a pretty sociable footing 
i could not help telling them that in my country they would all be read out of church the padre congressman had met an englishman in mexico who had told him the same thing and also the manner of observing the sunday in england which they all thought must be very stupid perhaps upon less ground than this the whole spanish-american priesthood has at times been denounced as a set of unprincipled gamblers but i have too warm a recollection of their many kindnesses to hold them up in this light they were all intelligent and good men who would rather do benefits than an injury in matters connected with religion they were most reverential labored diligently in their vocations and were without reproach among their people by custom and education they did not consider that they were doing wrong from my agreeable intercourse with them and my regard for their many good qualities i would fain save them from the denunciations of utter unworthiness which might be cast upon them nevertheless it is true that dinner was delayed and all the company kept waiting until they had finished their game of cards the table was set in an unoccupied house adjoining every white man in the village except the prefect and alcalde was present the former being away at his hacienda and the latter from the sneering references he made to it i suspected was not invited in all there were fifteen or sixteen and i was led to the seat of honor at the head of the table i objected but the padres seated me perforce after the gentlemen were seated it was found that by sitting close there was room for some ladies and after the arrangements for the table were completed they were invited to take seats unluckily there was only room for three who sat all together on my left in a few minutes i felt very much as if the dinner was got up expressly for me it was long since i had seen such a table and i mourned in spirit that i had not sent notice for mr catherwood to come to the village accidentally in time to get an invitation but it was too late now there was no time for reflection every moment the dinner was going in some places my position would have required me to devote myself to those on each side of me but at palenque they devoted themselves to me if i stopped a moment my plate was whipped away and another brought loaded with something else it may seem unmannerly but i watched the fate of certain dishes particularly some dulces or sweetmeats hoping they would not be entirely consumed as i proposed to secure all that should be left to take with me to the ruins wine was on the table which was recommended to me as coming from new york but this was not enough to induce me to taste it there was no water and by the way water is never put on the table and never drunk until after the dulces which come on as the last course when it is served in a large tumbler which passes round for each one to sip from it is entirely irregular and ill-bred to ask for water during the meal each guest as he rose from the table bowed to don santiago and said muchas gracias which i considered in bad taste and not in keeping with the delicacy of spanish courtesy as the host ought rather to thank his guests for their society than they to thank him for his dinner nevertheless as i had more reason to be thankful than any of them i conformed to the example set me after dinner my friends became drowsy and retired to siesta i found my way back to don santiago's house where in a conversation with the ladies i secured the remains of the dulces and bought out his stock of vermicelli in the morning my foot being sufficiently recovered i rode up to the house of the padres to escort them to the ruins they had passed the evening sociably at cards and again the padre of palenque was wanting we rode over to his house and waited while he secured carefully on the back of a tall horse a little boy who looked so wonderfully like him that out of respect to his obligation of celibacy 
people felt delicate in asking whose son he was this done he tied an extra pair of shoes behind his own saddle and we set off with the adios of all the village the padres intended to pass the night at the ruins and had a train of fifty or sixty indians loaded with beds bedding provisions sacate for the mules and multifarious articles down to a white earthen washbowl besides which more favored than we they had four or five women entering the forest we found the branches of the trees which had been trimmed on my return to the village again weighed down by the rains the streams were very bad the padres were well mounted but no horsemen dismounted very often and under my escort we got lost but at eleven o'clock very much to the satisfaction of all our long strange-looking straggling party reached the ruins the old palace was once more alive with inhabitants there was a marked change in it since i left the walls were damp the corridors wet the continued rains were working through cracks and crevices and opening leaks in the roof saddles bridles boots shoes etc were green and mildewed and the guns and pistols covered with a coat of rust mr catherwood's appearance startled me he was wan and gaunt lame like me from the bites of insects his face was swollen and his left arm hung with rheumatism as if paralyzed we sent the indians across the courtyard to the opposite corridor where the sight of our loose traps might not tempt them to their undoing and selecting a place for that purpose the carterets were set up immediately and with all the comforts of home the padres lay down for an hour's rest i had no ill will toward these worthy men on the contrary the most friendly feeling but to do the honors of the palace i invited them to dine with us catherwood and pauling objected and they would have done better if left to themselves but they appreciated the spirit of the invitation and returned me muchas gracias after their siesta i escorted them over the palace and left them in their apartment singularly enough that night there was no rain so that with a hat before a candle we crossed the courtyard and paid them a visit we found the three reverend gentlemen sitting on a mat on the ground winding up the day with a comfortable game at cards and the indians asleep around them the next morning with the assistance of pauling and the indians to lift and haul them i escorted them to the other buildings heard some curious speculations and at two o'clock with many expressions of good will and pressing invitations to their different convents they returned to the village late in the afternoon the storm set in with terrific thunder which at night rolled with fearful crashes against the walls while the vivid lightning flashed along the corridors the padres had laughed at us for their superior discrimination in selecting a sleeping place and this night their apartment was flooded from this time my notebook contains memoranda only on the arrival of the indians with the time that the storm set in its violence and duration the deluges of rain and the places to which we were obliged to move our beds every day our residence became more wet and uncomfortable on thursday the thirtieth of may the storm opened with a whirlwind at night the crash of falling trees rang through the forest rain fell in deluges the roaring of thunder was terrific and as we lay looking out the aspect of the ruined palace lighted up by the glare of lightning such as i never saw in this country was awfully grand in fact there was too much of the sublime and terrible the storm threatened the very existence of the building and knowing the tottering state of the walls for some moments we had apprehensions lest the whole should fall and crush us in the morning the courtyard and the ground below the palace were flooded 
and by this time the whole front was so wet that we were obliged to desert it and move to the other side of the corridor even here we were not much better off but we remained until mr catherwood had finished his last drawing and on saturday the first of june like rats leaving a sinking ship we broke up and left the ruins before leaving however i will present a description of the remaining buildings end of section twenty two Section 23 of Incidents of Travel in Central America, Chiapas and Yucatan, Volume 2, by John Lloyd Steffens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sue Anderson. Chapter 20. Plan of the Ruins, Pyramidal Structure, A Building, Stucco Ornaments, Human Figures, Tablets, Remarkable Hieroglyphics, range of pillars stone terrace another building a large tablet a cross conjectures in regard to this cross beautiful sculpture a platform curious devices a statue another pyramidal structure surmounted by a building corridors a curious bas-relief stone tablets with figures in bas-relief tablets and figures the oratorio more pyramidal structures and buildings extent of the ruins these ruins the remains of a polished and peculiar people antiquity of palenque the plan opposite indicates the position of all the buildings which have been discovered at palenque there are remains of others in the same vicinity but so utterly dilapidated that we have not thought it worth while to give any description of them nor even to indicate their places on the plan from the palace no other building is visible passing out by what is called the subterraneous passage you descend the southwest corner of the terrace and at the foot immediately commence ascending a ruined pyramidal structure which appears once to have had steps on all its sides these steps have been thrown down by the trees and it is necessary to clamber over stones aiding the feet by clinging to the branches the ascent is so steep that if the first man displaces a stone it bounds down the side of the pyramid and woe to those behind about halfway up through openings in the trees is seen the building represented in the engraving opposite the height of the structure on which it stands is one hundred and ten feet on the slope the engravings represent the actual condition of the building surrounded and overgrown by trees but no description and no drawing can give effect to the moral sublimity of the spectacle from the multiplicity of engravings required to illustrate the architecture and arts of this unknown people i have omitted a series of views exhibiting the most picturesque and striking subjects that ever presented themselves to the pencil of an artist the ruins and the forest made the deep and abiding impression upon our minds but our object is to present the buildings as restored as subjects for speculation and comparison with the architecture of other lands and times the supposed restorations were made after a careful examination and in each case the reader will see precisely what we had to guide us in making them i must remark however that the buildings are the only parts which we attempted to restore the specimens of sculpture and stuccoed ornaments were drawn as we found them the engraving opposite represents the same building cleared from forest and restored and according to our division marked on the plan number one in the plate are given the ground plan beginning at the bottom the front elevation a section showing the position of tablets within and the front elevation on a smaller scale with the pyramidal structure on which it stands the building is seventy-six feet in front and twenty-five feet deep 
it has five doors and six piers all standing the whole front was richly ornamented in stucco and the corner piers are covered with hieroglyphics each of which contains ninety-six squares the four piers are ornamented with human figures two on each side facing each other which are represented in the following engravings in the order in which they stand upon the piers the first is that of a woman with a child in her arms at least we suppose it was intended for a woman from the dress it is enclosed by an elaborate border and stands on a rich ornament the head is destroyed over the top are three hieroglyphics and there are traces of hieroglyphics broken off in the corner the other three are of the same general character each probably had an infant in the arms and over each are hieroglyphics at the foot of the two center piers resting on the steps are two stone tablets with what seemed interesting figures but so encumbered with ruins that it was impossible to draw them the interior of the building is divided into two corridors running lengthwise with a ceiling rising nearly to a point as in the palace and paved with large square stones the front corridor is seven feet wide the separating wall is very massive and has three doors a large one in the centre and a smaller one on each side in this corridor at each side of the principal door is a large tablet of hieroglyphics each thirteen feet long and eight feet high and each divided into two hundred and forty squares of characters or symbols both are set in the wall so as to project three or four inches in one place a hole had been made in the wall close to the side of one of them apparently for the purpose of attempting its removal by which we discovered that the stone is about a foot thick the sculpture is in bas-relief the tablets are represented in the engravings opposite the construction of the tablets was a large stone on each side and smaller ones in the centre as indicated by the dark lines in the engravings in the right-hand tablet one line is obliterated by water that has trickled down for an unknown length of time and formed a sort of stalactite or hard substance which has incorporated itself with the stone and which we could not remove though perhaps it might be detached by some chemical process in the other tablet nearly one half of the hieroglyphics are obliterated by the action of water and decomposition of the stone when we first saw them both tablets were covered with a thick coat of green moss and it was necessary to wash and scrape them clear the lines with a stick and scrub them thoroughly for which last operation a pair of blacking brushes that juan had picked up in my house at guatemala and disobeyed my order to throw away upon the road proved exactly what we wanted and could not have been procured besides this process on account of the darkness of the corridor from the thick shade of the trees growing before it was necessary to burn candles or torches and to throw a strong light upon the stones while mr catherwood was drawing the corridor in the rear is dark and gloomy and divided into three apartments each of the side apartments has two narrow openings about three inches wide and a foot high they have no remains of sculpture or painting or stuccoed ornaments in the centre apartment set in the back wall and fronting the principal door of entrance is another tablet of hieroglyphics four feet six inches wide and three feet six inches high the roof above is tight consequently it has not suffered from exposure and the hieroglyphics are perfect though the stone is cracked lengthwise through the middle as indicated in the engraving the impression made upon our minds by these speaking but unintelligible tablets i shall not attempt to describe from some unaccountable cause they have never before been presented to the public captains del rio and dupe both refer to them but in very few words and neither of them has given a single drawing acting under a royal commission 
and selected doubtless as fit men for the duties entrusted to them they cannot have been ignorant or insensible of their value it is my belief they did not give them because in both cases the artists attached to their expedition were incapable of the labor and the steady determined perseverance required for drawing such complicated unintelligible and anomalous characters as at copan mr catherwood divided his paper into squares the original drawings were reduced and the engravings corrected by himself and i believe they are as true copies as the pencil can make the real written records of a lost people the indians call this building an escuela or school but our friends the padres called it a tribunal of justice and these stones they say contained the tablets of the law there is one important fact to be noticed the hieroglyphics are the same as were found at copan and quirigua the intermediate country is now occupied by races of indians speaking many different languages and entirely unintelligible to each other but there is room for the belief that the whole of this country was once occupied by the same race speaking the same language or at least having the same written characters there is no staircase or other visible communication between the lower and upper parts of this building and the only way of reaching the latter was by climbing a tree which grows close against the wall and the branches of which spread over the roof the roof is inclined and the sides are covered with stucco ornaments which from exposure to the elements and the assaults of trees and bushes are faded and ruined so that it was impossible to draw them but enough remained to give the impression that when perfect and painted they must have been rich and imposing along the top was a range of pillars eighteen inches high and twelve apart made of small pieces of stone laid in mortar and covered with stucco crowning which is a layer of flat projecting stones having somewhat the appearance of a low open balustrade in front of this building at the foot of the pyramidal structure is a small stream part of which supplies the aqueduct before referred to crossing this we came upon a broken stone terrace about sixty feet on the slope with a level esplanade at the top one hundred and ten feet in breadth from which rises another pyramidal structure now ruined and overgrown with trees it is one hundred and thirty four feet high on the slope and on its summit is the building marked number two like the first shrouded among trees but presented in the engraving opposite as restored the plate contains as before the ground plan front elevation section and front elevation on a smaller scale with the pyramidal structure on which it stands the building is fifty four feet front thirty one feet deep and has three doorways the whole front was covered with stuccoed ornaments the two outer piers contain hieroglyphics one of the inner piers is fallen and the other is ornamented with a figure in bas-relief but faded and ruined the interior again is divided into two corridors running lengthwise with ceilings as before and pavements of large square stones in which forcible breaches have been made doubtless by captain del rio and excavations underneath the back corridor is divided into three apartments and opposite the principal door of entrance is an oblong enclosure with a heavy cornice or moulding of stucco and a doorway richly ornamented over the top but now much defaced on each side of the doorway was a tablet of sculptured stone which however has been removed within the chamber is thirteen feet wide and seven feet deep there was no admission of light except from the door the sides were without ornament of any kind and in the back wall covering the whole width was a tablet given in the engraving opposite it was ten feet eight inches wide six feet four inches in height and consisted of three separate stones that on the left facing the spectator is still in its place 
the middle one has been removed and carried down the side of the structure and now lies near the bank of the stream it was removed many years ago by one of the inhabitants of the village with the intention of carrying it to his house but after great labor with no other instruments than the arms and hands of indians and poles cut from trees it had advanced so far when its removal was arrested by an order from the government forbidding any further abstraction from the ruins we found it lying on its back near the banks of the stream washed by many floods of the rainy season and covered with a thick coat of dirt and moss we had it scrubbed and propped up and probably the next traveller will find it with the same props under it which we had placed there in the engraving it is given in its original position on the wall the stone on the right is broken and unfortunately altogether destroyed most of the fragments have disappeared but from the few we found among the ruins in the front of the building there is no doubt that it contained ranges of hieroglyphics corresponding in general appearance with those of the stone on the left the tablet as given in the engraving contains only two-thirds of the original in del rio's work it is not represented at all in dupay it is given not however as it exists but as made up by the artist in paris so as to present a perfect picture the subject is reversed with the cross in the centre and on each side a single row of hieroglyphics only eight in number probably when dupay saw it thirty-four years before it was entire but the important features of six rows of hieroglyphics on each side of the principal figures each row containing seventeen in a line do not appear this is the more inexcusable in his publishers as in his report dupay expressly refers to these numerous hieroglyphics but it is probable that his report was not accompanied by any drawings of them the principal subject of this tablet is the cross it is surmounted by a strange bird and loaded with indescribable ornaments the two figures are evidently those of important personages they are well drawn and in symmetry of proportion are perhaps equal to many that are carved on the walls of the ruined temples in egypt their costume is in a style different from any heretofore given and the folds would seem to indicate that they were of a soft and pliable texture like cotton both are looking towards the cross and one seems in the act of making an offering perhaps of a child all speculations on the subject are of course entitled to little regard but perhaps it would not be wrong to ascribe to these personages a sacerdotal character the hieroglyphics doubtless explain all near them are other hieroglyphics which reminded us of the egyptian mode of recording the name history office or character of the persons represented this tablet of the cross has given rise to more learned speculations than perhaps any others found at palenque dupay and his commentators assuming for the building a very remote antiquity or at least a period long antecedent to the christian era account for the appearance of the cross by the argument that it was known and had a symbolic meaning among ancient nations long before it was established as the emblem of the christian faith our friends the padres at the sight of it immediately decided that the old inhabitants of palenque were christians and by conclusions which are sometimes called jumping they fixed the age of the buildings in the third century there is reason to believe that this particular building was intended as a temple and that the enclosed inner chamber was an adoratorio or oratory or altar what the rites and ceremonies of worship may have been no one can undertake to say the upper part of this building differs from the first as before there was no staircase or other communication inside or out nor were there the remains of any the only mode of access was in like manner by climbing a tree the branches of which spread across the roof the roof was inclined and the sides were richly ornamented with stucco figures plants and flowers 
but mostly ruined among them were the fragments of a beautiful head and of two bodies in justness of proportion and symmetry approaching the greek models on the top of this roof is a narrow platform supporting what for the sake of description i shall call two stories the platform is but two feet ten inches wide and the superstructure of the first story is seven feet five inches in height that of the second eight feet five inches the width of the two being the same the ascent from one to the other is by square projecting stones and the covering of the upper story is of flat stones laid across and projecting over the long sides of this narrow structure are of open stucco work formed into curious and indescribable devices human figures with legs and arms spreading and apertures between and the whole was once loaded with rich and elegant ornaments in stucco relief its appearance at a distance must have been that of a high fanciful lattice altogether like the rest of the architecture and ornaments it was perfectly unique different from the works of any other people with which we were familiar and its uses and purposes entirely incomprehensible perhaps it was intended as an observatory from the upper gallery through openings in the trees growing around we looked out over an immense forest and saw the lake of terminos and the gulf of mexico near this building was another interesting monument which had been entirely overlooked by those who preceded us in a visit to palenque and i mention this fact in the hope that the next visitor may discover many things omitted by us it lies in front of the building about forty or fifty feet down the side of the pyramidal structure when we first passed it with our guide it lay on its face with its head downward and half buried by an accumulation of earth and stones the outer side was rough and unhewn and our attention was attracted by its size our guide said it was not sculptured but after he had shown us everything that he had knowledge of and we had discharged him in passing it again we stopped and dug around it and discovered that the under surface was carved the indians cut down some saplings for levers and rolled it over the opposite engraving represents this monument it is the only statue that has ever been found at palenque we were at once struck with its expression of serene repose and its strong resemblance to egyptian statues though in size it does not compete with the gigantic remains of egypt in height it is ten feet six inches of which two feet six inches were underground the headdress is lofty and spreading there are holes in the place of ears which were perhaps adorned with earrings of gold and pearls round the neck is a necklace and pressed against the breast by the right hand is an instrument apparently with teeth the left hand rests on a hieroglyphic from which descends some symbolic ornament the lower part of the dress bears an unfortunate resemblance to the modern pantaloons but the figure stands on what we have always considered a hieroglyphic analogous again to the custom in egypt of recording the name and office of the hero or other person represented the sides are rounded and the back is of rough stone probably it stood embedded in a wall from the foot of the elevation on which the last mentioned building stands their bases almost touching rises another pyramidal structure of about the same height on the top of which is the building marked number three such is the density of the forest even on the sides of the pyramidal structure that though in a right line but a short distance apart one of these buildings cannot be seen from the other the engraving opposite represents this building as restored not from any fancied idea of what it might have been 
but from such remains and indications that it was impossible to make anything else of it it is thirty-eight feet front and twenty-eight feet deep and has three doors the end piers are ornamented with hieroglyphics in stucco two large medallions in handsome compartments and the intermediate ones with bas-reliefs also in stucco in general character similar to those before given and for that reason not to multiply engravings i omit them the interior again is divided into two corridors about nine feet wide each and paved with stone the engraving opposite represents the front corridor with the ceiling rising nearly to a point and covered at the top with a layer of flat stones in several places on each side are holes which are found also in all the other corridors they were probably used to support poles for scaffolding while the building was in process of erection and had never been filled up at the extreme end cut through the wall is one of the windows before referred to which have been the subject of speculation from analogy to the letter tau the back corridor is divided into three apartments in the center facing the principal door of entrance is an enclosed chamber similar to that which in the last building we have called an oratory or altar its shadow is seen in the engraving the top of the doorway was gorgeous with stuccoed ornaments and on the piers at each side were stone tablets in bas-relief within the chamber was four feet seven inches deep and nine feet wide there were no stuccoed ornaments or paintings but set in the back wall was a stone tablet covering the whole width of the chamber nine feet wide and eight feet high the tablet is given in the frontispiece of this volume and i beg to call it to the particular attention of the reader as the most perfect and most interesting monument in palenque neither del rio nor dupe has given any drawing of it and it is now for the first time presented to the public it is composed of three separate stones the joints in which are shown by the blurred lines in the engraving the sculpture is perfect and the characters and figures stand clear and distinct on the stone on each side are rows of hieroglyphics the principal personages will be recognized at once as the same who are represented in the tablet of the cross they wear the same dress but here both seem to be making offerings both personages stand on the backs of human beings one of whom supports himself by his hands and knees and the other seems crushed to the ground by the weight between them at the foot of the tablet are two figures sitting cross-legged one bracing himself with his right hand on the ground and with the left supporting a square table the attitude and action of the other are the same except that they are in reverse order the table also rests on their bended necks and their distorted countenances may perhaps be considered expressions of pain and suffering they are both clothed in leopard skins upon this table rest two batons crossed their upper extremities richly ornamented and supporting what seems a hideous mask the eyes widely expanded and the tongue hanging out this seems to be the object to which the principal personages are making offerings the pier on each side of the doorway contained a stone tablet with figures carved in bas-relief which are represented in the two following engravings these tablets however have been removed from their place to the village and set up in the wall of a house as ornaments they were the first objects which we saw and the last which mr catherwood drew the house belonged to two sisters who have an exaggerated idea of the value of these tablets and though always pleased with our coming to see them made objections to having them copied we obtained permission only by promising a copy for them also which however 
mr catherwood worn out with constant labor was entirely unable to make i cut out of del rio's book the drawings of the same subjects which i thought being printed would please them better but they had examined mr catherwood's drawing in its progress and were not at all satisfied with the substitute the moment i saw these tablets i formed the idea of purchasing them and carrying them home as a sample of palenque but it was some time before i ventured to broach the subject they could not be purchased without the house but that was no impediment for i liked the house also it was afterward included among the subjects of other negotiations which were undetermined when i left palenque End of section 23section twenty four of incidents of travel in central america chiapas in yucatan volume two by john lloyd steffens this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by sue anderson the two figures stand facing each other the first on the right hand fronting the spectator the nose and eyes are strongly marked but altogether the development is not so strange as to indicate a race entirely different from those which are known the headdress is curious and complicated consisting principally of leaves of plants with a large flower hanging down and among the ornaments are distinguished the beak and eyes of a bird and a tortoise the cloak is a leopard skin and the figure has ruffles around the wrists and ankles the second figure standing on the left of the spectator has the same profile which characterizes all the others at palenque its headdress is composed of a plume of feathers in which is a bird holding a fish in its mouth and in different parts of the headdress there are three other fishes the figure wears a richly embroidered tippet and a broad girdle with the head of some animal in front sandals and leggings the right hand is extended in a prayerful or deprecating position with the palm outward over the heads of these mysterious personages are three cabalistic hieroglyphics we considered the oratorio or altar the most interesting portion of the ruins at palenque and in order that the reader may understand it in all its details the plate opposite is presented which shows distinctly all the combinations of the doorway with its broken ornaments the tablets on each side and within the doorway is seen the large tablet on the back of the inner wall the reader will form from it some idea of the whole and of its effect upon the stranger when as he climbs up the ruined pyramidal structure on the threshold of the door this scene presents itself we could not but regard it as a holy place dedicated to the gods and consecrated by the religious observances of a lost and unknown people comparatively the hand of ruin has spared it and the great tablet surviving the wreck of elements stands perfect and entire lonely deserted and without any worshippers at its shrine the figures and characters are distinct as when the people who reared it went up to pay their adorations before it to us it was all a mystery silent defying the most scrutinizing gaze and reach of intellect even our friends the padres could make nothing of it near this on the top of another pyramidal structure was another building entirely in ruins which apparently had been shattered and hurled down by an earthquake the stones were strewed on the side of the pyramid and it was impossible even to make out the ground plan returning to number one and proceeding south at a distance of fifteen hundred feet and on a pyramidal structure one hundred feet high from the bank of the river is another building marked on the plan number four twenty feet front and eighteen feet deep 
but in an unfortunately ruined condition the whole of the front wall has fallen leaving the outer corridor entirely exposed fronting the door and against the back wall of the inner corridor was a large stucco ornament representing a figure sitting on a couch but a great part has fallen or been taken off and carried away the body of the couch with tiger's feet is all that now remains the outline of two tigers heads and of the sitting personage is seen on the wall the loss or destruction of this ornament is more to be regretted as from what remains it appears to have been superior in execution to any other stucco relief in palenque the body of the couch is entire and the leg and foot hanging down the side are elegant specimens of art and models for study the plate opposite represents this relief and also a plan section and general view of the building i have now given without speculation or comment a full description of the ruins of palenque i repeat what i stated in the beginning that there may be more buildings but after a close examination of the vague reports current in the village we are satisfied that no more have ever been discovered and from repeated inquiries of indians who had traversed the forest in every direction in the dry season we are induced to believe that no more exist the whole extent of ground covered by those as yet known as appears by the plan is not larger than our park or battery in stating this fact i am very far from wishing to detract from the importance or interest of the subject i give our opinion with the grounds of it and the reader will judge for himself how far these are entitled to consideration it is proper to add however that considering the space now occupied by the ruins as the site of palaces temples and public buildings and supposing the houses of the inhabitants to have been like those of the egyptians and the present race of indians of frail and perishable materials and as at memphis and thebes to have disappeared altogether the city may have covered an immense extent the reader is perhaps disappointed but we were not there was no necessity for assigning to the ruined city an immense extent or an antiquity coeval with that of the egyptians or of any other ancient and known people what we had before our eyes was grand curious and remarkable enough here were the remains of a cultivated polished and peculiar people who had passed through all the stages incident to the rise and fall of nations reached their golden age and perished entirely unknown the links which connected them with the human family were severed and lost and these were only the memorials of their footsteps upon earth we lived in the ruined palace of their kings we went up to their desolate temples and fallen altars and wherever we moved we saw the evidence of their taste their skill in arts their wealth and power in the midst of desolation and ruin we looked back to the past cleared away the gloomy forest and fancied every building perfect with its terraces and pyramids its sculptured and painted ornaments grand lofty and imposing and overlooking an immense inhabited plain we called back into life the strange people who gazed at us in sadness from the walls pictured them in fanciful costumes and adorned with plumes of feathers ascending the terraces of the palace and the steps leading to the temples and often we imagined a scene of unique and gorgeous beauty and magnificence realizing the creations of oriental poets the very spot which fancy would have selected for the happy valley of rasselas in the romance of the world's history nothing ever impressed me more forcibly than the spectacle of this once great and lovely city overturned desolate and lost discovered by accident 
overgrown with trees for miles around and without even a name to distinguish it apart from everything else it was a mournful witness to the world's mutations nations melt from power's high pinnacle when they have felt the sunshine for a while and downward go as at copan i shall not at present offer any conjecture in regard to the antiquity of these buildings merely remarking that at ten leagues distance is a village called las tres cruces or the three crosses from three crosses which according to tradition cortez erected at that place when on his conquering march from mexico to honduras by the lake of peten cortez then must have passed within twenty or thirty miles of the place now called palenque if it had been a living city its fame must have reached his ears and he would probably have turned aside from his road to subdue and plunder it it seems therefore but reasonable to suppose that it was at that time desolate and in ruins and even the memory of it lost chapter twenty one departure from the ruins bad road an accident arrival at the village a funeral procession negotiations for purchasing palenque making casts final departure from palenque beautiful plain hanging birds nests a sitio adventure with a monstrous ape hospitality of padres las playas a tempest mosquitoes a youthful merchant alligators another funeral disgusting ceremonials among the indians who came out to escort us to the village was one whom we had not seen before and whose face bore a striking resemblance to those delineated on the walls of the buildings in general the faces of the indians were of an entirely different character but he might have been taken for a lineal descendant of the perished race the resemblance was perhaps purely accidental but we were anxious to procure his portrait he was however very shy and unwilling to be drawn mr catherwood too was worn out and in the confusion of removing we postponed it upon his promising to come to us at the village but we could not get hold of him again we left behind our kitchen furniture consisting of the three stones which juan had put together the first day of our residence vessels of pottery and calabashes and also our beds for the benefit of the next comer everything susceptible of injury from damp was rusty or mouldy and in a ruinous condition we ourselves were not much better and with the clothes on our backs far from dry we bade farewell to the ruins we were happy when we reached them but our joy at leaving them burst the bounds of discretion and broke out into extravagances poetical which however fortunately for the reader did not advance much beyond the first line adios las casas de piedra the road was worse than at any time before the streams were swollen into rivers and along the banks were steep narrow gullies very difficult to pass at one of these after attempting to ascend with my macho i dismounted mr catherwood was so weak that he remained on the back of his mule and after he had crossed just as he reached the top the mule's strength gave way and she fell backward rolling over in the stream with mr catherwood entirely under pauling was behind and at that time in the stream he sprang off and extricated mr catherwood unhurt but very faint and as he was obliged to ride in his wet clothes we had great apprehensions for him at length we reached the village when exhausted by hard and unintermitted labor he gave up completely and took to bed and the medicine chest 
in the evening nearly all my friends of the dinner party came to see us that one day had established an intimacy all regretted that we had had such an unfortunate time at the ruins wondered how we had lived through it and were most kind in offers of services the padre remained after the rest and went home with a lantern in the midst of one of those dreadful storms which had almost terrified us at the ruins the next day again was sunday it was my third sunday in the village and again it was emphatically a day of rest in the afternoon a mournful interruption was given to the stillness of the place by the funeral of a young indian girl once the pride and beauty of the village whose portrait mr waldeck had taken to embellish his intended work on palenque her career as often happens with beauty in higher life was short brilliant and unhappy she had married a young indian who abandoned her and went to another village ignorant innocent and unconscious of wrong she was persuaded to marry another drooped and died the funeral procession passed our door the corpse was borne on a rude bier without coffin in a white cotton dress with a shawl over the head and followed by a slender procession of women and children only i walked beside it and heard one of them say bueno cristiano to attend the funeral of a poor woman the bier was set down beside the grave and in lifting the body from it the head turned on one side and the hands dropped the grave was too short and as the dead was laid within the legs were drawn up her face was thin and wasted but the mouth had a sweetness of expression which seemed to express that she had died with a smile of forgiveness for him who had injured her i could not turn my eyes from her placid but grief-worn countenance and so touching was its expression that i could almost have shed tears young beautiful simple and innocent abandoned and dead with not a mourner at her grave all seemed to think that she was better dead she was poor and could not maintain herself the men went away and the women and children with their hands scraped the earth upon the body it was covered up gradually and slowly the feet stuck out and then all was buried but the face a small piece of muddy earth fell upon one of the eyes and another on her sweetly smiling mouth changing the whole expression in a moment death was now robed with terror the women stopped to comment upon the change the dirt fell so as to cover the whole face except the nose and for two or three moments this alone was visible another brush covered this and the girl was buried the reader will excuse me i am sorry to say that if she had been ugly i should perhaps have regarded it as an everyday case of a wife neglected by her husband but her sweet face speaking from the grave created an impression which even yet is hardly effaced but to return to things more in my line we had another long journey before us our next move was for yucatan from mr catherwood's condition i had great fear that we would not be able to accomplish what we purposed but at all events it was necessary to go down to the sea-coast there were two routes either by tabasco or the laguna to campeche and war again confronted us both tabasco and campeche were besieged by the liberals or as they were called the revolutionists the former route required three days journey by land the latter one short day and as mr c was not able to ride this determined us in the meantime while waiting for his recovery and so as not to rust and be utterly useless when i returned home i started another operation that is the purchase of the city of palenque i am bound to say however that i was not bold enough to originate this but fell into it accidentally 
in a long conversation with the prefect about the richness of the soil the cheapness of land its vicinity to the seaboard and the united states and easy communication with new york he told me that a merchant of tabasco who had visited the place had proposed to purchase a tract of land and establish a colony of emigrants but he had gone away and never returned he added that for two years a government order from the state of chiapas to which the region belonged had been lying in his hands for the sale of all land in the vicinity lying within certain limits but there were no purchasers and no sales were ever made upon inquiry i learned that this order in its terms embraced the ground occupied by the ruined city no exception whatever was made in favor of it he showed me the order which was imperative and he said that if any exception was intended it would have been so expressed wherefore he considered himself bound to receive an offer for any portion of the land the sale was directed to be by appraisement the applicant to name one man the prefect another and if necessary they too to name a third and the application with the price fixed and the boundaries was to be sent to ciudad real for the approval of the governor and a deed the tract containing the ruins consisted of about six thousand acres of good land which according to the usual appraisement would cost about fifteen hundred dollars and the prefect said that it would not be valued a cent higher on account of the ruins i resolved immediately to buy it i would fit up the palace and repeople the old city of palenque but there was one difficulty by the laws of mexico no stranger can purchase lands unless married to an hija del pais or daughter of the country this by the way is a grand stroke of policy holding up the most powerful attraction of the country to seduce men from their natural allegiance and radicate them in the soil and it is taking them where weak and vulnerable for when wandering in strange countries alone and friendless buffeted and battered with no one to care for him there are moments when a lovely woman might root the stranger to any spot on earth on principle i always resisted such tendencies but i never before found it to my interest to give way the ruined city of palenque was a most desirable piece of property the case was embarrassing and complicated society in palenque was small the oldest young lady was not more than fourteen and the prettiest woman who already had contributed most to our happiness she made our cigars was already married the house containing the two tablets belonged to a widow lady and a single sister good-looking amiable and both about forty the house was one of the neatest in the place i always liked to visit it and had before thought that if passing a year at the ruins it would be delightful to have this house in the village for recreation and occasional visits with either of these ladies would come possession of the house and the two stone tablets but the difficulty was that there were two of them both equally interesting and equally interested i am particular in mentioning these little circumstances to show the difficulties that attended every step of our enterprise in that country there was an alternative and that was to purchase in the name of some other person but i did not know any one i could trust at length however i hit upon mr russell the american consul at laguna who was married to a spanish lady and already had large possessions in the country and i arranged with the prefect to make the purchase in his name pauling was to accompany me to the laguna for the purpose of procuring and carrying back evidence of mr russell's cooperation and the necessary funds and was to act as my agent in completing the purchase 
the prefect was personally anxious to complete it the buildings he said were fast going to decay and in a few years more would be mounds of ruins in that country they were not appreciated or understood and he had the liberal wish that the tablets of hieroglyphics particularly might find their way to other countries be inspected and studied by scientific men and their origin and history be ascertained besides he had an idea that immense discoveries were still to be made and treasures found and he was anxious for a thorough exploration in which he should himself cooperate the two tablets which i had attempted to purchase were highly prized by the owners but he thought they could be secured by purchasing the house and i authorized him to buy it at a fixed price in my many conversations with the prefect i had broached the subject of making casts from the tablets like every other official whom i met he supposed that i was acting under a commission from my government which idea was sustained by having in my employ a man of such character and appearance as pauling though every time i put my hand in my pocket i had a feeling sense that the case was far otherwise in the matter of casts he offered every assistance but there was no plaster of paris nearer than the laguna or campeche and perhaps not even there we had made an experiment at the ruins by catching in the river a large quantity of snails and burning the shells but it did not answer he referred us to some limestone in the neighborhood but this would not do pauling knew nothing of casting the idea had never entered his mind before but he was willing to undertake this mr catherwood who had been shut up in athens during the greek revolution when it was besieged by the turks and in pursuing his artistical studies had perforce made castings with his own hands gave him written instructions and it was agreed that when he returned with the credentials from mr russell he should bring back plaster of paris and while the proceedings for completing the purchase were pending should occupy himself in this new branch of business on the fourth of june we took our final departure from palenque don santiago sent me a farewell letter enclosing according to the custom of the country a piece of silk the meaning of which i did not understand but learned that it was meant as a pledge of friendship which i reciprocated with a penknife the prefect was kind and courteous to the last even the old alcalde drawing a little daily revenue from us was touched every male inhabitant came to the house to bid us farewell and wish us to return and before starting we rode round and exchanged adios with all their wives good kind and quiet people free from all agitating cares and aiming only at an undisturbed existence in a place which i had been induced to believe the abode of savages and full of danger in order to accompany us the cura had postponed for two days a visit to his hacienda which lay on our road pauling continued with us for the purpose before mentioned and juan according to contract i had agreed to return him to guatemala completely among strangers he was absolutely in our power and followed blindly but with great misgivings asked the padre where we were taking him his impression was that he was setting out from my country and he had but little hope of ever seeing guatemala again from the village we entered immediately upon a beautiful plain picturesque ornamented with trees and extending five or six days journey to the gulf of mexico the road was very muddy but open to the sun in the morning was not so bad as we feared on the borders of a piece of woodland were singular trees with a tall trunk the bark very smooth and the branches festooned with hanging birds nests the bird was called the jagua and built in this tree as the padre told us to prevent serpents from getting at the young 
the cura notwithstanding his strange figure and a life of incident and danger was almost a woman in voice manner tastes and feelings he had been educated at the capital and sent as a penance to this retired curacy the visit of the padres had for the first time broken the monotony of his life in the political convulsions of the capital he had made himself obnoxious to the church government by his liberal opinions but unable as he said to find in him any tangible offence his superiors had called him up on a charge of polluting the surplus founded on the circumstance that in the time of the cholera when his fellow creatures were lying all around him in the agonies of death in leaning over their bodies to administer the sacrament his surplus had been soiled by saliva from the mouth of a dying man for this he was condemned to penance and prayers from midnight till daybreak for two years in the cathedral deprived of a good curacy and sent to palenque at half past two we reached his sitio or small hacienda in the apprehension of the afternoon's rain we would have continued to the end of our afternoon's journey but the padre watched carefully the appearance of the sky and after satisfying himself that the rain would not come on till late positively forbade our passing on his sitio was what would be called at home a new place being a tract of wild land of i do not know what extent but some large quantity which had cost him twenty-five dollars and about as much more to make the improvements which consisted of a hut made of poles and thatched with corn husks and a cucinera or kitchen at a little distance the stables and outhouses were a clearing bounded by a forest so thick that cattle could not penetrate it and on the roadside by a rude fence altogether in that mild climate the effect was good and it was one of those occasions which make a man feel away from the region of fictitious wants how little is necessary for the comforts of life the furniture of the hut consisted of two reed bedsteads a table and a bench and in one corner was a pile of corn the cura sent out for a half a dozen fresh pineapples and while we were refreshing ourselves with them we heard an extraordinary noise in the woods which an indian boy told us was made by un animal pauline and i took our guns and entering a path in the woods as we advanced the noise sounded fearful but all at once it stopped the boy opened a way through thickets of brush and underwood and through an opening in the branches i saw on the limbs of a high tree a large black animal with fiery eyes the boy said it was not a miko or monkey and i supposed it to be a catamount i had barely an opening through which to take aim fired and the animal dropped below the range of view but not hearing him strike the ground i looked again and saw him hanging by his tail and dead with the blood streaming from his mouth pauline attempted to climb the tree but it was fifty feet to the first branch and the blood trickled down the trunk wishing to examine the creature more closely we sent the boy to the house whence he returned with a couple of indians they cut down the tree which fell with a terrible crash and still the animal hung by its tail the ball had hit him in the mouth and knocked out the fore teeth passed out at the top of his back between his shoulders and must have killed him instantly the tenacity of his tail seemed marvellous but was easily explained it had no grip and had lost all muscular power but was wound round the branch with the end under so that the weight of the body tightened the coil and the harder the strain the more secure was the hold it was not a monkey but so near a connection that i would not have shot him if i had known it in fact he was even more nearly related to the human family being called a monos or ape 
and measured six feet including the tail very muscular and in a struggle would have been more than a match for a man and the padre said they were known to have attacked women the indians carried him up to the house and skinned him and when lying on his back with his skin off and his eyes staring the padre cried out es hombre it is a man and i almost felt liable to an indictment for homicide the indians cooked the body and i contrived to preserve the skin as a curiosity for its extraordinary size but unluckily i left it on board a spanish vessel at sea end of section twenty four Section 25 of Incidents of Travel in Central America, Chiapas and Yucatan, Volume 2, by John Lloyd Steffens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sue Anderson. In the meantime, the Padre had a fowl boiled for dinner. Three guests at a time were not too much for his open hospitality, but they went beyond his dinner service which consisted of three bowls there was no plate knife fork or spoon and for the cura himself not even a bowl the fowl was served in an ocean of broth which had to be disposed of first tortillas and a small cake of fresh cheese composed the rest of the meal the reader will perhaps connect such an entertainment with vulgarity of manners but the curate was a gentleman and made no apologies for he gave us the best he had we had sent our carriers on before the padre gave us a servant as a guide and at three o'clock we bade him farewell he was the last padre whom we met and put a seal upon the kindness we had received from all the padres of that country at five o'clock by a muddy road through a picturesque country remarkable only for swarms of butterflies with large yellow wings which filled the air we reached las playas this village is the head of navigation of the waters that empty in this direction into the gulf of mexico the whole of the great plain to the sea is intersected by creeks and rivers some of them in the summer dry and on the rising of the waters overflowing their banks at this season the plain on one side of the village was inundated and seemed a large lake the village was a small collection of huts upon what might be called its banks it consisted of one street or road grass grown and still as at palenque at the extreme end of which was the church under the pastoral care of our friend the padre our guide according to the directions of the padre conducted us to the convent and engaged the sexton to provide us with supper the convent was built of upright sticks with a thatched roof mud floor and furnished with three reed bedsteads and a table at this place we were to embark in a canoe and had sent a courier a day beforehand with a letter from the prefect to the justicia to have one ready for us the justicia was a portly mulatto well dressed and very civil had a canoe of his own and promised to procure us two bogadores or rowers in the morning very soon the mosquitoes made alarming demonstrations and gave us apprehensions of a fearful night to make a show of resistance we built a large fire in the middle of the convent at night the storm came on with a high wind which made it necessary to close the doors for two hours we had a tempest of wind and rain with terrific thunder and lightning one blast burst open the door and scattered the fire so that it came very near burning down the convent between the smoke and mosquitoes it was a matter of debate which of the two to choose suffocation or torture we preferred the former and had the latter besides and passed a miserable night 
the next morning the justicia came to say that the bogadores were not ready and could not go that day the price which he named was about twice as much as the cura had told us we ought to pay besides posol balls of mashed indian corn tortillas honey and meat i remonstrated and he went off to consult the mozos but returned to say that they would not take less and after treating him with but little of the respect due to office i was obliged to accede but i ought to add that throughout that country in general prices are fixed and there is less advantage taken of the necessity of travellers than in most others we were loath to remain for besides the loss of time and the mosquitoes the scarcity of provisions was greater than at palenque the sexton bought us some corn and his wife made us tortillas the principal merchant in the place or at least the one who traded most largely with us was a little boy about twelve years old who was dressed in a petate or straw hat he had brought us some fruit and we saw him coming again with a string over his naked shoulder dragging on the ground what proved to be a large fish the principal food of the place was young alligators they were about a foot and a half long and at that youthful time of life were considered very tender at their first appearance on the table they had not an inviting aspect but ce n'est que le premier pas qui coûte they tasted better than fish and they were the best food possible for our canoe voyage being dried and capable of preservation go where we will to the uttermost parts of the earth we are sure to meet one acquaintance death is always with us in the afternoon was the funeral of a child the procession consisted of eight or ten grown persons and as many boys and girls the sexton carried the child in his arms dressed in white with a wreath of flowers around its head all were huddled around the sexton walking together the father and mother with him and even more than in costa rica i remarked not only an absence of solemnity but cheerfulness and actual gaiety from the same happy conviction that the child had gone to a better world i happened to be in the church as they approached more like a wedding than a burial party the floor of the church was earthen and the grave was dug inside because as the sexton told me the father was rich and could afford to pay for it and the father seemed pleased and proud that he could give his child such a burial place the sexton laid the child in the grave folded its little hands across its breast placing there a small rude cross covered it with eight or ten inches of earth and then got into the grave and stamped it down with his feet he then got out and threw in more and going outside of the church brought back a pounder being a log of wood about four feet long and ten inches in diameter like the rammer used among us by pavers and again taking his place in the grave threw up the pounder to the full swing of his arm and brought it down with all his strength over the head of the child my blood ran cold as he threw it up a second time i caught his arm and remonstrated with him but he said that they always did so with those buried inside the church that the earth must be all put back and the floor of the church made even my remonstrances seemed only to give him more strength and spirit the sweat rolled down his body and when perfectly tired with pounding he stepped out of the grave but this was nothing more earth was thrown in and the father laid down his hat stepped into the grave and the pounder was handed to him i saw him throw it up twice and bring it down with a dead heavy noise i never beheld a more brutal and disgusting scene the child's body must have been crushed to atoms toward evening the mosquitoes began their operations 
pauling and juan planted sticks in the ground outside the convent and spread sheets over them for nets but the rain came on and drove them within and we passed another wretched night it may be asked how the inhabitants live i cannot answer they seem to suffer as much as we but at home they could have conveniences which we could not carry in travelling pauling suffered so much and heard such dreadful accounts of what we would meet with below that in a spirit of impetuosity and irritation he resolved not to continue any further from the difficulty and uncertainty of communications however i strongly apprehended that in such case all the schemes in which he was concerned must fall through and be abandoned as i was not willing to incur the expense of sending materials subject to delays and uncertainties unless in special charge and once more he changed his purpose i had but one leave-taking and that was a trying one i was to bid farewell to my noble macho he had carried me more than two thousand miles over the worst roads that mule ever travelled he stood tied to the door of the convent saw the luggage and even his own saddle carried away by hand and seemed to have a presentiment that something unusual was going on i had often been solicited to sell him but no money could have tempted me he was in poorer condition than when we reached palenque deprived of corn and exposed to the dreadful rains he was worse than when worked hard and fed well every day and in his drooping state seemed to reproach me for going away and leaving him forlorn i threw my arms around his neck his eyes had a mournful expression and at that moment he forgot the angry prick of the spur i laid aside the memory of a toss from his back and ineffectual attempts to repeat it and we remembered only mutual kind offices and good fellowship tried and faithful companion where are you now i left him with two others tied at the door of the convent to be taken by the sexton to the prefect at palenque there to recover from the debilitating influence of the early rains and to roam on rich pasture grounds untouched by bridle or spur until i should return to mount him again chapter twenty two embarkation an inundated plain rio chico the usamacinta rio palisada yucatan more revolutions vespers embarkation for the laguna shooting alligators tremendous storm boca chico lake of terminos a calm succeeded by a tempest arrival at the laguna at seven o'clock we went down to the shore to embark the boatmen whom the justice had consulted and for whom he had been so tenacious were his honor himself and another man who we thought was hired as the cheapest help he could find in the village the canoe was about forty feet long with a toldo or awning of about twelve feet at the stern and covered with matting all the space before this was required by the boatmen to work the canoe and with all our luggage under the awning we had but narrow quarters the seeming lake on which we started was merely a large inundated plain covered with water to the depth of three or four feet and the justice in the stern and his assistant before walking in the bottom of the canoe with poles against their shoulders set her across at eight o'clock we entered a narrow muddy creek not wider than a canal but very deep and with the current against us the setting pole could not touch bottom but it was forked at one end and keeping close to the bank the bogador or rower fixed it against the branches of overhanging trees and pushed while the justice whose pole had a rude hook fastened it to other branches forward and pulled in this way with no view but that of the wooded banks we worked 
slowly along the muddy stream in turning a short bend suddenly we saw on the banks eight or ten alligators some of them twenty feet long huge hideous monsters appropriate inhabitants of such a stream and considering the frailty of our little vessel not very attractive neighbors as we approached they plunged heavily into the water sometimes rose in the middle of the stream and swam across or disappeared at half past twelve we entered the rio chico or little river varying from two to five hundred feet in width deep muddy and very sluggish with wooded banks of impenetrable thickness at six o'clock we entered the great usumacinta five or six hundred yards across one of the noblest rivers in central america rising among the mountains of peten and emptying into the lake of terminos at this point the three provinces of chiapas tabasco and yucatan meet and the junction of the waters of the asumacinta and the rio chico present a singular spectacle since leaving the sheet of water before the playas we had been ascending the stream but now continuing in the same direction and crossing the line of junction we came from the ascending current of the rio chico into the descending flow of the asumacinta working out into the middle and looking back we saw the asumacinta and the rio chico coming together and forming an angle of not more than forty degrees one running up and the other down amid the wildness and stillness of the majestic river and floating in a little canoe the effect was very extraordinary but the cause was obvious the usumacinta descending swiftly and with immense force broke against a projecting headland on the left of its course and while the main body forced its way past and hurried on to the ocean part was turned back at this sharp angle with such power as to form the creeks which we had ascended and flood the plain of the playas at this time away from the wooded banks with the setting poles at rest and floating quietly on the bosom of the noble usumacinta our situation was pleasant and exciting a strong wind sweeping down the river drove away the mosquitoes and there was no gathering clouds to indicate rain we had expected to come too for the night but the evening was so clear that we determined to continue unfortunately we were obliged to leave the asumacinta and about an hour after dark turned to the north into the rio palisada the whole great plain from palenque to the gulf of mexico is broken by creeks and streams the asumacinta in its stately course receives many and sends off others to find their way by other channels to the sea leaving the broad expanse of the asumacinta with its comparative light the rio palisada narrow and with a dark line of forest on each side had an aspect fearfully ominous of mosquitoes unfortunately at the very beginning we brushed against the bank and took on board enough to show us the bloodthirsty character of the natives of course that night afforded us little sleep at daylight we were still dropping down the river this was the region of the great logwood country we met a large bungo with two masts moving against the stream set up by hauling and pushing on the branches of trees on her way for a cargo as we advanced the banks of the river in some places were cleared and cultivated and had whitewashed houses and small sugar mills turned by oxen and canoes were lying on the water altogether the scene was pretty but with the richness of the soil suggesting the idea how beautiful this country might be made at two o'clock we reached the palisada situated on the left bank of the river on a luxuriant plain elevated some fifteen or twenty feet several bungos lay along the bank and in front was a long street with large and well-built houses 
this our first point was in the state of yucatan then in revolution against the government of mexico our descent of the river had been watched from the bank and before we landed we were hailed asked for our passports and directed to present ourselves immediately to the alcalde the intimation was peremptory and we proceeded forthwith to the alcalde don francisco ebreu was superior to any man i had yet found at the head of a municipality in fact he was the chief of the liberal party in that section of the state and like all the other officials in the mexican provinces received us with the respect due to an official passport of a friendly nation we were again in the midst of a revolution but had not the remotest idea what it was about we were most intimately acquainted with central american politics but this was of no more use to us than a knowledge of texan politics would be to a stranger in the united states for several months the names of morazan and carrera had rung in our ears like those of our own candidates for the presidency at a contested election but we had passed the limits of their world and were obliged to begin anew for eight years the central party had maintained the ascendancy in mexico during which time as a mark of the sympathy between neighboring people the liberal or democratic party had been ascendant in central america within the last six months the centralists had overturned the liberals in central america and during the same time the liberalists had almost driven out the centralists in mexico along the whole coast of the pacific the liberals were in arms waging a strong revolutionary war and threatening the capital which they afterward entered but after great massacre and bloodshed were expelled on the atlantic side the states of tabasco and yucatan had declared their independence of the general government and in the interior of both states the officials of the central government had been driven out the seaports of tabasco and campeche garrisoned by central troops still held out but they were at that time blockaded and besieged on land by the federal forces all communications by sea and land were cut off their supplies were short and don francisco thought they would soon be obliged by starvation to surrender the revolution seemed of a higher tone for greater cause and conducted with more moderation than in central america the grounds of revolt here were the despotism of the central government which far removed by position and ignorant of the condition and resources of the country used its distant provinces as a quartering place for rapacious officers and a source of revenue for money to be squandered in the capital one little circumstance showed the impolicy and inefficiency of the laws on account of high duties smuggling was carried to such an extent on the coast that many articles were regularly sold at the palisada for much less than the duties the revolution like all others in that country began with pronunciamientos that is declarations of the municipality or what we would call the corporation of a town in favor of any particular party the palisada had made its pronunciamiento but two weeks before the central officers had been turned out and the present alcalde was hardly warm in his place the change however had been effected with a spirit of moderation and forbearance and without bloodshed don francisco with a liberality unusual spoke of his immediate predecessor as an upright but misguided man who was not persecuted but then living in the place unmolested the liberals however did not expect the same treatment at the hands of the centralists an invasion had been apprehended from tabasco don francisco had his silver and valuables packed up and kept his bungo before the door to save his effects and family 
and the place was alive with patriots brushing up arms and preparing for war don francisco was a rich man had a hacienda of thirty thousand head of cattle logwood plantations and bungos and was rated at two hundred thousand dollars the house in which he lived was on the bank of the river newly built one hundred and fifty feet front and had cost him twenty thousand dollars while we were with him dinner was about being served in a liberal style of housekeeping unusual in that country and with the freedom of a man who felt sure that he could not be taken unaware he asked us to join him at table in all his domestic relations he was like the respectable head of a family at home he had two sons whom he intended to send to the united states to be educated and minor things too called up home feelings for the first time in a long while we had bread made of flour from new york and the barrel head had a rochester brand don francisco had never travelled further than tabasco and campeche but he was well acquainted with europe and the united states geographically and politically indeed he was one of the most agreeable companions and best informed men we met in that country we remained with him all the afternoon and toward evening moved our chairs outside in front of the house which at evening was the regular gathering place of the family the bank of the river was a promenade for the people of the town who stopped to exchange greetings with don francisco and his wife a vacant chair was always at hand and from time to time one took a seat with us when the vesper bell struck conversation ceased all rose from their seats made a short prayer and when it was over turned to each other with a buenos noches reseated themselves and renewed the conversation there was always something imposing in the sound of the vesper bell presenting the idea of an immense multitude of people at the same moment offering up a prayer during the evening a courier arrived with dispatches for don francisco advising him that a town which had pronounced in favor of the liberals had pronounced back again which seemed to give both him and his wife much uneasiness at ten o'clock an armed patrol came for orders and we retired to what we much needed a good night's rest in the morning don francisco half in jest and half in earnest told us of the uneasiness we had given his wife pauling spanish and the constant use of idioms well known as belonging to the city of mexico had excited her suspicions she said he was not an american but a mexican from the capital and she believed him to be a spy of the centralists pauling did not like the imputation he was a little mortified at this visible mark of long absence from his country and not at all flattered at being taken for a mexican don francisco laughed at it but his wife was so pertinacious that if it had not been for the apparent propriety of my being attended by one perfectly familiar with the language of the country i believe in the state of apprehension and distrust pauling would have lost the benefit of his birthright and been arrested as a spy we passed the next day in a quiet lounge and in making arrangements for continuing our journey and the next day after furnished with a luxurious supply of provisions by the senora and accompanied to the place by don francisco we embarked on board a bungo for the laguna the bungo was about fifteen tons flat bottomed with two masts and sails and loaded with logwood the deck was covered with mangoes plantains and other fruits and vegetables and so encumbered that it was impossible to move the stern had movable hatches a few tiers of logwood had been taken out and the hatches put over so as to give us a shelter against rain a sail was rigged into an awning to protect us from the sun and in a few minutes we pushed off from the bank 
we had as passengers two young central americans from peten both under twenty and flying on account of the dominion of the carrera party coming as we did direct from central america we called each other countrymen we soon saw that the bungo had a miserable crew above the men were called bogadores or rowers but here as they were on board a bungo with sails and going down to the sea-coast they called themselves marineros or sailors the patron or master was a mild inoffensive and inefficient man who prefaced all his orders to his breechless marineros with the conciliatory words senores agame el favor gentlemen do me the favor below the town commenced an island about four leagues in length at the end of which on the mainland was a large clearing and farming establishment with canoes lying in the water all travelling here is along the river and in canoes from this place there were no habitations the river was very deep the banks densely wooded with the branches spreading far over very soon we came to a part of the river where the alligators seemed to enjoy undisturbed possession some lay basking in the sun on mud banks like logs of logwood and in many places the river was dotted with their heads the spanish historian says that they swim with their head above the water gaping at whatever they see and swallow it whether stick stone or living creature which is the true reason of their swallowing stones and not to sink to the bottom as some say for they have no need to do so nor do they like it being extraordinary swimmers for the tail serves instead of a rudder the head is the prow and the paws the oars being so swift as to catch any other fish as it swims and hundred weight and a half of fresh fish has been found in the maw of an alligator besides what was digested in another was an indian woman whole with her clothes whom he had swallowed the day before and another with a pair of gold bracelets with pearls the enamel gone off and part of the pearls dissolved but the gold entire End quote. here they still maintain their dominion accidents frequently happen and at the palisada don francisco told us that a year before a man had had his leg bitten off and was drowned three were lying together at the mouth of a small stream which emptied into the river the patron told us that at the end of the last dry season upward of two hundred had been counted in the bed of a pond emptied by this stream the boatmen of several bungos went in among them with clubs sharp stakes and machetes and killed upward of sixty the river itself discolored with muddy banks and a fiery sun beating upon it was ugly enough but these huge and ugly monsters neither fish nor flesh made it absolutely hideous the boatmen called them enemigos de los cristianos by which they mean enemies of mankind in a canoe it would have been unpleasant to disturb them but in the bungo we brought out our guns and made indiscriminate war one monster twenty-five or thirty feet long lay on the arm of a gigantic tree which projected forty or fifty feet the lower part covered with water but the whole of the alligator was visible i hit him just under the white line he fell off and with a tremendous convulsion reddening the water with a circle of blood turned over on his back dead a boatman and one of the petain lads got into a canoe to bring him alongside the canoe was small and tottering and had not proceeded fifty yards before it dipped filled upset and threw them both into the water at that moment there were perhaps twenty alligators in sight on the banks and swimming in different parts of the river we could do nothing for the man and boy and the old bungo which before hardly moved seemed to start forward purposely
to leave them to their fate every moment the distance between us and them increased and on board all was confusion the patron cried out in agony to the senores and the senores straining every nerve turned the old bungo into the bank and got the masts foul of the branches of the trees which held her fast in the meantime our friends in the water were not idle the petain lad struck out vigorously toward the shore and we saw him seize the branch of a tree which projected fifty feet over the water so low as to be within reach haul himself up like a monkey and run along it to the shore the marinero having the canoe to himself turned her bottom upward got astride and paddled down with his hands both got safely on board and apprehension over the affair was considered a good joke end of section twenty five